preface of the log of a sea waif being recollections of the first four years of my sea life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the log of a sea waif being recollections of the first four years of my sea life by frank t bullen preface notwithstanding the oft reiterated statement that the days of sea romance are over it may well be doubted whether any period of our literary history has been more prolific in books dealing with that subject than the last twenty-five years nor does the output show any signs of lessening while the quality of the work done is certainly not deteriorating writers like kipling cutliffe hine joseph conrad and clark russell each in his own style have presented us with a series of sea pictures that need not fear comparison with any nautical writer's work of any day although they deal almost exclusively with the generally considered unromantic merchant service having admitted this the question perforce follows who then are you to presume to compete with these master magicians to that inevitable question i would modestly answer that the present book is in no sense a competitor with the works of any writers of nautical romance but having been for fifteen years a seafarer in almost every capacity except that of a master and now by the greatest kindness and indulgence on the part of men holding high positions in the literary world being permitted to cater to the reading public in sterling periodicals it has often occurred to me how little landsmen really know of the seaman's actual life two years before the mast although written by an american and of life on board an american merchantman has long held undisputed sway as a classic upon the subject and for the only reason as it seems that no serious attempt has been made by a britisher to do the same thing for life on british ships still conscious as i certainly am of small literary equipment for such a task i should hardly have dared to try my hand but for the encouragement most generously and persistently given me by mr j st lo strachey who with that large faith in another's abilities that breeds confidence in its object however diffident urged me strongly to tell the public some of my experiences of sea life and his advice to me was to set them down just as they occurred as nearly as memory would permit of course it was not possible to cover the whole field of my experiences at once except in the most scrappy and unsatisfactory way and therefore i decided to take the first four years from the age of twelve to sixteen following my friend's advice i have written nothing but the truth and in most cases i have given the real names of ships and individuals if the book then does not please it will be owing to my lack of discrimination between interesting and commonplace details and not because the pictures given of life at sea in the forecastle are not faithful and now as i know that there are a great many people who do not read prefaces i will close mine by humbly commending this autobiography of a nobody to that tremendous tribunal with whom lies the verdict of success or failure and from whose fiat there is no appeal the public frank t bullen camberwell september eighteen ninety nine end of preface Chapter One of The Log of a Sea Waif by Frank T. Bullen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One My First Ship. Many boys clamor for a sea life and will not settle down to anything ashore, in spite of the pleading of parents, the warnings of wisdom, or the doleful experiences of friends. Occasionally at schools there breaks out a sort of epidemic of going to sea, for which there is apparently no proximate cause, but which rages fiercely for a time, carrying off such high-spirited use as can prevail upon those responsible for them to agree to their making a trial of a seafaring life. 
all this is quite as it should be of course in order that britain may continue to rule the waves but many a parent whose affectionate projects for the future of his offspring are thus rudely shattered bitterly resents what he naturally considers to be unaccountable folly in my own case matters were quite otherwise i belong to the ignoble country of the unwanted in spite of hard usage scanty food and overwork i ridiculously persisted in living until at the approach of my twelfth year an eligible opening presented itself for me to go to sea being under no delusions whatever as to the prospect that awaited me since i had known intimately those who had experienced all the vicissitudes of a sailor's life i was not unduly elated at the idea nevertheless food and shelter were objects peculiarly hard of attainment ashore while i felt satisfied that at sea these necessaries would be always provided even if their quality was none of the best the vessel in which i obtained a berth as cabin boy was commanded by my uncle a stubborn surly but thoroughly capable old seaman soured by misfortune and cross-grained by nature it was small wonder that he had no friends not even the sterling honesty of his character or his high ability being sufficient to counterbalance the drawback of his atrocious temper his latest command was not calculated to improve him for she was a survival of a bygone day clumsy as a dutch galliot impoverished by her owner who was heartily sick of seeing her afloat and would have rejoiced to hear that she was missing and withal leaky as a basket when i first saw her huddled into a more than usually dirty corner of the west india docks i was filled with wonder to see that her cutwater was sunken between two swelling bows like the cheeks of a conventional cherub though i could be no critic of marine construction this seemed an anomaly for which there appeared to be no excuse her bowsprit and jaboom soared into the air exactly like those of the galleons of old and her three skimpy masts stood like broomsticks at different angles the foremast especially which looked over the bows it was a bleak gloomy day in january when i first beheld her the snow which had fallen heavily for some days previously was wherever it could be churned into filthy slush and where undisturbed was begrimed more into the similitude of soot heaps than anything else everything wore a pinched miserable appearance so forbidding and hopeless was the outlook that had it been practicable i should certainly have retreated but there was no choice i had burned my bridges climbing on deck i found such a state of confusion and dirt reigning as i could hardly have believed possible owing to the parsimony of the owner not even a watchman had been kept on board and in consequence the decks had not smelt a broom for a month the cargo and stores were littered about so that progress was gymnastic while in every corner and hollow lay the dirty snow several discontented-looking men were engaged aloft bending sails others were gradually coaxing the cargo on deck into the hold but no one seemed to have any energy left seated upon an up-ended beef cask was a truculent-looking individual whom i instinctively regarded as the boss him therefore i timidly approached upon hearing my message he rolled off his throne and led the way aft uttering all the time some to me perfectly unintelligible sounds i made no pretence of answering so i suppose he took me for a poor idiot hardly worthy of his attention when after some effort he disappeared down the cabin companion i was close behind him and understanding his gestures better than his speech made out that here was to be the scene of my future labours the place was so gloomy that i could distinguish none of its features by sight but the atmosphere a rank compound of the reek of bilge water mouldering stores and unventilated sleeping places caught me by the throat making my head swim and a lump rise in my chest a small locker by the ladder's foot reminding me curiously of a rabbit hutch was pointed out to me as my berth but i naturally supposed it to be a place for my bag 
how could i have dreamed that it was also to be my chamber but everything began to reel with me so blindly clutching the ladder i struggled on deck again where the bitter wind soon revived me henceforth no one noticed me so i roamed about the deck prying into holes and corners until the stevedores knocked off for dinner presently the mate came towards where i sat shivering and solitary on the windless end and made me understand that i was to come ashore with him he conducted me through a labyrinth of mean streets to a spacious building in a wide thoroughfare around which were congregated many small groups of seamen of all nations we entered the place at once and soon reached a large bare room crowded with seamen here i was told to wait while mr svenson went to seek the captain while i stood bewildered by the bustle of the crowded place i heard occasional hoarse demands for three a b's on ordinary for pennenbrook cook and steward for kingston jamaica all the crew are a star apiece and similar calls each followed by a general rush towards the speaker accompanied by a rustling of discharges in the air as their owners sought to attract attention after about an hour's wait i heard the cry of crew on arabella here which was followed by the usual rush but to the disappointment of the watchers the whole of the crew had been already selected one by one they squeezed through the crowd into an office beyond whither i managed to follow i was too much amazed at the hurly-burly to notice who were to be my future shipmates but i paid a sort of awestruck attention to the reading of the articles doubtless much excuse must be made for the officials who have to grabble the same rigmarole over so many times each working day but i certainly think some attempt might always be made that the essential parts of the agreement should be clear to men who are about to bind themselves for a long period to abide by it in our case the only words clearly accented heard and understood by all were the last three no spirits allowed each man then signed the articles or made his mark ending with myself when i found i was entitled to receive five shillings per month without any half pay or advance each of the men received a month's advance in the form of a promissory note payable three days after the ship left the downs providing the said seaman sails in the said ship none of them lost any time in getting away to seek some accommodating shark to cash their notes at an average discount of about forty per cent most of the proceeds being payable in kind this important preliminary over i was free till next morning when all hands were ordered on board by ten o'clock not feeling at all desirous of returning to the ship yet being penniless and in a strange part of london i made my way westward to the strand where i soon managed to pick up enough for a meal i spent the night in hyde park in a snug corner unknown to the police that had often served me as a refuge before at daybreak i started east arriving on board at about half past nine very tired and hungry the mate eyed me suspiciously saying something which i guessed to be uncomplimentary although i was still unable to understand a word but as before he did not interfere with me or set me any task the litter of cases bales etc about the deck was fast disappearing under the strenuous exertions of the stevedores and dock wallopers while the raffle of gear aloft was reduced to as near an approach to orderly arrangement as it could ever be expected to assume presently a grimy little paddle steamer came alongside through the clustering swarm of barges and was made fast ahead and astern an individual with a stentorian voice a pilot suit mangy fur cap and brick-red face mounted the forecastle bellowing out orders apparently addressed to no one in particular their effect was at once evident however for we began to move deliberately away from the wharf splitting the crowd of barges asunder amid the sulphurous remarks of their attendants once out into the comparatively clear centre of the dock we made good progress until the last lock was reached but there we came to a full stop as yet none of the crew had arrived the vessel being handled by a shore gang so far 
after about a quarter of an hour's delay during which the captain and pilot exhausted their vocabulary in abuse of the laggards the latter hove in sight convoyed by a motley crowd of tailors runners boarding masters and frowsy looking women they made a funny little group the sailors were in that happy state when nothing matters least of all the discounter of an advance note hence the bodyguard of interested watchers who would leave no stone unturned to see that their debtors went in the ship although being under the vigilant eyes of the police they dared not resort to violent means the ladies possessing but a fast-fading interest in outward bounders were probably in evidence more from slackness of business than any more sentimental cause but having cajoled or coerced jack to the pierhead he seemed unpersuadable to the final step of getting aboard again and again a sailor would break loose and canter waveringly shoreward only to be at once surrounded by his escort and hurriedly hauled back again at last exasperated beyond endurance by the repetition of these aimless antics the skipper sprang ashore followed by the pilot bursting in upon the squabbling crowd they seized upon a couple of the maudlin mariners hurling them on board as if they had been made of rubber with like vigour the rest were embarked their dunnage flung after them the warps were immediately let go and the ship began to move ahead outside the dock gate a larger tug was waiting in readiness to hook on as soon as we emerged and tow us down the river with a final shove accompanied by a stifling belch of greasy smoke our sooty satellite shook herself free of us retreating hastily within the basin again while obedient to the increasing strain on our hawser ahead we passed rapidly out into the crowded stream during the uneventful trip the shore gang under the direction of mr svenson and the second mate who being also the carpenter was always known as chips worked indefatigably to get the decks clear for sea lashing spars water casks boats etc but their efforts were greatly hindered by the crew who not being sufficiently drunk to lie still in the forecastle persisted in tumbling continually about the decks offering assistance while getting in everybody's way in vain were they repeatedly conducted to their dog hole no sooner were they left than they were out again until the hard-working lumpers were ready to jump on them with rage meanwhile i grew so weary of standing about that i was quite grateful when chips ordered me to fetch him a marlin spike what he wanted i had not the slightest idea but unwilling to confess such ignorance i ran forward and asked a labourer who was stowing the cable he told me that it was a pointed bar of iron with a hole at one end for a lanyard to hang it round the neck by adding that i should find some in the forecastle right forward of the eyes of her away i went into the thick darkness of the men's dirty cave groping my way into its innermost recesses among the bags chests and beds with which the deck was bestrewn reaching the farthest corner i felt a great bundle of something upon what i took for a shelf which barred my further search tugging heartily at it to get it out of my way i suddenly felt it move i did not wait to investigate but floundered back on deck again almost witless from fright breathlessly i reported to chips my discovery which brought him quickly to the spot with a light sure enough there was a sea bag about six feet long stuffed full the drawstring tightly closing the mouth as soon as it was touched there was a movement within its contents were evidently alive chips and his assistant promptly muzzled the bag dragging it out on deck and casting the cord adrift turned it bottom upward out there tumbled head foremost a lanky nigger lad who had been missing since the previous morning and given up as having deserted on being questioned as to the meaning of this freak he humbly explained that despairing of ever getting warm again he had put on his entire wardrobe lain down in his bunk and crept into his bag managing somehow to draw the string tight over his head that he had been there ever since and was likely to have died there since he could not get his arms up again to let himself out 
he was dismissed to work with a grim promise of being warmed in an altogether different fashion if he was again guilty of skulking upon arrival at gravesend we anchored the tremendous racket made by the cable rushing over the windlass giving me a great fright i thought the bottom of the ship had fallen out the tug departed for a berth close at hand the pilot and shore gang leaving us in a wherry i looked longingly after them as they went for i felt strangely that the last link connecting me with england was now broken and although i had not a single soul ashore to regret me or one corner that i could think of as home there was sufficient sadness in the thought of leaving the land of my birth to bring to my eyes a few unaccustomed tears fortunately the cook a worn-out seaman whom in common with most vessels of that class we carried for the double duty of cook and steward was now sober enough to get supper ready in the emphatic sea phrase he couldn't boil salt water without burning it but as nobody expected anything different that passed without comment my regular duties now began my uncle the captain giving me my first lesson in laying the table sea fashion showing me where to find the gear and so on the curious atmospheric compound below was appreciably improved but still there was a prismatic halo round the swinging lamp the skipper and his two officers took no notice of it seeming quite at their ease as they silently ate their humble meal though i got a racking headache supper over i was ordered to clear away the wreck and get my own meal in the pantry a sort of little ease in a corner of the cuddy wherein a man might successfully block all the crockery from falling out by inserting his body in its midst hungry as i was i could not eat there but stealthily seized the opportunity as soon as the skipper had retired to his stateroom to flee forward to the galley with the cook his domain consisted of an erection about six feet square with sliding doors on either side which was lashed firmly down to ring bolts in the deck a coal locker ran across it at the back its lid forming a seat between it and the stove there was just room to turn while most of the cooking utensils no great store had permanent positions on the range here by the dim flicker of an antique contrivance of a lamp like a handless teapot the wick sticking out of the spout and giving almost as much smoke as flame i spent quite a pleasant hour with the ancient mariner who ruled there eating a hearty supper of biscuit and tea he was not in the best of spirits for the drink was dying out of him but his garrulous inconsequent talk amused me mightily at last feeling that i might be wanted i returned to the cabin where i found the captain and chips making melody with their snores mr svenson being on deck keeping watch for which none of the crew were yet available and finding no other corner wherein i might creep i made just such a lair as a dog might in the hutch that held my scanty stock of clothing and crawling into it was soon in the land of perfect peace End of chapter one chapter two of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two outward bound something banging at the bulkhead close to my ear aroused me from a deep sleep in great alarm the hole in which i lay was so pitchy dark that even when i realized where i was which took some little time i fumbled fruitlessly about for several minutes before i finally extricated myself when at last i stood upright on the cuddy deck i saw the captain seated at the table writing he looked up and growled now then look lively don't you hear man the windlass alas i knew no more what he meant than as if he had spoken in hebrew but i gathered somehow that i ought to be on deck up i scrambled into a bitter snow-laden northeast wind and darkness that but for the strange sheen of the falling flakes was almost egyptian shivering as much with queer apprehensions as with cold i hurried forward where i found the mate and chips hard at work getting the hands out of the forecastle and up on top of it 
to where the two gaunt levers of the windlass made a blacker streak in the prevailing darkness tumbling up against jem the darkey he said as well as his chattering teeth would allow spec you got her fall back chain longer me boy yars a hook for yer putting into my hand as he spoke a long iron hook with a cross handle then when at last the half-dead sailors began to work the levers and the great clumsy windlass revolved jem and i hooked on to the massive links of the cable dragging it away from the barrel and ranging it in long flakes beside the fore hatch every few fathoms when the chain had worked its way right across the barrel and the turns were beginning to jam one another up against the bit jem called out fleet o oh! then a couple of men descended from mount misery and hooked a mighty iron claw which was secured by a stout chain to the bit on to the cable before the windlass this held the whole weight while the turns of chain were loosed and laboriously lifted back to the other end of the windlass barrel again when thick with mud so that each link was more like a badly made raw brick than aught else this primitive performance was an uncouth job and i could imagine many pleasanter occupations two o'clock on a winter's morning struggling with mud besmeared masses of iron upon a footing so greasy that standing was a feat hungry and sleepy withal there was little romance about this business at last the mate bawled she's short sir and told the men to vast heaving out of the gloom around the tugboat emerged coming close alongside to receive her end of the big rope by which she was to drag us out to sea no sooner was it fast than a strange voice aft the channel's pilot roared out heave right up sir ay ay sir answered the mate heave way boys the clatter of the pawls recommenced continuing until the anchor was as high as it would come the subsequent catting and fishing of the big mud-hook was all a confused dream to me all i knew was that i had to sit down and pull at a rope which was wound round a capstan by the steady tramp of the crew of whom one would occasionally growl at me to mind my surge and i would feel a jerk at my rope that shook me up dreadfully it seemed an interminable job but like everything else came to an end at last the mate now walked off ordering jem and my small self to coil ropes up and clear away generally but he called out almost immediately all hands lay aft to muster the whole crowd slouched aft grouping themselves at the break of the poop where a sort of elevated deck began just before the mizzenmast each individual's name was now read out and answered to as announced i found that there were six able seamen and the nigger boy jem foremast hands the captain mate chips cook and myself formed the afterguard the crowd were now divided into watches the mate having first pick for the port watch and getting jem over this ceremony concluded the word was passed to pump ship several grumbling comments were made on the one-armed sailor pumps a mean clumsy contrivance only fit for the smallest vessels requiring twice the exertion for half the result obtainable from any of the late patents but the amazement and disgust of the fellows can hardly be imagined when after half an hour's vigorous clankety 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 bang three strokes and a pause as the fashion is there was no sign of a suck a burly yorkshireman leaning up against the brake to mop his brow said well boys if this blankety old scow ain't just sprung a leak and been left for bout month that thumpin we're in for a blankety fine thing of it there was hardly any intelligible response they all seemed choking with rage and curses however they sucked her out and then the big man asked chips quietly whether that spell was usual chips answered him that she had not been bailed out for a long time and that she would certainly take up in a day or two oil on the troubled waters but very risky for he had only just joined himself nor did he know anything of the old tub's previous record meanwhile the cook or doctor as his sea sobriquet is 
had been busy making coffee unlike any beverage called by that name ashore even the funny mixture sold at a halfpenny a cup at street corners being quite luxurious in comparison with it yet it was a godsend boiling hot with plenty of sugar in it to those poor wretches with the quenchless thirst of many days indulgence in the vilest liquor making their throats like furred old drain pipes it calmed the rising storm besides doing them a vast amount of physical good i was at once busy supplying the wants of the officers to whom the refreshment was heartily welcome all the time we were ploughing steadily along behind the strenuous tug at a greater rate than ever i saw the old barky go afterwards i have omitted to mention that we were bound for demerara with a general cargo but our subsequent destination was not settled yet all hands were allowed a pretty long spell of rest with the exception of the man at the wheel and one on the lookout because until we were well out sail would have been more hindrance than help the wind increased as we got farther down until as we passed out of the river quite a sea was rising to which the old hooker began to bob and curtsy like a country girl looking for a situation the relentless tug however tore her through the fast rising waves making them break over the bows in heavy spray this was uncomfortable but the motion was far worse all the horrors of seasickness came suddenly upon me and like an ailing animal i crept into a corner on the main hatch under the longboat wishing for oblivion seasickness is a theme for jesting no doubt but those who have suffered from it much know how little room there is for laughter at such suffering suffering too for which at the time there seems no hope of alleviation except the impossible one of the motion ceasing from that morning for several days i remained in this miserable condition not caring a pin's point whether i lived or died nor with the sole exception of the negro gem did any one else on board seem to give me one moment's thought not that i would lightly accuse them of cruelty or callous indifference to suffering but being all fully occupied with their work they had little leisure to attend to a seasick urchin that was of small use at his best however poor black jem never forgot me and although he had nothing likely to tempt my appetite he always brought his scanty meals to where i lay helpless under the longboat trying in various quaint ways to coax me into a returning interest in life fortunately for me the wind kept in a quarter that enabled the ship to get out of the channel fairly soon considering her limitations and once across the dreaded stretch of the bay of biscay she speedily ran into fine weather and smoother seas when i did eventually find my sea legs and resumed my duties in the cabin i was received with no good grace by my uncle or the doctor the latter had indeed special cause to feel himself aggrieved since he had borne the burden of double duty during my illness a hardship which he was a long time in forgetting but she was an unhappy ship the skipper held aloof from everybody hardly holding converse with the mate he even kept the ship's reckoning alone not accepting the mate's assistance in taking the sun for the longitude in the morning but doing it all himself after a fashion of his own so that the chief officer was as ignorant of the vessel's true position as i was then the food both forward and aft was in addition to being strictly on the abominable official scale which is a disgrace to a civilized country of so unspeakably vile a quality that it was hardly fit to give to well-reared pigs i have often seen the men break up a couple of biscuits into a pot of coffee for their breakfast and after letting it stand a minute or two skim off the accumulated scum of vermin from the top maggots weevils etc to the extent of a couple of tablespoonfuls before they could shovel the mess into their craving stomachs enough however for the present on the food question which being one of the prime factors in a sailor's life must continually be cropping up 
the bleak biting edge of the winter weather was now gone the steady northeasterly breeze blew mild and kindly while from an almost cloudless heaven the great sun beamed benignantly his rays not yet so fierce as to cause any discomfort my sensations on first discovering that no land was visible that we seemed the solitary centre of an immense blue circle whose sharply defined circumference was exactly joined to the vast azure dome overhead were those of utter loneliness and terror for i knew nothing of the ways of navigators across this pathless plain nor realized any of the verities of the subject set forth in a few books i had read school learning i had none had there been any one to whom i could have gone for information without fearing a brutal repulse i should doubtless have felt less miserable but as it was use alone gradually reconciled me to the solemn silence of the illimitable desert around at rare intervals vessels appeared tiny flecks of white upon the mighty waste which only served to emphasize its immensity as the solitary light of a taper does the darkness of some huge hall but the sea itself was full of interest of course i had little leisure but what i had was spent mostly in hanging spellbound over the side gazing with ever-growing wonder and delight upon this marvellous world of abounding life this early acquired habit never left me for many years afterwards when second mate of one of our finest passenger clippers i enjoyed nothing so much as to pass an hour of my watch below seated far out ahead of the ship by the martingale gazing down into the same beautiful sea there were no books on board or reading matter of any kind except the necessary works on navigation on the captain's shelf so it was just as well that i could take some interest in our surroundings if i was not to die mentally as most of the sailors seemed to have done as i got better acquainted with them even daring to pay stolen visits to their darksome home in timorous defiance of the stern orders of my uncle i found to my amazement that they could tell me nothing of what i wanted to know their kindness often went the length of inventing fabulous replies to my eager questions but they seemed totally ignorant of anything connected with the wonders of the ocean the days slipped rapidly away until we entered the sargasso sea that strange vortex in the middle of the atlantic it was on a sunday morning when according to custom no work was a-doing except for the doctor and me even our duties were less exacting than usual so that i was able to snatch many a short spell of gazing overside at the constantly increasing masses of gulf weed that in all its delicate beauty of branch and bud came brushing past our sides that afternoon the sea as far as i could reach bore no bad resemblance to a ripe hay-field the weed covering the water in every direction with hardly a patch of blue amid the prevailing yellow before the light trade winds we were hardly able to make any headway through the investing vegetation which overlaid the waves so heavily that the surface was smooth as a mill-pond through the bewildering mazes of that aquatic forest roved an innumerable multitude of fish of every shape size and hue while the branches themselves swarmed with crustacea so that a draw bucket full of weed would have furnished quite a large-sized aquarium with a sufficiently varied population i could have wished the day forty-eight hours long but i was the only one on board that derived any pleasure from the snail-like progress we made the captain's vexation showed itself in many ways but mostly in inciting chips to order various quite uncalled-for jobs of pulling and hauling which provoked the watch so much that there was a continual rumble of bad language and growling even the twenty minutes spell at the pumps which from its regularity every two hours now passed almost unnoticed was this afternoon the signal for a great deal of outspoken and unfavourable comment upon the characters of ship owner and captain the latter gentleman paced his small domain with uncertain tread as usual 
but the glitter in his eye and the set of his heavily bearded lips showed how sorely he was tempted to retaliate but he prudently forbore well aware of his helplessness in case of an outbreak as well as being forced to admit full justification for the bitter remarks that were so freely indulged in indeed it was a serious question how long the present peace could last the rigging was dropping to pieces so that a man never knew when he went aloft whether he would not come crashing down by the run from the parting of a rotten foot rope or a perished seizing the sails were but rags worn almost to the thinness of muslin every flap threatening to strip them from the yards there was no material for repairs no new rope canvas or seizing stuff half a barrel of stockholm tar and a few pieces of old junk for sennet and spun yarn representing all the boats and stores on board in fact the absence of all those necessaries which are to be found on board the most poverty-stricken of ships for their bare preservation in serviceable condition was a never-failing theme of discussion in the forecastle and one conclusion was invariably arrived at albeit the avenues of talk by which it was reached were as tortuous and inconsequent as could well be it was the grim one that the arabella was never intended to return this thought tinctured all the men's ideas embittered their lives and made the most ordinary everyday task seem a burden almost too grievous to be borne had it not been for the overwhelming evidence that the condition of the afterguard was almost as miserable as their own the abject humility of the mate in spite of his really good seamanship and the hail-fellow well-met way in which chips confessed his utter ignorance of all sailorizing whatever i very much doubt whether there would have been a mutiny before we were a fortnight out but as the villainous food and incessant pumping were not aggravated by bullying and working up matters jolted along without any outbreak born as i was under an unlucky star my insignificance nearly overthrew the peace that was so precariously kept the deadly dullness of the cabin was so stifling that i felt as if i should die there in the long dreary evenings between supper and bunk nothing to read nobody to speak to nothing to do and forbidden with threats to go forward among the men that i should transgress sooner or later was a certainty i took to creeping forward oftener and more openly because no detection followed until a sharp rope's ending from my uncle brought me up with a round turn as the sailor says by this time i had become a rather a favourite forward as well as something of a toy being very small for my age and precocious as might be expected from my antecedents one man especially joe the big yorkshireman became strongly attached to me endeavouring to teach me thoroughly the rudiments of sailorizing this was at considerable sacrifice of his own time which as he was an ardent model maker was sufficient proof of his liking for me now i was almost destitute of clothing and what little i did possess i was rapidly growing out of so the next day after my disciplinary castigation joe walked aft in his watch below demanding audience of the skipper there was an unpleasant scowl on the old man's face as he came on deck to see the audacious man that boded ill for the applicant in any case but when joe boldly tackled him for a bit of light canvas whereof he might make me a cunarder a sort of habergeon and a pair of trousers the skipper's face grew black with rage the insult all the grosser for its truth was too obvious when he found his tongue he burst into furious abuse of joe for daring to come aft on such an errand joe being no lamb replied with interest to the delight of his fellows who strolled aft as far as the mainmast to hear the fun this unseemly wrangle so subversive of all order or discipline lasted for about ten minutes during which time i stood shivering at the foot of the cabin ladder in dread of the sequel finally the old man unable to endure any more roared 
get forward or i'll shoot you you damned ugly thief of a sea lawyer i'll have you by the heels yet yeah, and when i do you'll think jemmy smallback groupin you with this parting shot he turned on his heel without waiting the retort discourteous that promptly followed descending abruptly into the cabin with the ironical cheers of the delighted crew ringing unmelodiously in his ears under such provocation it was little wonder that i paid for all it must have been balm to my relative's wounded pride to rope's end me at any rate he did so with a completeness that left nothing to be desired and in order to avenge himself fully he closed our interview by kicking me forward daring me at the same time ever to defile his cabin again with my mischief-making presence under pain of neck-twisting of course i was received in the forecastle with open arms my reception went far to mollify my sore back for the seclusion of the cabin had grown so hateful that i would willingly have purchased my freedom from it with several such cold things as i had endured not to speak of the honour of being welcomed as a sort of martyr before long i owned quite a respectable rig-out made up by the dexterity of joe from all sorts of odds and ends contributed by all hands at a tarpaulin muster now each man vied with the other in teaching me all they knew of their business and i was such an apt pupil that in a short time they were able to boast that there was no knot or splice known to seafarers that i was not capable of making in sailor fashion being no climbist as might be expected from an urchin born and bred in london streets getting used to the rigging was unpleasant at first but that was mastered in its turn until nothing remained unlearned but the helm the one aim apparently of every man forward was to so fit me for the work i might be called upon to do as that no excuse might be found for cruelty of any sort whether i had the ability to meet his demands or not it did not seem prudent for the old man to try his hand on me again in the colting line and i went gaily enough on my progressive way End of chapter two chapter three of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three arrival at demerara if all sea voyages were like the usual passage to the west indies except for an occasional nasty spell of weather in the english channel the sailor's life would be a very easy one day succeeds day under the same limpid blue sky fringed at the horizon with a few tufts of woolly cumuli placid as a sheltered lake every wavelet melting into its fellow like a caress the sapphire sea greets the gazer every morning like a glad smile of unfathomable love beautiful beyond description is the tender tropical sea and hard indeed it is to realize that this same delightsome expanse of inexpressible loveliness can ever become the unappeasable destroyer before whose wrath even the deep-rooted islands seem to shake the nights rival the days during the absence of the moon the blue-black vault appears like a robe of imperial purple besprent with innumerable diamonds of a lustre unknown to earth's feeble gems so brilliant is the radiance of the heavenly host that even the unassisted eye can detect the disk of venus or jupiter while the twin streams of the galaxy literally glow with diffused light suggesting unutterable glories in their unthinkable depths and up from the horizon towards the zenith with clear yet indefinite outline as of the uplifted finger of god rises the mysterious conical flame shadow of the zodiacal light under such a sky the sea seems to emulate the starry vault above for in its darkling depths there is a marvellous display of gleaming coruscations 
in the foam churned up by the vessel's bows they sparkle and glitter incessantly while in her wake where the liquid furrow still eddies and swirls from the passing of the keel there are a myriad dancing lights of every size and degree of brilliancy like a bevy of will-o'-the-wisps they sport and whirl glow and fade never still never alight yet always lovely but when the full-orbed moon in a molten glow of purest silver before which the eye shrinks almost with pain traverses the purple concave as a conquering queen escorted by her adoring subjects the night becomes a sweeter softer day in which men may sit at ease reading or working as fancy dictates they dare not sleep in that white glare lest with distorted features and sightless eyeballs they vainly regret their careless disregard of the pale beam's power and as the stately satellite settles slowly horizonwards or ascends majestically towards the zenith how dazzling the mile-wide pathway of shimmering radiance she sheds along the face of the deep the whalers with more poetic feeling than one would expect call it the moon glade as though she must needs spread a savanna of splendour for her solemn progress over the waste of ocean here perhaps i should pause to disarm criticism if possible such thoughts as i have feebly tried to express were undoubtedly mine in those youthful days in spite of squalid surroundings and brutal upbringings and if i could fairly reproduce the multitude of fancies which throng my memory as being the daily attendants of my boyish daydreams i should fear no unfavourable reception of such a book as they would make but to our voyage coming on deck one morning soon after daylight i was startled to notice that the bright blue of the sea was gone in its place a turbid leaden flood without a sparkling wavelet extended all around i asked the doctor what this strange change meant get near land i suppose was his gruff reply nor did i get any other explanation from the men for none of them knew that we were in fresh water which rushing down to the sea from many mighty rivers overlaid the heavier salt flood for a great distance from land we did not sight the light ship demerara until next day at noon although we were going at fully five knots an hour behind it the low palm-fringed coast lay like a sullen black cloud-bank just appearing above the horizon for in truth it was almost level with the sea thicker and dirtier grew the water until as we passed the light vessel we seemed to be sailing in a sea of mud between her and the shore we anchored for the night and to await the coming of the pilot thus closing our outward passage which might have been as successfully performed in an open boat so steadily fine had we found the weather what a strange sensation is that of first inhaling the breeze from a foreign shore i stood on the forecastle that evening hardly able to realize that we had crossed the atlantic full of queer feelings as the heavy sweet scent of the tropical forest came floating languidly off from that dim dark line of land there was a continual chorus of insects like a myriad crickets chirping the sharp crisp notes curiously undertoned by the deep bass of the sleepy line of surf upon the beach but this persistent music by its unvarying monotony soon became inaudible or acted as a lullaby to which we all succumbed except the anchor watch shortly after daylight a large canoe came alongside manned by negroes bearing a pompous-looking negro pilot in what he no doubt took to be a very swell costume of faded serge surmounted by a huge straw hat he mounted the side by the man-ropes with the air of a conqueror as he stepped over the rail with a ludicrous assumption of importance he said patronizingly good morning cap'n hope you's very well sah good morning pilot sam to you curtly answered the old man and in almost the same breath they think there's water enough on the bar for us we're drawing fourteen feet aft 
never mind about that captain i'll be all right i's bettin big money dis ya pack gwine beat nuff water head up out de float in der liner battleship gor bless my soul if i ever see such a front in a craft in my days what's the name de ark doin it ah <laughs> and he drew back his head laughing so capaciously that the broad glistening range of his teeth illuminated his coal-black visage like a shutter flung suddenly open to the sun but the old man looked sour such jeering at his command by a nigger was in some sort a reflection on himself and thenceforward he held no more converse with our sable guide than was necessary for the working of the ship we were soon under way though poor jem and myself got in a disgusting condition of mud by the time the anchor was up the forecastle too from the fact of the cable running through it was like a neglected sewer the blocks of foul-smelling mud dropping continuously from the links as they came in through the hawse-pipes all sail was loosed previously but only the jib was set until the anchor was out of the mud when humoured by the helm she turned kindly off the wind gathering way from its pressure on her broad stern while the mud hook was hove right up then everything was set that would draw the wind being fair and strong but in spite of the favourable conditions our progress against the turbulent ebb of the great river was so slow that we were the best part of the day going the few miles that lay between the roadstead and the moorings but at last we reached the group of vessels which lay off the business part of the town with great skill our pilot tried a flying moor letting our anchor go while we were forging ahead at a good rate then immediately ploughing up all sail by the time our way was exhausted about ninety fathoms had been paid out on the first anchor the second was then let go its cable being veered away as the first one was hove in until an equal amount was out on each both were then hove in till the moorings were taut and the vessel swung almost on a pivot this is a ticklish evolution to perform successfully in a crowded anchorage but in our case the result was entirely satisfactory saving much labour the sails being furled and decks cleared up work ceased for the day the curious appearance of the wide verandahed houses embowered in strange-looking trees the assortment of vessels of all rigs from the smart yankee schooner to the stately iron coolie ship from calcutta the muddy rushing river all claimed attention but for one attraction that outweighed them all waiting alongside were two or three bumboats well stocked with fruit soft tack eggs and such curios as a sailor might be supposed to covet i had seen such fruit before on the other side of plate-glass windows in the west end of london or in the avenue at covent garden but never in such generous profusion as now one boat especially was laden to the gunwale with giant bunches of crimson bananas each fruit treble the size of ordinary ones baskets of golden mangoes green limes luscious-looking oranges flecked with green and clusters of immature coconuts the kind that only contain sweet juice and delicate jelly within a soft shell covered by husk as easy to cut as a turnip people accustomed to regular meals of decent food cannot imagine how the sight of these dainties affected our ill-used stomachs happy there was little delay in choosing our purveyor who promptly hoisted great part of his stock on deck for us to choose from in virtue of being the only person in the forecastle who could write i was appointed bookkeeper my remuneration being a fair proportion of the good things without payment in reply to eager inquiries the bum boatman declared that he had no rum saying that he very well understood the unwritten law prohibiting the supply of intoxicants by the bum boats and assuring the men that if he were detected breaking it he would forfeit his license as well as all payment for goods he had supplied on credit we were a happy company that evening 
a plentiful meal after such long abstinence put every one in good spirits although there was much wishing for the cup that both cheers and inebriates in spite of this want joviality was the order of the night song and dance went merrily round at which the two darky boat boys hired by the skipper to take him backwards and forwards to the shore assisted with great glee their fun was spontaneous and side-splitting seeming superior to all external influences a well of continual merriment bubbling up song quip and practical joke followed one another incessantly with all the thoughtless abandon of happy children and mirthful enjoyment that might have thawed an anchorite all the pent-up laughter of the passage burst out that evening the first really jolly one i had ever spent at daylight all hands were busy rigging cargo gear for our lading was long overdue the discharging gang of negroes were early on board awaiting only our preparations to begin their work they were akin to the boat boys in their behaviour poor even to the most utter raggedness of the sacking most of them were covered with hunger bitten for all the provision brought by the majority was a tiny loaf and about two ounces of sugar each they were yet full to the lips with sheer animal delight of living some the haughty aristocrats of the party proudly displayed fragments of salt fish or rusty-looking salt pork flanked by a green plantain a cocoa or chunk of wooden-looking yam but though these favoured ones were evidently stuck up their poorer brethren showed no envy their pay was the equivalent of one shilling per day which as the price of food was high except for a very few local products must have been all too little to keep hunger at bay yet when they got to work how they did go at it they seemed to revel in the labour although the incessant singing they kept up ought to have taken most of their breath streaming with sweat throwing their bodies about in sheer wantonness of exuberant strength as they hoisted the stuff out of the hold they sometimes grew so excited by the improvisations of the chanty man who sat on the corner of the hatch solely employed in leading the singing that often while for a minute awaiting the next hoist they would fling themselves into fantastic contortions keeping time to the music there was doubtless great waste of energy but there was no slackness of work or need of a driver here is just one specimen of their songs but no pen could do justice to the vigour the intonation and the abandon of the delivery thereof sister susan my aunt sal gwinneter get a home by and by high all gwinneter lib down shine bone all gwinneter get a home by and by gwinneter get a home by and by e hi gwinneter get a home by and by the rushing muddy stream literally swarmed with ground sharks who sometimes came to the surface with a rush looking terribly dangerous yet the negroes took but little heed of them merely splashing a bit before diving if they had occasion to go down and clear some vessel's moorings sharks and catfish were the only fish to be seen neither of them available for eating strange to say the great heat troubled me very little perhaps because having for so long regarded cold as one of the chief miseries of my life the steady searching warmth by night and day was grateful to my puny body at any rate but that the bloodthirsty mosquitoes and fan-flies tormented me cruelly as they did all hands the tropical climate suited me very well it may have been the healthy season too for as far as i know there was no illness on board any of the ships all our crews were in robust health and putting on flesh daily in consequence of the liberal diet i wanted much to go ashore but dared not ask leave but to my astonishment on sunday afternoon the mate told me to get ready and come ashore with him glad as i was of the chance to see a little of this strange land i felt small gratification at the prospect of being his companion i would rather a thousand times have gone with joe however it being hobson's choice as well as dangerous to refuse i rigged myself up as best i could a queer figure i made too 
got into the boat with my inviter and away we went landing at one of the stirlings as the wharves are locally named we strolled up into the main street in silence it was a wide avenue with quite a river running down the centre and doubtless on weekdays would have been very lively but at this time it was deserted except by a few stray dogs and sleeping negroes we trudged along without a word till suddenly mr svenson hauled up at a grog shop the bar of which was crowded with seafarers pressing through the throng to the bar he called for some drink and meeting a couple of his countrymen entered at once into an animated conversation with them in norwegian for over an hour i waited impatiently the air of the place being stifling and the babble of tongues deafening at last in desperation i crept up behind him and attracted his attention he turned sharply upon me saying well what do you want please sir i humbly replied may i go and have a look round oh go to hell f you liege i don't care only you cad bag interpod before six o'clock or i be tempt if i don't down you gone off sea thank you sir i said gratefully disappearing promptly before he had time to change his mind what an afternoon i had to be sure i wandered right out of the town through tangled paths crowded on either side by the loveliest flowers growing wild i had ever dreamed of i was like a boy in a dream now except for that haunting reality six o'clock and to crown my pleasures when i had strayed as far as i dared i came suddenly upon a pretty villa in an open glade the house itself being embowered in the most gorgeous blossoms i went up to the back of the premises to beg a drink of water which an amiable negress gave me with a beaming smile squeezing into it a fresh fallen lime with a large spoonful of white sugar while i drank a dear little white boy about five years old came running round the corner when he saw me he stood for a moment as if petrified with astonishment then recovering his wits darted back again a kindly-faced man in white with a big brown beard then appeared leading the little one after a few inquiries he invited me into the house to tea treating me with so much kindness that between his attentions and those of his beautiful weary-looking wife i was several times upon the point of bursting into tears she plied me with questions soon getting all my sorrowful little life story out of me and more than once i saw her furtively wipe away a tear the little son sat on my knee great friends with me at once and what with the good fare the pleasant talk and the comfort of it all i forgot everything else in the world for a time suddenly i caught sight of the clock it was a quarter to six i must have looked terrified for my host mr mackenzie asked me with much solicitude whether i felt suddenly ill as soon as he heard the cause of my alarm he left the house returning to the front in a minute or two with a beautiful mule and a smart trap i took a hurried leave of my kind hostess and her child promising to come again if i could and presently found myself bowling along a level road at a great rate behind the swift hybrid who seemed to glide rather than trot arriving at the boat nearly half an hour late we found the mate not yet there one of the boat boys volunteering the information that he was well drunk up at the rum mill that being so said mr mackenzie i will see you on board so we shoved off for the ship during our short transit i told my new friend how matters stood between my uncle and myself begging him not to inadvertently make matters worse for me he promised to be discreet we reached the ship and climbed on board i fled forward on the instant while he interviewed the old man whatever passed between them on their few minutes talk i don't know i heard no more of the affair but i was never again allowed on shore while i belonged to the arabella the mate came on board quietly and turned in no word reaching us forward of any trouble about his little flutter End of chapter three chapter four of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 The Mutiny and After it must be confessed that during our stay at demerara the fellows had a pretty good time of it since there were no stores on board of rope paint or canvas the work was mainly confined to washing decks or scrubbing paintwork a good deal of time also being wasted making senate i e plating rope yarns for chafing gear what sailorizing was undertaken was in the nature of kill time and well understood as such by the men nevertheless they were by no means pleased with their easy times for they had not yet been able to get any drink their displeasure being heightened by the knowledge that the mate had been ashore and got a skinful any one versed in the ways of seamen should have known that mischief was brewing even though no definite plan of action had yet been discussed it only wanted a bottle or two of rum to fire the magazine at last liberty day grew nigh the cargo was all out the ballast all in no cargo being obtainable for the crazy old arabella in demerara i do not now even know whether it be a legal enactment that seamen shall be allowed twenty-four hours freedom in foreign ports with some portion of the wages due to them to spend but if not the custom is so well established that it has all the force of law the men were like schoolboys at breaking up time half crazy with delight at the thought of the joys that awaited them ashore they received but a few shillings each much to their disgust because there was as yet little wages due to them and no amount of begging or bullying could avail to get them any more the mate's watch went first among them my stout friend joe whom i tearfully begged not to get drunk and kick up a row for my sake looking back i wonder at my temerity for it must have been like getting between a tiger and a shinbone but he took it very meekly and actually promised that he would come aboard sober during their absence the ship was strangely quiet very little work of any kind was done and the waiting watch were as sulky as bears next morning about eight o'clock the revellers returned all except joe in a bedraggled maudlin condition that told eloquently of their enjoyment had it not been for joe they would have all been in a lock-up or chokey as sailors invariably call it but he had worked like a trojan to keep them together and out of harm as much as possible he had quite a triumphant air of unwanted virtue as i whispered my delight at seeing him again and sober then the starboard watch with the doctor took their innings with strict injunction not to be late the next morning as we were going to unmoor and drop down stream a little in readiness for sailing the day passed like the previous one black jem doing the doctor's work as well as he could with such assistance as i could give the next morning at daylight preparations were made for unmooring and at eight o'clock a pilot came on board a smart-looking sharp-featured yankee who looked around the old hooker with undisguised contempt nine ten o'clock and no sign of the liberty men the old man went ashore on business leaving full instructions with the mate about unmooring which he expected to be carried on in his absence he had barely been gone half an hour when the starboard watch returned but it was evident at once that they had their own views upon the unmooring question which by no means coincided with the skipper's they were all half drunk and quarrelsome especially the doctor who strutted about more like a bloodthirsty pirate than an elderly spoiler of ship's provisions unfortunately too each man had brought with him a plentiful supply of rum which they at once began to share with the port watch all except joe who would have none of it they even invited mr Svenson and chips to partake meeting their courteous refusal with quite gratuitous displays of bad language and ill-temper at last the mate mindful of the wigging he might certainly expect on the skipper's return if no work was afoot ventured to give the order man the windlass the pilot taking up his post on the forecastle for all answer there came a howl of derisive laughter from the den where all hands with one exception were busy freshening the nip mr Svenson wisely took no notice but in a cajoling tone said 
now tim boys come along major stort ad's getting glad a chu don't want to kid me into a row do you forth strode the truculent doctor an uncanny figure all asway with drunken rage look a here you square-headed son of a gun you ain't a goin to order me about any more i tell her i ain't a goin to do another stroke aboard the rotten barge built old bathin bashine so there i suppress the every other word profanity throughout during the delivery of this speech he was wildly gesticulating and spluttering right up against the mate's breast shaking his withered fists in the big man's face and otherwise behaving like a very maniac the rest of them gathered around adding to the clamour but the burden of all was the same no more work not another hand's turn aboard this collection of all the abusive sea epithets known old lobster pot joe meanwhile was calmly doing some trifling job aft by the break of the poop on the starboard side to him sauntered an irishman hitherto one of his best friends now laboriously polite and anxious to know whether he intended being a sneak a white livered etc and so forth for all reply joe turned his back on him i was cleaning knives on the same side forward by the galley door but not making much progress on account of so many distracting episodes taking place the babble of abuse around the unfortunate mate was going strong all the time a thrill of terror went through me as i saw the irishman suddenly lift his hand and strike joe on the back of the neck he turned like a flash shooting his right fist into patsy's face with a crash that laid him out sounding horrible to me without a word joe turned again to resume his work patsy gathered himself slowly up and staggered forward bleeding profusely and muttering disjointed blasphemy as he came he passed me going into the forecastle but my attention was suddenly attracted by a yell of laughter from the other side of the deck peeping round the galley i saw with amazement that the drunken devils had actually triced the poor mate up spread-eagle fashion in the main rigging and were jeering him to their heart's content then they made a rush for the cabin chips was nowhere to be seen presently they returned bringing the ensign which they proceeded to hoist in the rigging union down a sea signal of the most urgent importance denoting anything dreadful from fire to mutiny a step beside me made me turn startled to see who it was and i just caught sight of the grim blood besmeared visage of patsy who was stowing the long cabin carving knife in the waistband of his pants while i stared at him breathlessly wondering what his little game might be he broke suddenly into a run aft to where joe still pursued his peaceful task all undisturbed by the riot around look out joe i screamed he's got the carving knife the warning came only just in time for as joe turned sharply he met the raging patsy at close quarters aiming a savage stab at him naturally lifting his arm he received the descending blade through the fleshy forepart of it but with the other he caught the irishman by the throat and jammed him back against the rail kicking the knife which had dropped from the wound far forward as he sprang he plucked an iron belaying pin from its socket and brought it down with a sickening thud upon patsy's already battered face again he fell this time to remain until dragged forward a limp disfigured lump by this time the inverted ensign had told its tale ashore and a large canoe well manned with negro policemen under a white sergeant was coming off to us at a spanking pace this sight drew all the mutineers to the side whence they could watch her approach which they hailed with the liveliest expressions of joy chips now put in an appearance looking very sheepish and assisted by joe released the mate from his undignified suspension in the rigging he tottered aft looking very unwell and muttering bitter reproaches on the carpenter for having abandoned him to such a fate the police canoe bumped against the side her stalwart crew clamouring on board like cats while the officer hastened aft to hear the news from the mate his myrmidons were amazed to find themselves hailed with delight by the excited crew 
who fraternized with them as if they had come to convoy them to a picnic the maid's tale being soon told the sergeant of police gave orders to his men to arrest the mutineers and with joyful outcry all hands hurried forward to prepare for their departure during the preparations the pilot the mate and the police officer foregathered on the poop to indulge in a smoke and discuss the ways of seamen in general but though their palaver lasted a long time there was no sign from forward at last his patience exhausted the sergeant strode forward to the forecastle, demanding with many abjurgations the reason for this delay to his rage and dismay he found that the supply of rum had been so plentiful and had circulated so freely that policemen and sailors were involved in one common debauch indeed it was hard to say which was the most drunken of the two gangs uproarious was the den nearly every man shouting some fragment of song at the pitch of his lungs or laughing insanely at the gorgeous fun of the whole affair back came the sergeant almost speechless with anger and apprehension for this no doubt meant dire disgrace to him he was made worse if anything by the unstinted laughter with which the mate and pilot received the news small blame to them the thing was so ludicrous up went the police flag again to the main truck this time in addition to this the sergeant hoisted a small weft at the peak explaining sulkily that this was an urgent private signal for reinforcements he added and all i hope is that the infernal scoundrels will fall out and kill one another before my boss comes or else i'm booked for a reduction in grade that'll dot me of a quarter of pay none too much as it is before many minutes had passed a large launch was seen approaching rowed by fourteen men who unlike the first lot were all white with them came our old man whose face was a study i just caught one glimpse of it and its fury scared me so that i dared not go near him there was now no more fooling in double quick time all the roisterers policemen as well as sailors were collected from the forecastle, handcuffs put on them their effects flung into the launch and themselves bundled after with scant ceremony so rapid was the work that in less than ten minutes they were all on their way ashore making the air resound with their discordant yells a painful quiet ensued joe and i sole representatives of the foremast hands leisurely cleared up the decks after which he busied himself preparing a meal which should do duty for dinner and supper the captain went ashore again much to my relief for while he was on board i couldn't get quit of the idea that in some way or other he would bring me in responsible for his disappointment and take his consolation out of my poor little carcass i had been so used to this vicarious sort of payment of old that the idea was a fixed one with me whenever there was a row in fact i often feel the old sensation now but to-day he seemed unable to give vent to his feelings so nothing disturbed the calm of the afternoon joe informed me that he had gone ashore to ship a fresh crew and that we should certainly sail in the morning he having heard the old man tell the pilot as much when he took the dinner aft sure enough just before sunset the skipper returned bringing with him a fresh crowd in place of the old hands who had each we were told received summary sentence of two months hard labour quick work truly the new crew were a mixed lot there was a newfoundland irishman named flynn fat-faced flubber-bodied fellow who was forever eating tobacco a stalwart fiery-headed ex-man of warsman who could only be called ginger a long melancholy-looking englishman who signed as george harris a eurasian of gentlemanly appearance but most foul and filthy behaviour a delicate pretty-faced liverpool irishman with a fair silky beard for cook a broad-shouldered greek who had not a word of english and lastly a precious piece of ornament in the shape of a chinaman pigtail and all as if he had just come out of fu chow whom the captain had shipped as steward for nothing a month gloomy jem the unfortunate negro youth of course remained of the old crew 
in some misty fashion he went on his melancholy way the butt of everybody but myself his only relaxation an occasional incoherent chatter with me in some dark corner when there was no work afoot next morning at daybreak we unmoored and proceeded down the muddy river without hitch of any kind the new crew worked well glad enough no doubt to leave such miserable quarters as they had lately been enduring you sing the celestial was a great acquisition he was made to understand at once that whatever work was to be done he must take a hand in it and he certainly toiled like a beaver beautiful weather still favoured us and with an occasional glimpse of what looked to my exuberant fancy like fairyland rising out of the sparkling blue sea we crept steadily westwards into the great gulf of mexico in spite of the miserable food and swinish forecastle the fresh crew worked well and peaceably what growling they did was indulged in out of hearing and after late experiences i hardly knew the old ship without a single incident worth recording we rolled along until we sighted the mexican coast which as the position of our first calling place was somewhat vague the captain proposed to skirt until he came to it the weather now became less settled squalls of considerable violence being frequent making a great deal of sail handling necessary one night when we were suddenly called upon to shorten sail in a deluge of rain it happened that the long englishman george harris and ginger the quondam man-of-war man found themselves together furling the main topgallant sail now ginger though a big fellow was as usual with his class of very little use at furling sail under merchant ship conditions where one man is employed in the merchantman six or seven crowd in on board of andrew and the blue jacket is consequently handicapped when he finds himself thus lonely the sail was stiff with wet the wind was high and george in trying to make up for ginger's deficiency ruptured himself badly he got down from aloft somehow and took to his bunk a very sick man the treatment he received only aggravated his mishap while he grew rapidly weaker from his inability to eat the muck which even in his case was unchanged although never very friendly with me i was filled with pity for him and actually so far forgot my dread of the terrible old man as to creep below and steal a few cabin biscuits which were less coarse and whiter than ours it was comparatively easy to evade the officers and i chuckled greatly over my smartness being richly rewarded by the gratitude of the invalid who made quite a hearty meal of my plunder soaked with some sugar but i reckoned without you sing that slit-eyed pagan in some unholy fashion found me out and at once betrayed me to the skipper of whom he stood in such awe that he was ready to jump overboard at a nod from him i was called aft questioned and found guilty there and then with a bite of the gaff topsail halyards he gave me such a dressing down as i have never forgotten you sing standing by with a face like a door-knocker for expressionless calm even amid my sharpest pangs i rejoice to think i didn't howl perhaps i gained little by that at last the skipper flung me from him saying grimly now you can go and thank george harris for that and when twenty years after i saw that stern old man reduced to earning a precarious living as a shipkeeper fall from a ship's side in the millwall dock injuring himself so frightfully that death would have been refreshment i could not help thinking of the grist which is ground by the mill of the gods joe my faithful ally was furious when i went forward quivering with pain he was for vengeance first on the old man then on the placid pig who had betrayed me but i begged so hard that he wouldn't make matters worse by interfering that at last he yielded but he never settled down again satisfactorily just a week afterwards we came to a slight indentation in the coast where a norwegian bark lay at anchor from her we got the information that the place was called tupacol upon which we anchored it being our port of call for orders the anchor was no sooner down than harris crawled aft and implored the captain to take him ashore so that he might get some medical aid 
desire of life made the poor fellow quite eloquent but he might as well have appealed to a bronze joss when exhausted he paused for breath the old man said with bitter emphasis if an i'd been a loafin on my shipmates as long as you have i'd take a heaven me useless carcass overboard you worthless soldier get forward and die it's about the best thing you can do george crept forward again without a word we lay at this forsaken-looking spot for four days holding no communication with the shore except twice when a launch came off manned by a truculent-looking crew of dagos i e greeks italians spaniards and half-bred mexicans soon after their second visit we weighed again having received instructions to commence loading at st anna some distance along the same coast we had an easy run thither with a fair wind all the way and were pleasantly surprised to find that although an open roadstead like tupoco there was quite a fleet of ships at anchor there they were of all sizes and rigs from rakish-looking yankee schooners to huge full-rigged ships and of several nationalities british american and norwegian predominating there was a heavy landward swell on when we passed through them to our anchorage and it was anything but cheering to see how they rolled and tumbled about in far more unpleasant fashion than as though they had been under way in fact some of the fore and afters had actually got staysail set with the sheets hauled flat aft so as to counteract in some measure the dangerous wallowing they were carrying on i watched one baltimore schooner with tremendously taut spars roll until she scooped up the sea on either side with her bulwarks the decks being all in a lather with the foaming seas tearing across them and i couldn't help thinking what a heavenly time those yanks must have been having down below for there were none visible on deck End of chapter four chapter five of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter five the land of liberty we came to an anchor near the middle of the roadstead in seamanlike fashion every sail being furled before the anchor was dropped and the old tub brought to as if going into dock then as it was understood that our cargo was ready for us preparations were immediately made for its reception a stout spar was rigged across the forecastle protruding twenty-five feet on the starboard side with a big block lashed to its end through which ran a five-inch rope a derrick was rigged over the main hatch with a double-chain purchase attached and a powerful winch bolted to the deck round which the chain revolved numbers of iron spikes uh, dogs with rings in them were fitted with tails of rope about three feet long and lengths of hawser cut for mother ropes the rafts of mahogany and cedar logs were made by driving a tailed dog firmly into the side of each log a foot or so from the end as each one is thus spiked it is secured by a rolling hitch of the tail to the mother rope cabo madre of the spaniards until as many are collected as required this operation is always performed in the river just inside the bar where the logs are sorted after their long drift from the interior then the raftsmen who are equipped with capacious boats pulling six oars and carrying about three hundred fathoms of grass rope secure one end of their tow-line to the mother rope and pull away seaward in the direction of the ship the steersmen casting out line as they go arriving at the end of their tether they anchor and all hands turn to with a will to haul the raft up to the boat this operation is repeated as often as is necessary to cover the three or four miles between ship and shore until at last the long line of tumbling logs are brought alongside their destined vessel and secured to the big spar on the forecastle at whatever time they arrive all hands must turn out to receive them and on board the american ships the uproar used to be fearful oaths yells and showers of belaying pins rattling against the bulwarks bearing eloquent testimony to the persuasive methods of discipline in vogue on board of them 
the stevedores or stowers of the timber arrived on board shortly after we anchored like the rest of the population they were a mixed crowd of latins and greeks but all speaking spanish owing to their presence we fared much better than we should otherwise have done for they were fed by the ship and by no means to be offered any such carrion as usually fell to our lot their pay was high five dollars a day but they certainly worked well besides being very skilful with our first raft there was trouble flynn the blue-nosed irishman was sent upon the uncertain row of logs alongside to sling them but after several narrow escapes from drowning or getting crushed between the rolling ponderous masses some of them over five tons in weight he clambered on deck again and flatly refused to risk his bones any longer nor in spite of the skipper's fury could any other man be persuaded to attempt so dangerous a task finally the old man turned to one of the greeks of the stevedore gang and ordered him to act as slingsman ah yes captain said antonio suppose that you'll give me a dollar a day after a little more language the old man said all right tonio i'll give you eight dollars and i'll stop it out of your pay you skulking soldier you to flynn which was mirthful seeing that eight dollars represented a fortnight's pay for our shipmate however antonio proved a most expert raftsman being almost amphibious and smart as any eel but the work was exceedingly severe lifting such great masses of timber tried the old sticks terribly and when she rolled suddenly to windward tearing the log out of the water with a jerk you almost expected her to fall apart when at last the log showed above the rail if she started her antics all hands near stood by for a run for the log would suddenly slew in board and come across the deck like a gigantic battering ram the whole process was a series of hairbreadth escapes down in the hold where the stevedores toiled with tackles rousing the logs about there were many casualties but these dagos never seemed to care for every hurt they had but one remedy plenty of canna a fiery white spirit fresh from the still poured into a gash or rubbed on a bruise with half a pint to drink this vitriolic stuff seemed to meet every emergency the enormous rate of pay prevailing here during the height of the season had the inevitable effect of causing frequent desertions so that as much as three hundred dollars was freely offered for the run to new york or europe for seamen consequently a vigilant watch was kept by the officers of ships lest any of the crew should take french leave although getting ashore was difficult we however had a very large longboat for which there was no room on deck and contrary to the usual practice it was put overboard and kept astern at the end of a small hawser the temptation was too much for my friend joe who accompanied by the eurasian slipped over the bows one dark night and swam aft to the unwieldy ark unheard by the officer on watch poor fellow he couldn't keep awake night and day at daybreak when the skipper came on deck and looked over the taffrail always his first move the idle rope hung down disconsolately the longboat was gone seizing his glass he mounted to the cross trees and scanned the horizon discovering the derelict far out at sea the gig was lowered and manned by flynn and jem the skipper himself taking the tiller and off they went in pursuit it was nearly noon when they returned towing the runaway and half dead with thirst and fatigue then only did the skipper learn that two of his best men were gone in his hurry he had not stayed to inquire and now his rage knew no bounds judge then how he felt when he discovered by the aid of his glass that the deserters were no further away than our nearest neighbor an american brig that lay less than half a mile away anger overcame his prudence and he actually went alongside the yank intending to go on board and claim his men he was received with contumely the american skipper refusing to allow him over the rail his state of mind on his return must have been pitiable but he sought his cabin without a word and remained there all the rest of the day in some way the news spread round the fleet and that evening we were boarded by the captain of the panuka 
a Liverpool bark, who came to condole and relate his woeful experiences. He said that his men had refused duty altogether, upon which he was advised to take them ashore to the commandant, who would deal with them in summary fashion. Accordingly, he took them, finding the soi-disant official to be a stalwart Greek, who held a position by virtue of his election by his fellow rascals, for law there was none. El Señor Comandante, however, told him to leave his men with him, and he would soon bring them to their bearings. Very reluctantly he followed this advice, since he had no choice, and returned on board, cursing his stupidity for ever taking them there. To his joyful surprise they returned on board next morning, as meek in their demeanour as they had, indeed, been taught a lesson. But two nights afterwards there was a desperate hubbub raised, during which the rascals looted the cabin, and getting into the whale-boat hanging at the davits, went ashore with their plunder. They had strictly followed the instructions given them by the commandant, who made them a handsome present in return for the fine boat they brought him. When the half-frantic captain arrived on shore and learned the truth, he was so enraged that he actually tried to take his boat off the beach where she lay, narrowly escaping being shot for his pains. This tale, poured into our skipper's sympathetic ears, somewhat reconciled him to his loss, since he still retained his boat. But one disaster succeeded another. A curious malady of the feet attacked every one of the crew. It caused the legs and feet to swell enormously, and culminated in a superating wound horribly painful and slow to heal. Then a deadly encounter took place between the cook and Yu Sing, which was only settled by sending the Chinamen ashore, since the two seemed bent upon murdering one another. Worst of all, when the ship was half full, the timber ceased to arrive. Ship after ship sailed away, until there were only three of us left, and the season of the northers being close upon us, when those destructive gales blow right home all along the coast, every one began to look very glum. The unfortunate invalid, George Harris, after lingering longer than any one could have believed possible, was set free from his misery at last to the manifest relief of his shipmates, who were heartily tired of his taking so long to die. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? But it is the naked truth. Under such circumstances as ours were, the better part of humanity generally disappears, or only shines in individuals who are often, almost always, powerless to help. Miserable as the time had been, it was not all lost upon me. As far as the hardship went, it was no worse, if as bad, as I had endured in the London streets. And here, at any rate, it was always warm. I had learned to chatter Spanish fluently, although much of it I would gladly unlearn if it were possible, for I have always noticed that, in picking up a language colloquially, one learns easiest and remembers longest the vilenesses. And how vile the Latin tongues can be, few Englishmen can realize. I did not grow much, not being well enough nourished, but I was wiry, hard as nails, and almost as brown as an Indian, being half naked from want of clothes. At last, one morning, my uncle sent for me. Although unconscious of any offence, I was terribly frightened, but went, shaking with dread, to meet him. To my utter amazement, he spoke kindly, saying that the ship was so old, and the season so late, that he feared that there was great danger of her never reaching home. Therefore he had decided to send me on board the bark Discoverer, commanded by a friend of his, in which, as she was a splendid vessel, I should be far safer. She was to sail the next day, so I must go on board that night. I only said, Thank you, sir, but volumes could not have expressed my gratitude. To leave this awful den, to be once more treated to a kind word occasionally, for, since Joe was gone and Jem had been driven ashore, which I have forgotten to mention, I had no friends at all on board. The prospect was too delightful for contemplation. My wardrobe being on my back, I was spared the labour of packing up. Farewells there were none to say, although, being naturally a tender-hearted little chap, 
i should have been glad of a parting godspeed but no one said anything to me as i bundled into the boat and was rowed alongside my new home as soon as i climbed on board i was met with a very chorus of welcome the warmth of my reception amazed me accustomed as i had been for so long to the miserable state of affairs on board my old ship but i soon overcame a strong temptation to cry for joy and steadily choking down the lump in my throat set about taking stock of my new vessel to my inexperience she seemed a most noble ship everything was on a much finer scale than anything i had yet seen in my brief travels she had been built for the purpose of arctic exploration and consequently presented a somewhat clumsy appearance outside from the doubling of the bow planks and stern bends and the diagonal oaken sheathing with which she was protected in board though she was roomy clear and comfortable as could be imagined while her rigging and spars were all of the very best and in tip-top condition quarters were assigned to me in the comfortable cabin of the steward whose helper i was supposed to be although from the first i had the free run of the ship fore and aft next morning we weighed with a gentle favouring breeze homeward bound but i soon discovered that there was one drawback to all this comfort the captain was a confirmed drunkard while the process of getting under way was going on he was mooning about the deck with a fishy eye and an aimless amble getting in everybody's way and causing much confusion by giving ridiculous orders had he confined himself to that all would have been well for the men humoured him good-temperedly and took no notice of his rubbish but when they had catted the anchor they were obliged to leave it hanging while they got some sail on her the fall of the cat tackle being stretched across the deck and belayed to the opposite rail as there was no forecastle head and consequently no capstan all hands being aft the skipper maundered forward to find his further progress stopped by this rope muttering unintelligibly he cast it off the pin to which it was belayed the result staggered even himself for there was a rush and a roar a perfect blaze of sparks a cloud of dust and with a jerk that almost threw everybody flat the last link of one hundred and twenty fathoms of cable brought the ship up all standing all hands had flown forward at the first bang but they were powerless to do anything except pray that the cable might part it was too good for that bearing the terrible strain to which it was subjected of bringing a ship up in twenty fathoms of water that was going nearly four knots an hour the mate got the old man aft into his cabin while the fellows clued up the canvas again and then issued the order to man the windlass once more but this the men flatly refused to do alleging that after their forenoon's work it was unreasonable to expect such a thing the mate was powerless to insist so nothing further was done till next day but give the sails the loosest kind of a furl at daybreak next morning the heavy task of getting the anchor was begun the skipper keeping out of sight there was a great deal of growling and bad language but the mate managed to get hold of a demijohn of the old man's whisky this he dispensed with no niggard hand and so the peace was kept but it was late in the day when she was again fairly under way for home after that everything went on smoothly enough although as usual the crew were of several nationalities they all pulled together very well nor did they take the advantage they might have done of the utter absence of any shadow of discipline on board the whole working of the ship devolved upon the mate for the skipper was always more or less drunk and the second mate was helpless having had his right foot smashed by a log of mahogany in loading what work was necessary during the daytime was done cheerfully enough and a general air of peace and contentment pervaded the ship for one thing the food was generally good and plentiful and none of the men were of that blackguardly kind of glory in taking every advantage of any weakness aft of course the watch-keeping at night was bad a big london boy who was much disliked for his lazy dirty habits was made to keep the lookout always in his watch a duty which he usually performed with his head between his knees 
The rest of the men slept the night through, seldom knowing whose watch on deck it was, so that if sail required trimming, all hands generally turned out to it after a good deal of inviting. The captain was supposed to keep the second mate's watch, but he set a shining example to his crew by sleeping it out wherever he happened to drop when he came on deck. I was very happy. Never since the time my troubles began, that is, at about eight years old, had I been treated so well. Being very small and fairly knowing, besides having a rather sweet treble voice, I was made a sort of plaything, a universal pet. And in the dog watches, when seated among the main hatch surrounded by the crew, I warbled the songs I knew, while not another sound disturbed the balmy evening but the murmur of the caressing waters alongside and the gentle rustle of a half-drawing sail overhead i felt as if my halcyon days had dawned at last that fortnight is one of the pleasantest recollections of my life the weather was delightfully fine and by day the ship was like a huge aviary a multitude of brilliant hued little birds being continually about her although we were out of sight of land. They were of many kinds, but all so tame, that they freely came and went through the cabin and forecastle, hunting for the cockroaches with which she was infested. On the upper yards a small colony of kestrels kept vigilant watch, descending like a flash upon any unwary birdling that dared to venture far into the open. The men made many nocturnal excursions aloft after the pirates, as they called them, giving them short shrift when they caught them. So the days drowsed on quietly and peacefully, seeming, to my youthful ignorance, as nearly perfection as they could possibly be. Not but what I felt an occasional twinge of sorrow at the continual drunkenness of the captain. Mixing with the men forward freely as I did, their rough but half-pitying comments upon him and his behavior could not fail to impress me, although I often wondered how it was that, being so well aware of the danger they ran by reason of such general neglect, they were not themselves more watchful, instead of taking such advantage as they did of the captain's fault to sleep all night. At last, on the fifteenth day from leaving port, on a clear starlit night with a gentle fair wind blowing, and all hands, including the captain, whose watch it was, asleep, the vessel ran upon a coral reef and became a total wreck having told the story in another place i cannot enlarge upon the circumstances attendant upon her loss here it must suffice to say that after many perils all hands escaped safely to land upon the quay or sandy islet which crowned the highest point of the reef a fairly large quantity of food and water was saved so that we ran no risk of privation even had the islet failed to furnish us with fish fowl and eggs in plenty as it did one circumstance i must record in passing as being well worthy of notice as soon as it was evident that the vessel was hopelessly lost the seamen forward though perfectly well behaved insisted that every drop of intoxicating liquor should be thrown overboard and in order that it should be done thoroughly themselves carried it out as the giant breakers destroyed the upper works of the ship much useful wreckage came ashore and one calm day a visit was paid to her which was rewarded by the salvage of several sails and a quantity of cordage with these comfortable tents were rigged and i have no doubt that had it been necessary we could have put in several months on that barren patch of sand quite happily huge turtle came ashore to deposit their eggs and were easily caught sea-fowl of many kinds principally boobies and frigate birds swarmed in thousands whose eggs especially those of the frigate birds were delicious eating although never being pressed by hunger we left their rank fishy flesh severely alone fish of course abounded while the crevices of the rocks concealed great numbers of clams and oysters and at night the lighting of our beacon fire attracted quite a host of crabs from the sea who fell victims in great numbers to their curiosity hardships there were none and i would far rather have lived there for six months than for one week on board the old arabella 
ten days passed gaily away during which the sailmaker and carpenter had made a fine seaworthy craft of the pinnace in which most of us reached the shore fitted with new sails and rigging and half deck she was fit for a much longer voyage than was necessary to reach the mainland of campeche the nearest town of which sisal was barely a hundred miles distant but one morning as the lookout man was ascending the rocky promontory where a flagstaff was erected to hoist the signal of distress we always kept flying by day we saw a handsome bark lying to only about two or three miles away the french ensign was flying at her peak and a boat had left her side which was being rapidly pulled shorewards they soon landed and by expressive signs the officer in charge gave us to understand that he was prepared to take us all on board but that we must make haste as the vicinity was much too dangerous to linger in longer than was absolutely necessary not one word of each other's language did we understand yet we found no difficulty in getting at one another's meaning sufficiently near for all practical purposes to my amazement however the skipper the mate and four others refused to avail themselves of the opportunity to escape they said they did not want to go to havana where the bark would land us preferring to sail in the pinnace to sisal and take their chance there when the french officer realized this he looked as if he thought the small party refusing to come with him were mad but after an outburst of volubility quite wasted upon our misunderstanding he shrugged his shoulders and retreated towards his boat followed by all who were ready to go with him his men had made good use of their time by getting a goodly quantity of birds and eggs collected and now disposed themselves with a perfect uproar of chattering in as small a compass as they could while our fellows took the oars and pulled away for the bark looking back i saw the little group of our late shipmates standing watching us from the beach a sight so pathetic that i could not help bursting into tears quite forgetting that it was entirely in accordance with their own desires that they were thus abandoned we soon reached the ship swarmed on board and swung the boat up to the davits in a twinkling while the officer who had brought us the chief mate held an animated colloquy with the captain on the poop from the expressive gestures used we had no doubt but that they were discussing the incomprehensible resolve of our captain and his followers they terminated their conversation by mutual shoulder shruggings as who should say but what would you my friend they are english whose ways are past finding out nothing could be more cordial than our reception by all hands the big longboat was cleared out for our sleeping space as the bark's forecastle accommodation was too limited to admit any more than at present occupied it and a bountiful meal of fazoli blanc a delicious puree of haricot beans good biscuit and vin ordinaire was served out to us End of chapter five Chapter six of the Log of a Sea Waif by Frank T. Bullen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six to Havana and After. This seems to be an appropriate place for noticing how, at less cost, the Frenchman fared so much better than in any sailing ship I have ever been in. The Board of Trade scale of provisions for the mercantile marine must strike every landsman as being a most absurd compilation on four days of the week each man is entitled to one and a half pounds of salt beef including bone accompanied by half a pound of flour except on saturdays when half a pint of rice may be given or nothing the other three days each bring one and a quarter pounds of salt pork and one-third of a pint of split peas every day there is an allowance per capita of one pound of bread biscuit an eighth of an ounce of tea half an ounce of coffee and three quarts of water and each week twelve ounces of sugar and half a pint of vinegar is allowed per man what scope is there here for any variety or skill in cookery even supposing that the beef and pork were in any way comparable with the same articles on shore 
which they cannot be in the nature of things such a diet must soon become infernally monotonous but the very best ships beef and pork is not nice the second best is nasty and what will pass an inspector is often utterly unfit for men to live upon entirely for any length of time while it would be considered loathsome ashore but what can be done with half a pound of flour lacking anything else except a few hops obviously the best thing to do is to make bread which is a little more palatable than the flinty outrage on the name of food that is called ship's biscuit what is usually done is to make duff which is really boiled bread with the addition of some skimmed grease from the coppers in which the meat is boiled as an act of grace but by no means of necessity a pannikin a pint of molasses is doled out for all hands on duff days but the crew are not allowed to forget that they have no claim to this dainty by act of parliament on pork days pea soup is made or yellow broth as sailors call it but peas and water with a flavouring of pork not too much lest the soup become uneatable from salt needs a stretch of courtesy to be called soup a little very little addition of vegetables would make it palatable but tis not in the bond and even if so do you think reader you would feel contented with fat pork and pea soup for dinner three times a week for four months on end for breakfast and supper a tea there is biscuit and beef or biscuit and pork washed down with the result of the modicum of coffee or tea and that is all for very shame's sake a minority of ship owners do provide a few extras such as butter an occasional mess of tinned meat and a few preserved potatoes and pickles but these are the exception and not the rule moreover whenever these additional helps are given the men are always reminded that they have no right to them that no owner need give anything more than bare pound and pint of the board of trade scale contrast this with our living on board the bordeaux bark potosi in the first place the bread which was in large puffy cakes came under the slightest moisture as easy to eat and as palatable as baker's bread this alone was an enormous boon breakfast which like all the other meals was taken by all hands at once was hardly a meal in our sense of the term it was only a cup of coffee exceedingly good some bread and about a gill of cognac luncheon at noon consisted of half a pound of meat free of bone and some preparation of vegetables bread and a half pint of wine dinner at four p m was a grand affair the changes were rung upon arico beans lentils vermicelli macaroni and such legumes cooked with meat and flavoured so that the smell was intensely appetising bread and half pint of wine and there was abundance but no waste yet i am persuaded that the cost was much less than that of our authorised scale of provisions about which it is difficult to speak with patience it will i think be admitted that where men are shut up to a life of such monotony as the seaman's calling must necessarily be their food ought at least to have some consideration the meal hours form almost the only breaks in the day's sameness and if the food be poor in quality and without variety it is bound to engender bad feeling and a hatred of those of whose fault it is the outcome this by way of apology for such a lengthy dwelling upon the subject if any be needed though i have always felt that its importance is great enough to merit much more attention than it commonly receives we had a very pleasant passage the bark was a wonderfully handy vessel and her equipment was so good that it excited the wondering admiration of all of our men the discipline was quite naval in its character and the day's duties went on with the regularity of clockwork of course we could not understand the language and were in consequence unable to know whether there was the same amount of grumbling commentary forward upon the sayings and doings of the officers as is almost universal in british ships with the exception of blue noses canadian vessels 
but it was admitted by all of us that the crew seemed well content and heartily willing and that she was indeed a model ship my scanty knowledge of spanish came in useful for the captain spoke that language about as well as i did on his discovering this fact he sent for me and by dint of patience succeeded in learning from me such facts as he wished to know rewarding me with many a titbit from his table as well as some very useful gifts of clothing which as i was almost naked were most acceptable arriving at havana we were handed over to the british consul leaving the friendly frenchmen with much regret and three hearty cheers which they returned with interest a la francaise we were no sooner clear of her than they began to get under way again and by the time we were on the wharf she was once more heading for home by orders of the consul we were marched up to a fonda or eating-house facing the plaza de armas which we understood was to be our home during our stay a plentiful meal was set before us but we did not appreciate it much every dish being saturated with the flavour of garlic but as two bottles of wine were apportioned to each individual the meal was a merry one all hands declaring that bread and wine would suit them down to the ground a bundle of cigars were distributed by a benevolent-looking old stranger who introduced himself as the shipping master and spoke excellent american being as he informed us a native of new orleans after a smoke we were conducted to a large paved room at the back of the premises which was simply furnished with a couple of huge tables and sundry benches and had in one corner an unprotected well here we were told we must spread such bedding as we had and make ourselves as comfortable as we could until our proper dormitory was vacated by the recruiting party that at present occupied it the said party were by no means an inviting crowd they swarmed about the big chamber we were in looking fit for any villainy and ostentatiously displaying their vicious-looking bowie knives all our fellows had been deprived of their sheath knives upon first coming ashore under the plea that the carrying of weapons was unlawful though we were the only unarmed people i saw in the city during my stay however we had no choice of quarters so we proceeded to spread such ragged blankets as we possessed upon the flagstones against one of the bare walls and in due time ranged ourselves thereon owing i suppose to the unusual quantity of wine they had drunk all our men were soon asleep and when some one took away the smoky kerosene lamp the place was pitchy dark except where the silver bars of moonlight streaming through the unglazed holes in the walls divided the blackness into rigid sections i could not sleep the novelty of the situation the strange smells and an indefinable fear of that truculent crowd of armed men kept all my senses at highest tension there was no door and through the opening in the wall dark shapes of men came and went softly on heaven knows what errands i had reached a condition of mind when i felt as if i must scream to relieve my pent-up feelings when i saw some figures bending over my sleeping shipmates as if searching for something by this time my eyes had become able to distinguish objects in the surrounding gloom and i found that there were at least twenty men in the place terribly frightened and hardly knowing what i did i roused the carpenter by whose side i lay and whispered hoarsely in his ear what i had seen the word was passed along and in a few minutes we were all afoot and straggling out into the moonlight flooded courtyard there we stood like a flock of startled sheep irresolute what to do but some of the knife-carrying gentry emerged after us and began whetting their weapons on the blocks of stone laying about portions of a ruined wall this significant hint decided us and we passed out into the silent street feeling to the full that we were strangers in a strange land lights of any kind there were none and the intense brilliance of the moon cast shadows as solid as does the electric glare a few yards of uncertain wandering and we were lost there seemed to be no one about and yet i could have sworn i saw dark shapes gliding along in the inky shadows 
and presently i fell headlong over something in the road my outstretched hand striking with a splash into a pool of mud a cold thrill ran along my spine when i found i was lying across a corpse and that the sticky paste on my hands was red we quickened our steps after that keeping in the middle of the streets but as ignorant of our direction or our purpose as if we had been a herd of swine devoid of instinct at last from sheer weariness we sat down upon the steps of some large building and drooped our heads as if he had risen from the ground a vigilante a watchman appeared bearing a short spear from the upper third of which dangled a lantern vamos pedos he growled prodding those nearest to him into instant wakefulness no one needed a translation or a second bidding to be gone dogs so we tramped wearily along our bare feet bruised by the littering stones as often as we dropped for a brief rest one of those ubiquitous sereños moved us on again to the same monotonous epithet of contempt i often think what a queer-looking procession we must have been my only garments were a flannel singlet and a pair of canvas trousers so stiff that they creaked woodenly as i trotted along cap or boots i had none the rest were in much the same plight though none were quite so naked as me going along a narrow lane whereof i read the title aguacalle on a building at the corner i slipped off the hummocky sidewalk into a slough of soft slush up to my armpits and was dragged out by my next friend with a new covering of such evil odour that i had to keep a respectful distance from my companions thenceforth finally we emerged upon what seemed to be a wide common or piece of waste ground here at last we were permitted to squat unmolested fear of scorpions centipedes and snakes kept me from sleep but all my companions lay sound in strange attitudes under the full glare of the moon while i watched wondering if the night would ever end at the first glimmer of dawn i aroused my companions who were all reeking with dew and we made for the streets again going as straight back to our lodgings as we knew the road when we entered the warriors had all gone no one belonging to the establishment was astir so we cast ourselves down on our rags and slept like stones until aroused at eight o'clock by the servants until eleven we dozed on the benches or in whatever corners we could find when a plentiful breakfast revived us in spite of the garlic after our meal the vice-consul paid us a visit he listened gravely to our complaints of the accommodation we had found then he invited us to accompany him to the consul's office on our arrival all hands were shown into a large bare room while i was called upstairs to undergo a searching cross-examination by the consul as to what clothes the men had saved the incidents of the shipwreck etc i suppose he thought that so young a boy would be more likely to tell a true tale than those artful rogues of sailors as he seemed to regard them he was not at all kind or sympathetic that was no part of his business i suppose but as he was writing an order upon a slop seller for some clothing for us a handsome young lieutenant from an english man-of-war came in his eyes fastened upon me at once and after a hurried question or two of the consul he came to me and spoke pitifully giving me two dollars out of his pocket as a solid token of his sympathy then the consul had all hands in and harangued them telling them to be sure and keep sober which as they were penniless was rather uncalled for advice and by no means to stray away from the immediate vicinity of the shipping office they would be sure to get a ship in a day or two he said dismissing us with a curt good day he retired while we followed the vice-consul to the clothiers here the men received each a rig-out of cheap garments but i was treated much better why i do not know after all the men had been served and had returned to our lodging i was furnished with quite a nice suit of clothes with good underclothing patent leather shoes and broad-rimmed panama hat 
a brilliant red silk sash was given me by the shopkeeper as a present and thus glorified i felt quite transformed with many cautions as to my behaviour the official bade me good day and i was left to my own devices and then began one of the strangest experiences of my life wherever i went people looked kindly at me and spoke to me as if they were interested in me i entered upon shop after shop to spend some of my money but found it impossible for the shopkeepers insisted upon giving me what i asked for without any payment and often added to my store of cash besides when at last i returned to the fonda i was loaded with cigars fruit pastry and all sorts of odds and ends so that my shipmates were loud in their welcomes by nightfall we were all in a very contented condition of mind and when the landlord politely requested me to inform my friends that our sleeping apartment was prepared we felt that our comfort was complete but our joy had a tremendous setback when we were shown the said bedroom it was a long lean-to shed erected against an ancient wall of rubble that had never known contact with a whitewash brush the floor was of dried mud along the centre of its whole length ran an open ditch which carried in a sluggish stream all the sewage of the house on either side of this foul cloaca were arranged charpoys a sort of exaggerated camp-stool which constituted the entire furnishing of this primitive bedchamber it was well ventilated although there were no windows for daylight was visible in many places through gaps in the boarding of the outer wall and roof many and vigorous were the comments passed upon the filthy hole but there was no suggestion of raising any complaint as all felt that it would be useless and at any rate the place was our own and we could barricade the door so spreading our blankets upon the charpoys we turned in and were soon oblivious of all our surroundings next day in the course of my wanderings i entered the fine billiard room of the hotel saint isabelle and chummed up with the marker i was well acquainted with the game having learned how to mark in one of the strange bypaths of my nomad life before going to sea and this knowledge now came in usefully for the marker was a one-armed man who was often sorely bothered by the management of his three tables especially when the players were lively american and english skippers i was made heartily welcome being helpful in a double sense from my knowledge of spanish as well as my acquaintance with the game from that time forward la fonda de buen gusto saw little of me and that little at uncertain intervals i had a comfortable chamber the best fare the hotel afforded while as for money the customers supplied me so liberally that my pockets were always full as i could not spend it most of it found its way to my shipmates for i never came across one without handing some of it over the idea of saving any never dawned upon me and when all my old shipmates were gone afloat again i could always manage to find some english-speaking mariners to whom i was welcome company for a ramble round town the time flew by on golden wings all my former miseries were forgotten in my present luxurious life and i blossomed into that hateful thing an impudent boy uncontrolled by anybody and possessing all the swagger and assurance of a man such as i was however i attracted the attention of a gentleman who held a most important post under government as a civil engineer he was a fairly constant visitor at the hotel when in havana and our acquaintance ripened into a strong desire on his part to adopt me and save me from the ruin he could see awaited me his only son a young man of three-and-twenty was his assistant the two being more like brothers than parent and child having made up his mind he fitted me out with an elegant suit of clothes made to his liking and one day took me in his carriage to see the consul and arrange matters to his intense surprise and disgust the consul flatly refused to sanction the affair telling him that he was responsible for my return to england and that as i had admitted that my father was alive any inquiry after me which resulted in the discovery that i had been allowed to remain in cuba without my parents consent 
would make matters very unpleasant for him all attempts on mr d s part to shake this decision were fruitless the consul refused to discuss the matter further and closed the conversation by warning me that i was liable to severe punishment for absenting myself so long from the home where he had placed me what i felt i cannot describe mr d with a deeply dejected face bade me good-bye his duties calling him into the interior next day he gave me twenty-five dollars as a parting present and advised me to get a ship as soon as possible for home it may readily be imagined that i had no hankering after the sea again the pleasant aimless life i had been leading the inordinate petting and luxury i had grown accustomed to had made me look upon ship life with unutterable loathing and i secretly determined that if i could avoid it i would never go to sea any more about this time a terrible epidemic of yellow fever set in so great was its virulence that even the never-ending warfare between the royalist and insurgents slowed down and instead of a ragged regiment of wastrels being dispatched into the mountains about twice a week the authorities were hard put to it to collect recruits at all the great bell of the cathedral tolled unceasingly all night long the rumble of the wagons over the uneven causeways sounded like subdued thunder as they passed from house to house collecting the corpses of the victims the harbour was crowded with vessels denuded of their crews and from every masthead flew the hateful yellow flag it was heartbreaking to see and hear the agony of the sailors being taken ashore to hospital they knew full well that there was hardly a glimmer of hope that they would return the chinese who acted as nurses were destitute of any feeling of humanity and the doctors were worked to death the nuns who gave their lives nobly could do little but minister such ghostly comfort as they knew how but the net result of the hospital treatment was with hardly an exception death yet in spite of the scourge and general paralysis of trade in consequence life as far as i could see went on much the same as ever the inhabitants seemed determined to put a brave air on and whatever their inner feelings might be and i declare that i saw very little to frighten me one can get used to anything especially when one has not learned to think several weeks passed away and i was still free though not quite so flush of money for the customers at the hotel were necessarily fewer one day i was taking a stroll down by the deserted wharves when i noticed a peculiar glow in the sky it came from the heart of a gigantic cloud that draped half the heavens and seemed as if it hid hell behind it fascinated by the sight though my heart thumped furiously i waited on the wharf and watched its development the cloud spread until the whole dome was covered in by it and the fierce glare took a strange greenish tinge all around the edge of the darkness ran an incessant tangle of vari-coloured lightnings and a continual rumble of thunder seemed to make the earth vibrate suddenly the storm burst jamming myself into a corner between some posts whence i felt sure no wind could dislodge me i waited and watched for the first few minutes i thought i should have died of fright torrents of water like the fall of a sea were lashed into foam as they fell and all torn into gleaming fragments by innumerable flashes flying in every conceivable direction an overpowering smell like burning sulphur pervaded all as for the wind its force must have been frightful judging from its effect upon the shipping and houses but where i stood only a very strong gale could be felt such as no seaman would think extraordinary this lasted about an hour but i cannot say much for time and then the rain ceased what a scene of horror the bay presented vessels of all kinds drifted aimlessly about wrecking each other and covering the boiling maelstrom of the harbour with their debris overhead a louder roar occasionally made me look up to catch sight of a flying roof like a cloud fragment fleeting through the murky air 
a large yankee schooner was torn from her anchors and lifted on to a ledge beneath the moro castle which jutted out of the perpendicular cliff about a hundred feet above high-water mark there she remained upright with her bottom stove in like columbus's egg of all the vessels in the harbour the only ones that survived without serious damage were the warships which with topmasts housed and cables veered out to the clinch were all steaming full speed ahead and even then hardly easing the tremendous strain on the latter taking advantage of a lull i emerged from my corner drenched to the skin of course and so cramped from my long crookedness that at first i could hardly feel my feet as hurriedly as i could i made my way towards the hotel finding the roadways almost blocked with ruins the hotel had escaped much damage and i was received with open arms soon forgetting all my fears in a good meal and cheerful talk in spite of the havoc it had made the general feeling was one of thankfulness it being taken for granted that the hurricane would be found to have swept away the far more dreaded yellow jack and this was literally true for not a single fresh case was reported from that day forward business revived with a bound for there was much work to do everywhere shipwrights especially commanding almost any wages they liked to ask about a week after the hurricane i was standing watching the transport of a huge steam launch over an isthmus to the dockyard when i felt a hand on my shoulder turning sharply i saw the yellow visage of the vice-consul who was accompanied by a man in uniform to whom he gave me in charge i was fairly caught and without further delay in spite of my vehement protestations i was put into a boat and taken on board a large bark the sea gem of st andrews n s the captain a kindly-looking old gentleman heard my impudent remarks in amused silence until he thought i had gone far enough then he stopped me with a quiet that'll do my lad you don't want a rope's end i'm sure i had not lost any sense so i pocketed my grievance and crept sullenly forward end of chapter six chapter seven of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven off to sea again the sea gem had suffered greatly from the hurricane but by dint of strenuous effort on the part of her agents was now fairly seaworthy again the ravages of pestilence however had left her almost unmanned the only survivors being the second mate the carpenter and a couple of american negro youths the new captain i learned from the carpenter who had taken me under his protection had been retired for some years occupying a fairly well-paid post ashore in havana but tempted by a lucrative offer from the agents and greatly longing to return home again he had accepted the post of master of the sea gem he had succeeded in collecting another crew to take the vessel home but they were indeed a motley crowd three austrians a montenegrin a swede a frenchman and two more negroes made up the compliment forward all of whom spoke of barbarous dialect of spanish among themselves although the austrians also conversed indifferently in some slav tongue as well as in italian there was as yet no chief mate but another american negro had been secured for cook and steward no cargo being procurable we were to proceed in ballast to mobile for cotton and thence home i had not yet lost hope of being able to escape before sailing and the carpenter who seemed to be greatly amused by my company rather encouraged me in the idea strangely enough nobody seemed to trouble about me and i foolishly sulked about all day doing nothing but brood over the possibility of getting away at last a chance presented itself all the members of the new crew were taken ashore to the consul's office to sign articles and i of course went along i had still a good deal of money and as soon as i had signed and been ordered by the captain to go down to the boat and await his coming i demurely obeyed and bolted in a contrary direction as soon as i had turned the street corner 
I was free. Indeed, I had an uneasy feeling that at any moment I might be arrested for desertion, but I refused to entertain it, and hurried up town to the Hotel St. Isabel. Here I got a shock. My old friend, the billiard marker, was gone, and the new man did not look upon me at all favorably. My other acquaintances in the hotel, too, appeared anxious to avoid me, as if they had been warned not to give me harborage there so I wandered forth disconsolately, feeling as if the place was quite strange to me. In the course of a long ramble, I fell in with a young American seaman who was outward bound, i.e. hard up, but as full of fun as if he had just been paid off. We had a great time together for a couple of days, getting as far away as Matanzas, and using up my stock of dollars at an alarming rate the third day we were a bit weary of skylarking about and decided to return to his boarding-house and have a good night's rest when we arrived there it was past closing time and the place was all dark and silent it was a big corner building springing straight from the roadway with flat walls up to a height of about fourteen feet where a balcony ran right round the building to rouse the landlord was more than we dared so after much scheming we managed to find a light cart under a shed which we dragged from its place and upended under the balcony my chum who was very tall climbed up the shafts and scaled the balcony then lowered his long sash to me i was speedily by his side and together we sought and found his room which opened on to the balcony and was luckily unoccupied Feeling secure, our love of fun overcame weariness, and after a boisterous pillow fight, we strolled out on the balcony again. Just then, a sereno loitered round the corner and uplifted his voice. Ave Maria Purissima, sin pacato canceba, doce ora noche serena. As the echoes died away, he caught sight of the cart standing where it ought not, and proceeded to investigate moved by the same spirit of mischief we hurried to the chamber and found a big jug of water which zeke carefully poured upon the head of the muttering vigilante the effect was amazing raving like a lunatic he assaulted the great door with feet and spear butt making an uproar that speedily aroused everybody within earshot our house hummed like a hive and before many minutes we heard the hurried tramp of feet along the uncarpeted corridors and the babble of many voices the drenched officials shrilly predominant presently they entered our room to find us just awaking from a sound sleep and blinking at the lanterns like owls so deep had been our slumbers that it was some time before zeke could explain how i came to be there but the landlord, whom I recognized as an old acquaintance, was quite easily satisfied about me. Clearly we were not the offenders, and the search party passed along, leaving us to enjoy a frantic jig at the glorious disturbance we had aroused. How the affair was settled I never heard, for the next day was my last of liberty. Zeke went down to the shipping office to look for a ship in the morning, leaving me to my own devices after an hour's ramble uptown i began to feel a miserable reaction helped on doubtless by the fact that i had shared my last dollar with my chum and couldn't for the life of me see where any more were coming from presently i turned into a cafe and called for a cup of coffee i had not learned to drink anything stronger while i sat moodily sipping it a drunken disreputable-looking man of about forty roused himself from one of the tables and coming over to where i was addressed me in broad scotch with maudlin tears he assured me that he was the chief mate of the sea gem and that he must get on board that day but how he did not know he dared not go out for fear of being arrested would i take pity on him and see him on board he must have been in a queer state of mind for i was but a boy of thirteen and small for my age my pride was touched and i readily assented leading him carefully down to the wharf and engaging a boat for him there i would have left him but he held on to me like a bear swearing he would be lost and undone without me so i had to go off with him when we got alongside the second mate appeared at the gangway and lowered a bowline which i slipped over the helpless creature's head and under his arms thus he was hauled on board like a sack of flour 
then the second mate sternly ordered me to come up i refused but he quietly said well then i must come and fetch you that was sufficient i mounted the side and said good-bye to havana that a rope's ending awaited me i felt sure but instead of that the captain called me into his cabin and gave me a most fatherly talking to his kindness made me feel bad and i promised him forthwith to be a good boy and forget my vagabond independent way of living ashore patting me on the head he dismissed me to make my peace with the second mate who was very angry with me indeed he received my apologies in silence and although never friendly i had no cause to complain of his treatment afterwards of the mate i saw nothing for two or three days for although we left havana the next morning he was in such a woeful condition after his long debauch that he could not leave his berth when he did appear he seemed to have forgotten who i was his manner to me was extremely brutal in fact he was a brute all round although a lively regard for his own skin made him careful how he treated the curious crowd of dagoes forward they were not at all a bad lot and considering their limited vocabulary got on fairly well with the work of the ship the little frenchman in particular was like a bundle of watch springs when he once comprehended an order it was delightful to see him execute it but its desperate attempts to understand what was said were quite pathetic he spoke a mixture of spanish and french which the others did not well understand and at last he pitched upon me as the only one he could hold anything like a conversation with though how we managed it i have now no idea everybody liked the old man he was so genial so simple that it was a pleasure to see him but i am afraid he would have had a bad time of it with the crew of britishers they appreciate a tight hand and are quick to take advantage of anything like easy going on the part of their officers this polyglot crowd however gave no trouble and in spite of the bungling stupidity of the mate who never seemed to get quite clear of the after-effects of his big drunk things went on oiled wheels we were drawing near our port when one afternoon during a fine wholesale breeze there was a sudden gloom which suddenly overspread the sky somebody was keeping a bad lookout doubtless for before any sail could be reduced a squall of wind and hail struck the vessel throwing her on her beam ends it was so sudden that although all halyards and sheets were let fly at once not a yard would come down the ship lying over at too great an angle and above the roaring of the wind and the flapping of the flying canvas the ominous rumble of the stone ballast rattling down to leeward could be plainly heard the deck was like the wall of a house and when i saw the foaming sea rising up on the lee side as high as the hatches i felt sure she was turning bottom up by god's mercy we had an old suit of sails bent which the wind stripped from the yards and stays like muslin great sheets of canvas flitted away into the darkness to leeward while the flying running gear cracked like volleys of musketry gradually as the pressure weakened she righted regaining as even a keel as the shifted ballast would allow and we were safe but there were many pale faces besides mine the old captain especially looking terribly shaken up every stitch of canvas that had been set when the squall burst was gone and as the weather gradually settled into a strong gale there was a desperate night's work ahead in our position with a great deal of land about it was imperatively necessary to get sail set but before that could be done it had to be bent that is secured to the yards such a task as this tests the capabilities of a crew very well in a man-of-war where they can send a man to every robund and a couple to each earring the job is fairly easy but in a merchant ship it means almost superhuman labour from the scarcity of hands i shall not attempt to describe the process which bristles with technical details that cannot be grasped without a corresponding idea of the condition of work aloft in bad weather suffice it to say that by midnight the two lower topsails foresail and fore topmast flaysail were set and the hands thoroughly exhausted allowed to rest awhile 
It was my first experience of bad weather at sea, and I thought regretfully of the ease and comfort of my late life. But a kind of philosophic determination not to cry over spilt milk, which has attended me all my life, came to my rescue and prevented me from being too miserable. The poor old captain, however, was severely tried. Evidently his fortitude and ability were less than he had imagined. He looked worn and decrepit, a settled anxiety gave him a haggard appearance, and all hands pitied him. The fine weather had entirely forsaken us, nothing but fierce squalls and incessantly shifting winds prevailing until we made Dog Island, at the entrance to Mobile Bay, under the lee of which we came to an anchor. Our troubles were even then not over, for a gale sprang up almost immediately, which raised so ugly a sea that the lively vessel almost plunged bows under. All hands but the captain and myself were aloft, furling the sails forward. I stood alone by the windlass, ready to slack or make fast such running gear as I was called upon to look after, when, with a tremendous bound, the ship reared itself high in air forward, snapping the sorely tried cable, the released links of which flew aft over the windlass barrel with a deafening crash and shower of sparks. Everything was at once dropped aloft, the hands came sliding down backstays at their best gait, and in less than five minutes the other anchor was let go. Cable was veered away to ninety fathoms, and fervent hopes expressed that she would hold, for night was almost upon us, and our position was dangerous in the extreme. Happily, the wind hauled soon after, the sea became smooth, and we rode in comparative comfort till noon next day, when a powerful tug came down and towed us up among the shipping to a secure berth. A fine fleet of ships lay there, all loading cotton for Liverpool. Nor, in spite of the number of vessels, was there any delay in commencing our cargo, for the next day, after mooring, a gang of stevedores came on board and set to work, with characteristic American energy, to prepare the hold. Our captain left us for Mobile City in the same steamer that brought them, returning with the first load of cotton, but only to bid us farewell. He called us all aft, and with a quivering lip informed us that he did not feel equal to taking the ship home. Therefore he had determined to make way for a better man, who would be with us in a few days. He thanked all hands for the way they had treated him, and then, shaking hands all round, got into the boat and was rowed away to an upward-bound steamer, which lay alongside our nearest neighbor, the Mary Durkee. A hearty cheer followed him, which, if it lacked the simultaneous volume peculiar to Britons, was certainly no less sincere. Then the cotton began to come in. The great loosely pressed bales, weighing some six hundred weight each, were whipped on board like magic by a single purchase steam winch on board the steamer, and tumbled into the hold as fast as they came. Below, operations commenced by laying a single tier of bales side by side across the ship, on the levelled ballast, leaving sufficient space in the middle of the tier to adjust a jack screw then to a grunting chanty the screw was extended to its full length and another bale inserted the process was repeated until at last long wooden levers were attached to the iron bars of the screw and the whole gang tallied on until the last possible bale was squeezed into the tier which was then almost as solid as a beam of timber built into the ship it was a point of honour among stevedores to jam as many bales into a ship as she could possibly be made to contain, and restraint was often needed to prevent the energetic workers from seriously injuring vessels by the displacement of deck planks, stanchions, bulkheads, and even beams. On deck there was much to do. A winter passage across the Atlantic was before us. The vessel had been greatly neglected in Havana, and a great deal of sail-making had to be done. The mate, having obtained a demijohn of bug-juice from one of the cotton steamers, was constantly drunk, so that all the work devolved upon the austere second mate, who toiled early and late to keep matters in hand. 
owing to the docility of the crew this was possible but he was greatly relieved when one fine morning a tall determined-looking man with a sallow face heavy black moustache and nasal twang arrived on board and announced himself as captain jones come to take command within half an hour of his arrival he had been all over the ship had interviewed every member of the crew and had repeated at least a dozen times that he was a down easter and proposed to run this packet yankee fashion with an intuition i have always had i determined at once that he was carrying a good cargo of liquor and it was as well for the besotted chief mate that this was so for he would not otherwise have been so friendly with him i'm sure his rounds completed he retired to the saloon catching sight of me as he went and appointing me cabin boy on the spot my first duty was to call the maid into his presence there and then the two of them seated vis-a-vis -vis, began to drink themselves speechless while i stood in attendance filling up their glasses until they could no longer hold them at last they rolled off their seats and lay across one another insensible i retired and informed the steward who lifted his hands despairingly exclaiming for the good lord does gwander all hell afloat on on them's bad enough but skipper and mate both while we gone to i don't know but captain jones carouse only lasted a couple of days at the expiration of that time he sobered up and though looking very demoralized went about the ship like a man that knew his business thoroughly and meant doing it strangely enough he allowed the mate to go on as he had been doing never interfering with him in any way when two-thirds of our cargo was in captain jones went up to the city again during his absence the stevedores quitted work and left us for the christmas holidays by christmas eve there was not a steamer left in the bay and an aching sense of discontent manifested itself all through the fleet not to speak of any festive provision there was an actual dearth of fresh stores of any kind as no vessels had been down for several days boats came and went from ship to ship on the same errand seeking wherewithal to make a christmas dinner but there was no hope all were alike unprovided gloom sat on every face as the prospect of a salt junk dinner on christmas day grew more definite and the language used about the matter was altogether improper and unseasonable but just as dusk was stealing in a solitary schooner was sighted coming into the bay from the river under a press of canvas which in spite of the light breeze prevailing drove her along at a good pace it was quite dark by the time she reached us and much to our surprise dropped her anchor close aboard of us as soon as she swung to the wind the voice of captain jones hailed us from her deck crying send a boat aboard he had no sooner spoken than a perfect chorus arose about him the squealing of swine the cackling of geese and the shrill war-cry of turkeys blessed discord filling us with visions of feasting too delightful for speech there was no delay in getting the boat afloat all hands being full of eagerness to assist after receiving the skipper the boat made a tour of the anchorage captain jones standing up as each ship was passed and shouting the good news at the top of his voice then returning to the schooner the boatmen laboured like trojans to transfer the stock to our deck besides the poultry and pigs there was a huge pile of fresh beef vegetables and enough drinkables to furnish a carouse for the combined crews of the whole fleet the transshipment was barely completed when customers began to arrive soon we were the centre of a flotilla of boats whose crews lined our rails while the skippers examined the provisions all the lamps in the ship were lighted and hung about and a rostrum being erected captain jones began his auction it was the strangest scene i ever witnessed on board ship roars of laughter punctuated every remark of the auctioneer and assisted by swiftly circulating bottles of strong waters the fun raged furiously until long past midnight then as the last of the visitors departed uproariously our excited crowd quickly calmed down and quiet reigned until a late hour on christmas morning of the subsequent feast there is no need to speak 
sufficient to say that it laid over all my experiences on board ship for our skipper having cleared a goodly sum by his cuteness and enterprise could well afford to be generous and he was four or five days elapsed before our stevedores returned and the work of shipping cargo recommenced but once they got to work again no more time was lost a week more saw every crevice wherein it was possible to jam by the most violent means a bale of cotton utilized and even then the skipper growled because the time of year made it impossible for him to risk carrying a few bales on deck at last the day came on which captain jones was to make his last journey to town to clear the ship for sea before he went he called all hands aft and offered to buy such clothing as they required for the homeward passage being almost destitute of dunnage i ventured to put in my plea for a little but was grievously disappointed he would not buy me a rag telling me that i was not a wage earner but a passenger and he couldn't afford to spend money out of his own pocket two days after we weighed for home we had fairly good weather as we were swept through the tortuous florida straits by the rush of the gulf stream which whether you will or not carries you to the northeast at the rate of a hundred miles in twenty-four hours but we were hardly clear of the land before a fierce northwesterly gale came howling down upon us and my sufferings commenced in real earnest for although i was supposed to be cabin boy i had to be on deck almost as much as i was in the cabin the mate seemed to take a curious sort of pleasure in hazing me about as if he had some personal grudge against me although i never could understand why i was so bitterly cold-footed that i stole a pair of the captain's stockings i had nothing but a pair of patent leather shoes for footwear they the stockings were very old and i soon wore out both the feet which i cut off at the ankles sewed up the openings and put them on again this ingenuity led to disaster for springing up on the after-house one day by the side of the captain who was leaning against it he saw his initials on my leg investigation followed in which i pleaded my sufferings from cold and his refusal to get me anything to wear in mobile my excuse was of course unacceptable and although he did not beat me i was forbidden the cabin precincts any more and compelled to go barefoot for the remainder of the passage i was now in the mate's watch and that worthy treated me with studied brutality i scarcely ever came within reach of him but i got a kick he seldom struck me with his hands as we got further to the eastward the weather grew worse and worse gale succeeded gale with hardly a lull between but our vessel being in such fine trim we were decidedly better off than as if she had been deep in the water at last however we fell in with a regular hurricane every stitch of canvas was taken in but a storm staysail made of the heaviest canvas woven under which we lay to until she gave a tremendous weather lurch and rolling to leeward with a vicious jerk the triangular patch of sail blew clean out of its bolt ropes from that time we lay under bare poles for eighteen hours during much of which i sat on the poop beside the tiller hauling back the slack of the wheel ropes more dead than alive from the wet and cold never having seen such a storm at sea before i was dreadfully frightened until i saw how unconcernedly the sea-birds hovered about us then i reasoned that if those tiny things were so secure surely a big ship like ours must be more so unsound as my conclusion was it comforted me and i had no more fear a few days of light fine weather succeeded this storm during which everything was made shipshape again aloft the captain was a prime seaman and having completely left off his drinking managed everything at first-rate style but he never forgave me for my theft nor did he ever check the mate for his ill usage of me one lovely afternoon to the surprise of all hands the order was given to shorten sail there was not a cloud in the sky and a gentle southwesterly breeze was wafting us along about four knots an hour but as the work of furling the upper canvas proceeded the rumour went round that the glass as seamen always termed the barometer was falling very fast 
it may have been but for twenty-four hours we lay under lower topsails and courses not a trace of change in the serene weather prevailing in the first watch of the next night there stole over the sky a gloomy shade which deepened until the heavens were black not black as night or black as ink but as if a pall of black velvet had been suspended over the sea scarcely higher than the mastheads the wind died completely away the water was smooth as oil and so still that not a creaking rope or rattling sheave disturbed the death-like silence when the lookout man struck four bells the sound seemed to wound like a sword cut so sharp and unnatural was its clangour this state of things lasted for about three hours then gradually tiny threads of light ran waveringly in every direction as if the solemn dome of darkness above was cracking and revealing an immense glow above it the brilliant crevices widened grew longer and more vivid until the whole firmament was aglow with flashes of intensest light while all our spars were outlined in lambent flame this display lasted for about an hour then faded away the gloom disappeared and the deep blue sky studded with innumerable stars and unflecked by a single cloud extended from horizon to horizon this beautiful weather lasted for another twenty-four hours and then a gentle westerly breeze sprang up which gradually freshened until we were flying along homeward at tremendous speed carrying every stitch of canvas the ship could stagger under meanwhile the mate's treatment of me got worse until one night he dealt me a savage kick which hurled me off the poop on to the main deck where i lay insensible for some time although no bones were broken i had received such severe injury that i was unable to walk for two days during my confinement i made a desperate resolution and as soon as i resumed work again carried it into effect by boldly approaching my merciless tyrant and telling him that i was a consul's passenger as he very well knew i promised him that if there was any law that could reach him i would endeavour to have him punished for his cruelty and now i said you can kill me if you like i don't care much to my surprise he weakened at once and for the remainder of the voyage i was freed from his cowardly attacks the brave westerly wind that was hurling us homeward acted as usual that is to say it strengthened until slowly and reluctantly sail was reduced to the two lower topsails and reefed foresail the ship was so buoyant that the mountainous seas which surrounded her and often rose upon either side to such a height as to make it appear as if we were racing through a deep green valley never broke on board but the skilful courageous steering required could only be performed by a few selected members of the crew several men had to be suddenly relieved of the task for their nerve failed them at sight of the mighty green walls soaring above their heads and they were within an ace of letting her broach to this terrible calamity which has been the end of so many fine ships occurs when the vessel swings broadside on to a great sea which either smashes her up or rolls her over in the most favourable cases much damage is bound to follow we saw one sorrowful instance of it in a brig which we flew by helpless to aid she was just sinking the doomed crew clinging to the weather rigging as if to put off their inevitable fate for a few fleeting minutes a huge sea rose between us hiding her from view and when we soared on the crest of the next one she was gone like a foam flake thus we ran until the colour of the water told us we were nearing the land and soon we saw through the flying spindrift the lonely outpost of the fastnet rock with its sturdy lighthouse which looked to me like a beckoning finger then mist wreaths and snow squalls shut out everything from view except a bark which apparently going to liverpool like ourselves kept steadily on about a mile in front of us so exactly did we keep in her wake that it looked as if we were following her lead the weather got thicker but the gale was unabated and still we flew before it 
suddenly we were all startled by the report of a gun and out of the fog on the starboard bow loomed the figure of a lightship with three ball-crowned masts our leader had disappeared as we passed the lightship she fired another gun and a lift in the fog showed the name on her side conigbeg still we kept on all hands watching the skipper's troubled face but a sudden roar of breakers right ahead sent all hands flying to the braces hard down went the helm and round came the ship on her heel the spray from the heavy following sea flying high over our topsail yards while the tender vessel heeled over until the lee rail was under water not a moment too soon for the furious roar of the baffled breakers sounded deafeningly as their fleecy crests boiled and foamed under our lee only half a dozen cables length away slowly slowly we clawed off that ugly reef for more than an hour the issue was in gravest doubt then hope began to revive as the good ship's weatherly qualities became manifest and it was plain to all that we were drawing clear the breeze now began to take off a bit and more sail was made without any further incident we ran steadily up channel to point lenas where we got a pilot and a tug which by daylight brought us safely to an anchorage in the mersey we only anchored for an hour or two waiting for high water when we were coaxed into the brunswick dock and made solidly fast on the side next the street as soon as ever i could do so unobserved i slipped down a fender lanyard and touched england with my feet feeling a delightful thrill as i did so why i did not know but the fact remains a homeless friendless waif with no prospects before me no one to welcome me i rejoice to be in england again as if i too felt it good to be at home End of chapter seven chapter eight of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight struggles in liverpool and london in a very short time all hands had left the ship but myself a decrepit old man arrived from somewhere to act as watchman but he took no notice of me and i made no advances not a word had been said to me by anybody when they left the ship and i was greatly in doubt as to whether i was supposed to clear out like everybody else but i was very sure that i did not know where to go and so i coiled myself up in my bunk and went to sleep as it was getting late when i woke it was morning a heavy fall of snow had covered everything during the night and the outlook was as desolate and dreary as could be imagined making my way aft i found the cabin all locked up so that though i was ravenously hungry there was no chance of getting anything to eat the ancient watchman was fast asleep in the galley into which i stole to warm my freezing bare feet as soon as i got the chill out of my bones i returned to the forecastle and found to my delight an old pair of boots that one of the chaps had discarded with these and some rags i covered my aching feet and then mounting on the rail looked long and eagerly shorewards presently i made out over the window of a small shop the legend brunswick dock eating house and noted with satisfaction a feather of smoke curling from one of the chimneys belonging to the building hardly stopping to think i slipped down a rope and ran across the road knocking boldly at the door a ruddy-faced little girl about my own age opened it and said hesitatingly what do you want trying to look big i said i'm a sailor belonging to that ship there and i want to come in and lodge here till i'm paid off with a doubtful glance at my beggarly outfit she said i'll go and call auntie and ran off upstairs there was a glorious fire roaring in a great open fireplace at the end of the low flagged room so without waiting permission i entered and seated myself on a bench close to the bright blaze in a few minutes a sharp business-like woman came down in response to her keen questions i told my story carefully avoiding any reference to my passenger status on board apparently she was satisfied for in a very short time i was supplied with such a breakfast as had long haunted my hungry dreams rashers of toasted bacon 
boiled eggs new bread and butter fragrant coffee it was just heavenly all my miseries were forgotten in present joys and i ate and ate until suddenly looking up i saw the little girl gazing at me with awe no wonder she was astonished the way i was demolishing the food was a sight to see but meeting my eye she blushed crimson and gabbled something in a strange tongue which i afterwards learned was welsh to her aunt who stood also looking at me with a good-humoured smile on her face being warmed and fed two satisfactory experiences to which i had been long a stranger i was in no hurry to leave such comfortable quarters for the bleak outer world but during the morning i ran over to the ship and finding there the cook i learned that she was to be paid off the next day i determined to present myself with the rest at the shipping office although my hopes of getting any money were very faint still i knew enough of the world to be certain that without money i should not be allowed to remain at my present lodgings so at the appointed hour i marched up to the sailor's home meeting with a cordial welcome from my shipmates especially the little frenchman better still as each of them received their money they very kindly gave me a little the total amount thus contributed being twenty-two shillings then came my turn to appear at the pay-table my heart beat fast with apprehension as i faced captain jones my head only just appearing above the counter his words were gruff and his manner unkind but i believe he was moved with pity for my forlorn position for he actually gave me two pounds ten shillings pay at the rate of one pound a month i was so glad that i knew not what to say but i hastily retreated lest he should change his mind and take the money away again as fast as my legs would carry me i ran back to the boarding-house to exhibit my wealth to the landlady i had never had so much money of my own before and was proportionately elated the thought of how much i needed it never entering my head the landlady immediately suggested that i should treat her and her crony from next door who was in conversation with her at which proposition i felt quite a man and inquired loftily what the ladies would take a little drop of donovan's appeared to be the favourite liquor a totally unknown beverage to me but i should have agreed had it been champagne the little niece was dispatched for it as well as a couple of bottles of ginger beer for us who were too young and wise to thirst for donovan's which i knew as soon as it arrived to be rum to do my landlady justice she interested herself in getting me some decent clothing and promised to keep me on what remained of my money until i got another ship or some employment ashore but getting a ship i found was an impossible task my diminutive size and weakly appearance obtained for me only derision when i ventured to ask for a berth on what i considered likely-looking craft and it soon appeared hopeless to look in that direction any more help came from an unexpected quarter next door to my lodging-place was the workshop of a figurehead carver who was a young energetic man of great skill and very intimate with my landlady he was kind enough to employ me in his business where i soon became useful in sharpening tools and roughing out work for him and his brother to finish he paid me sufficient for my board and lodging which considering that he was teaching me his trade was very generous here i was quite happy for my new master was kindness itself and i believe i was really quick to profit by all i was taught so as to be worth my pay but my evil genius pursued me still his brother became jealous of the attentions i received and after i had been with him a couple of months quarrels between them on my account were of almost daily occurrence this unsatisfactory state of things culminated in my getting knocked senseless one morning by my enemy during his brother's absence at a job when mr r returned he was alarmed at my appearance for i had an ugly cut on the head which made me look quite ghastly a tremendous row followed the upshot of which was that mr r sorrowfully informed me that he was obliged to send me away before serious harm was done he advised me to return to london where i was better known and gave me ten shillings to pay my fare thither i took his advice forthwith finding no difficulty in getting a half-ticket to euston where i arrived with two shillings and sixpence in my pocket 
the well-known streets looked strange to me after my long absence in fact i felt more in the way than ever i knew nobody that could or would shelter me and i had got out of the way of street life husbanding my scanty store of coppers as well as i could i haunted thames street in the hope that i might pick up a coaster at the king's head where in those days skippers of small craft used to get most of their crews there is a cook-shop with a tank of pea-soup in the window where for a penny i could always get a bellyful of the thick comforting stuff the best value for money in the grub line that i knew of and i was no bad judge it uh, the tank used to be cleaned out every three days and a fresh jorum of soup made on the first day it was comparatively thin on the second being filled up without removing the solid matter settled at the bottom it was better but on the third day you could almost cut it a spoon would stand upright in it and anxious to clear it out they gave bigger pennies worth i often used to go without on the second day so that i could have two separate portions on the third after which i felt as bloated as an alderman after a civic feast but the pence failed and i picked up very few more so that though i slept in any hole or corner i could find to avoid the expense of lodgings the time soon came when i was face to face with starvation again then a bright idea occurred to me so obvious that i wondered why it hadn't struck me before i had my discharge from the sea gem i would seek a kindly boarding-master and ask him to keep me till i got a ship paying himself out of my advance i knew better than to go to the so-called sailor's home they don't take in hard-up seamen there it is only a home for those who can pay down for their accommodation with my fortunate idea burning in my mind i hastened down the west india dock road attacking the first house i saw with boarding-house for seamen painted up over it the operator an old boatswain grumbled at my request a good deal but he took me in god bless him more than that he got me a ship three days after by means of his influence that way and once again i was freed from the misery of being masterless the vessel in which i was to sail was a splendid bark reminding me strongly of the luckless discoverer and about the same size i shall call her the bonanza for reasons of my own though that was not her name she was bound to a port in jamaica with a general cargo for new owners and with a new captain and officers when we came up to sign on at green's home i found to my delight that i was to have twenty shillings a month like all the rest i received a month's advance out of which my boarding-master paid himself and provided me with a donkey's breakfast straw bed hook pot pannikin and plate a knife and a suit of oilskins so he didn't rob me to any great extent he also gave me a few odds and ends of clothing which had been left by boarders out of which being a fair hand with my needle i managed to botch up enough garments to change i bade him good-bye with hearty feelings of gratitude which he fully deserved and took my departure on board my ship End of chapter eight chapter nine of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine bound for jamaica all hands had been ordered on board in the afternoon the tide surfing about five p m but from some unexplained cause we did not sail at the time appointed this delay led to complications for although the crew had for a wonder come on board fairly sober they all rejoiced at the opportunity afforded them of a last carouse by some mysterious means some money was obtained all hands departed for the purlieu of shadwell with the result that at ten o'clock the officers were scouring the slums hunting for them it was a hopeless task as the event proved for by midnight only two had been found and they were both helplessly drunk they were dragged on board like bundles of rags and hoisted into their bunks where they remained in peace that tide being lost the officers had a few hours rest turning out again about four a m to renew the search meanwhile the vessel was shifted into the shadwell basin ready to start the moment her crew were on board 
the morning broke cheerlessly enough with a light fall of snow gradually increasing to a blinding mist of white through which occasionally a little party came dragging some oblivious mariner who had spent his respite in filling himself with whatever fire-water he could obtain at last weary of waiting the skipper determined to go on although he was still two men short accordingly the warps were cast off the tug backed in and took hold of us and away we went down the river through the thick veil of snow that made the mud pilot's job both difficult and dangerous there was another boy besides me a burly fellow of sixteen who very soon made it clear to me that i was not going to spend a pleasant time with him he had come from the war sprite and knew nothing of the ways of merchant ships which gave me a little advantage over him in one way but he was well provided with plenty of warm clothing by the bounty of the marine society while i was so thinly clad that the piercing cold benumbed all my faculties and i crawled about like a snail making a very bad impression upon the officers our arrival at gravesend came as a blessed relief for there was a good hot meal of fresh food ready as soon as the anchor was down and as all the seamen were in a deep drunken slumber bill my colleague and myself had a mighty feed all to ourselves after which we turned in and slept unmolested till supper time the skipper had gone ashore to get a couple of men in place of the defaulters and did not return till after dark he brought two sober seamen with him who looked as though they had been outward bound for a very long time their cheeks were quite hollow with hunger and they had hardly more clothing than they stood in yet they were both able men proving indeed the best seamen on board after they had eaten a good meal they were set to keep anchor watch turn about until at midnight all hands were called to man the windlass i wish it was possible to give my readers an idea of the misery involved in this operation under such conditions first of all the officers were obliged to drag the sodden sleepers from their lairs then to shake if possible some gleam of sense into them some faint idea of what was required of them after nearly an hour's struggle the miserable men were at last mustered on the forecastle head at the windless levers where exposed to the full fury of the bitter wind they cowered more like sheep than men their feelings as the drink died out of them and the cold searched their very vitals must have been horrible occasionally one of them would slip down gently from the forecastle and disappear only to be hunted up again by the vigorous boatswain who kept a watchful eye upon any would-be skulkers more by dint of the boatswain's energy i believe than any vitality in the limp crew the anchor was at last lifted the hawser passed to the hovering tug and away we glided ghost-like downstream ben the big boy and myself were pretty well fagged out with hauling back the big links of cable and stowing them in neat fakes abaft the windlass but the boatswain believed in keeping boys on the go so we got no time to think about being tired luckily for us the wind was dead on end so that it was useless making sail all hands were kept busily employed clearing up the decks getting the running gear into its proper places and generally preparing the ship for independent travelling by daylight the weather grew better the wind veered to the eastward a little and the fore and aft sails were set so we drew slowly round to the north foreland where the tug slipped our hawser all sail was set and we were fairly started on our voyage as i got a little warmth into my stiffened limbs i won back some of the good opinion i had forfeited by my clumsy spiritless movements of the previous day being sent aloft to loose some of the square sails i was cheered by hearing the elderly mate remark quietly that's a smart little boy and i must confess i was not displeased to note that ben only succeeded in drawing down maledictions on his head for his clumsiness and general inability to do what was required of him there was a vengeful gleam in his eye as he saw how inferior he was in smartness to myself 
which boded no good to me and from the first day out he never lost an opportunity of doing me an ill turn the captain was a fine manly specimen of a seaman with glowing red hair and beard and a voice of thunder fiery tempered yet easily pacified he was also one of the most energetic of men and i never saw a skipper better liked by his crew the mate was a middle-aged man at least ten years the captain's senior rather slow and sedate but a thorough seaman and navigator the bosun who was acting second mate was an old shipmate of the skipper's and quite his equal in energy he was one of the fast decaying type of seamen of black wall rigor to whom every detail of sailorizing was as familiar as eating his breakfast besides this he was a born leader of men who would enforce his will regardless of consequences no man durst give him slack lip on pain of being instantly knocked endways a feat of which by reason of his size and strength he was fully capable as a result we were a well-disciplined crowd from whom no growling was heard whatever the work imposed there were eight a b s out of whom only three were foreigners but not one of them calls for any special description from me they all had the bad old idea that boys were born slaves who must do all the dirty work on deck and when below be content with their leavings wait upon them hand and foot and take uncomplainingly all the ill-treatment it was their prerogative to bestow being at the bottom of the scale i had a wretched life for i was no match for ben who unfailingly passed on his share of blows to me so that i was seldom without some visible marks of ill usage but the food was certainly above the average the skipper had the provisioning of the ship and being a just man he did not do as so many would have done under the same circumstances starve the men to fatten his own pocket what with the decent meals and the masterfulness of the boatswain she was a contented ship and more work was done in a day on board than i have ever seen before or since as usual on this passage fine weather prevailed the wind being so steady that for days together we never touched a brace this was taken advantage of by the skipper to practically refit the ship all hands being kept at work all day long splicing turning in blocks serving shrouds fitting new running gear and doing riggers work generally at night they all slept with the exception of the helmsman the lookout man the officer of the watch and a boy who had to keep near the officer to carry his commands to the sleepers should the need arise really i was kept so constantly at work that for all i saw of the sea and its marvels i might as well have been ashore except at night and then i was always half asleep through getting so little legitimate opportunity for rest twenty-eight days flew rapidly past without a single incident worth noting the same blue sky overhead and steady breeze astern until one morning the beautiful shores of jamaica loomed up ahead a few hours later we sailed in between the points of a sheltering coral reef to an anchorage in the pretty little harbour of falmouth pompously announcing our arrival by the firing of a four-pounder gun as the anchor was dropped while we were furling sails and clearing up the decks visitors were arriving from the four vessels in harbour as well as from the shore so that by the time work was over our decks were thronged the skipper seemed a prime favourite here judging by the number of people who came to see him and congratulate him upon his new command the largest vessel that had yet entered the little port there were high times forward as well as aft for canoe loads of good things were brought and all hands invested recklessly on credit forgetting that as yet they had no money owing to them by the ship not only eatables but sundry bottles of new rum made their appearance which potent fluid soon made things exceedingly lively in the forecastle matters culminated of course in a free fight which so alarmed me that i crept into a corner under the heel of the bowsprit out of the way of the revellers there i went to sleep so soundly that it was morning when i again emerged at the hoarse cry of the boatswain calling us to turn to 
the darkies here were even merrier than my old friends of demerara such a jovial musical lot i never saw living from hand to mouth on the coarsest food and with the oddest assortment of rags for clothing possible to be imagined they really seemed to be perfectly happy the feeblest joke was sufficient to send them into convulsions of laughter and the gift of an old shirt or pair of pants would keep them on the broad grin for a couple of days my life was so consistently miserable from harsh treatment that i continually envied them their careless existence wondering all the time how they managed to be so jolly under what i often saw to be painful circumstances to crown my misfortunes i fell ill after suffering for two or three days i was sent ashore to hospital then i was thankful for what i had thought the climax of my misery for in the hospital i was allowed to do pretty well as i liked there was no discipline no rule of any kind the doctor as we called him i think he must have been the dispenser was a mulatto or quadroon with a comical notion of his vast importance but a kindly young fellow enough sometimes i had medicine but only by accident i believe at any rate i soon got better and rambled about the great building or played on the beach outside with the darky boys of about my own age forgetting that such a place as the bonanza forecastle existed at last i began to hope that the captain had forgotten my existence having some dim idea i suppose that i might be allowed to spend an indefinite time in this pleasant way but i was to be rudely undeceived one day when i was presiding with much importance over a game at cricket much i knew about it with twenty or thirty youngsters of almost as many shades of colour around me i suddenly heard my captain calling me with an angry note in his voice that boded me no good he had come up from the town to inquire about me and had caught me unaware you lazy young soldier he cried this is how sick you are is it i'll give you a lesson for this get down to the boat the thought of returning to the ship was so terrible to me that i actually dared to ask him to let me go to discharge me in a voice that shook with fear and anxiety i told him how i had been treated and implored him not to take me back with him i believe he was half melted but his anger at what he thought was my skulking got the better of him serve you very well right he said i'll give you a rope ending myself when i've got time now be off with you straight down to the boat with that he strode on to the hospital while i feeling as if i was going to the scaffold trudged through the sand down to the landing place in about an hour he returned but said no word more to me as the boat danced over the wavelets back to that hateful prison it was knock-off time and i busied myself in sweeping up decks with all the alacrity i could muster until i was free to fetch my many masters their tea from the galley they hailed me with many sarcastic queries after my health and the noble time they supposed i had enjoyed ashore at their expense commiserating ben exceedingly for having been obliged to do my work as they said while i had been loafing ashore happily i got over the evening without anything worse than hard words being thrown at me some grievance or another had excited the anger of a big irishman and he soon monopolized all attention by a recital of his wrongs it appeared that the boatswain had got a down on him in his opinion but if the boatswain thought that he mike was going to be played with that was just where he was all adrift he uh, mike was a blank finian so he was and he'd just swim in blood before he was put down by any blank dock walloper that ever mooched around blackwall so he would in the fervour of his harangue he omitted to notice how he had raised his voice but he was presently reminded of it by the voice of the vosen at the forecastle door calling mike i want you a minute there was complete silence in a moment which reigned until the boatswain repeated his words with quiet addition you don't want me to fetch you out i suppose then mike protested feebly that it was his watch below that he was having his supper that various reasons in fact prevented him from emerging like a tiger the boatswain leapt into the crowded space 
there was a medley of arms heads and legs a hubbub of inarticulate noises but out of it all the bosun and mike emerged on deck how they got there i don't believe anyone knew i heard the bosun imploring mike to stand up to him like a man and mike piteously reminding him that he was by no means his match that he was twenty years older which was nearly true very well then said the boss not so much of your slack next time if you're an old man behave like one and don't open your mouth so wide in case anybody jumps down your throat there was peace after that not even a word was said to me when i ventured to crawl into the raffle of rags which was my bunk at daylight next morning all hands were called to get under way in the cabin the skipper had been entertaining a large party of friends who had been keeping up an extensive carouse all night uproariously they departed their several ways as we toiled at the windlass while boats from all the other vessels in port came and fastened on to us to assist us out from between the reefs such aid was absolutely necessary unless the miserably slow method of warping out by a kedge anchor was resorted to for in these west indian ports there is invariably during the night a gentle air from the land which soon after daybreak dies away to a complete calm lasting perhaps an hour and succeeded by the invigorating doctor or sea breeze this latter soon gathers strength and blows more or less forcibly all day long in consequence of this it becomes imperative to gain an offing before the doctor begins in order that the vessel may be able to fetch off the land in the teeth of an increasing breeze having assisted us to get about two miles out the boats cast off from us and with many hearty farewells returned to port taking with them our pilot a stark calm succeeded as usual during which all hands lounged about and whistled for a breeze until some of the keener observers noticed that the strong undertow was sweeping us rapidly towards a long spit of sand that stretched seaward about three miles to the northward of us presently the mate's anxiety constrained him to approach the captain who with flushed face and abstracted air was pacing the poop and suggest that the anchors might be prepared for letting go strange to say the skipper received this hint with a bad grace answering his officer so abruptly and angrily that his words were distinctly audible all over the ship the mate whose age and experience apart from his other undeniably good qualities entitled him to very different treatment bowed and retired evidently much hurt a short period of silence followed while the vessel her sails hanging as if carved in stone and her hull motionless as if in dry dock was being carried along over the now visible coral bottom at the rate of nearly four knots an hour at last the boatswain unable to contain himself strode up to the captain and said boldly captain if you don't anchor this ship we'll be ashore in another ten minutes get off my poop you impudent rascal how dare you come and speak to me like that for two pins i'll put you in irons do you think i don't know my duty i never heard such cheek in my life and he stamped with fury but the boatswain simply said well don't you say you wasn't warned that's all and turning on his heel left the angry unreasonable man to himself by this time all hands were fully possessed of the idea that only a miracle could save the ship for the reef seemed to be actually touching the keel through the clear water which was carrying us so swiftly over it and the idea of the vessel's loss filled me with unholy joy no one could realize how terribly i dreaded the homeward passage and now that deliverance seemed so near i could hardly restrain my feelings slinking into the empty forecastle i waited breathlessly for the crash i felt sure was imminent it came a long grinding sensation like a boat grounding on a pebbly beach magnified a thousand times almost delirious i danced about the place in the middle of which unpardonable exercise i was discovered by the boatswain outraged beyond speech he dealt me one savage kick which put all dancing out of my power for many a day and for the present stretched me motionless on the deck not however to lie there long for hearing my name shouted outside 
i dragged myself up mustering all my energy and hobbled off to obey the call before some worse thing should befall me i found all hands toiling like ants getting out anchors and hawsers and doing all that experience could suggest to free the vessel from the position of danger into which she had been brought so recklessly but the calm was over the sea breeze had commenced and was increasing so fast that already the hitherto placid sea was beginning to foam breakers too born of the jagged reef so close to the surface were rolling in steadily although as yet they were of puny height and weight being at so short a distance from the port we had left our plight was plainly visible to those on shore consequently in a couple of hours every boat of sufficient size in the place was alongside scores of willing hands plied every means by which good might be done but the steady increase in wind and sea driving directly shoreward mocked all efforts at heaving the ship off there were no steam vessels either at falmouth or the adjacent ports so that when every purchase that could be got upon the anchors and cables laid out astern was brought to a standstill that branch of the work was perforce abandoned then the cargo was attacked at all three hatches everybody working as if their very lives depended upon their labors the negroes especially seemed to regard the whole affair as a gigantic spree for without abating one jot of their labors they yelled sang danced about and behaved generally like a pack of schoolboys just let loose without any supervision as the day wore on the wind increased to a strong gale and the rollers attained so formidable a height that at times they lifted the vessel bodily from her jagged bed of rock letting her fall again with a crash that threatened to shake all her stout timbers apart after each of these blows she seemed to slide seawards a little but all her buoyancy was gone the stern went down at an increasing angle and the water rose in the hold so freely that it was evident that there were some serious gaps in the hull still the work went on droger after droger left us filled with salvage while others crowded as near as they dared to receive the bags cases and bundles that were constantly being hurled overside by nightfall all our own crew were worn out and transferred to one of the small craft which clung to our side receiving the salved cargo each man secured what he could of his poor belongings but i being unable in the scramble and confusion to get hold of the few rags composing my stock of clothing contented myself with carrying off an old wide-awake hat containing five blind kittens the anxious mother kept me close company much to the amusement of the toiling darkies all through the night the wind maintained a most unusual force and hour by hour the work of salvage became increasingly difficult every package had to be dived for into the blackness of the hold which was quite full of water up to the hatch combings great torches of tarred rope lashed to conspicuous points roared and flared in the gale by their uncertain glare the black toilers darted hither and thither with astounding energy and a deafening incessant tumult of wild song every one was mother naked and their ebony skins shone like those of a school of gambling porpoises at each tremendous lift and heave of the doomed vessel all hands would make a frantic rush to the side leaping with blood-curdling yells into the waiting drovers but the instant it was seen that she yet survived the shock back they all came and attacked the cargo with renewed vigour at last a bigger breaker than ever came along rearing its oary crest against the paling sky reaching the vessel it enwrapped her in masses of shining foam lifting her at the same time with such power that for half a minute she seemed all afloat as it receded the ill-used hulk as if loath to leave its embrace slid along the reef with a rending crash nor stopped until all that remained visible of her was the jibboom pointing upward to the sky like a warning beacon in the whirl of weltering foam left by her sudden exit the drogers danced like mad things all having been cut adrift as the yelling crowd sprang from the sinking ship 
as nothing more could possibly be done for the present the little fleet made sail and stood in towards the town with their spoil in every conceivable and inconceivable position the utterly wearied negroes lay about asleep regardless of the flying spray or such minor inconveniences as being trampled upon by the crews i found a snug corner out of everybody's way and there coupling my cats i too fell into sweet oblivion when i awoke the vessel was just taking the beach in front of the town the sun was only just rising but all the population of falmouth appeared to be there and intensely solicitous for our welfare we were immediately taken to the hotel only a few hundred yards away and all manner of creature comforts pressed upon us with kindly persistence as if we had been adrift for a month suddenly i realized that i was quite a centre of attraction the fact of my having rescued the kittens appearing to appeal to all the visitors in a way that i should hardly have believed possible but indeed our reception generally was so kind that we were all in danger of being spoiled within the memory of the oldest inhabitant no wreck of such importance had occurred near the port and consequently i suppose we reaped the benefit of long suppressed benevolence End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of The Log of a Sea Waif by Frank T. Bullen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: Adventures of a Shipwrecked Crew. The hotel to which we had been brought upon our arrival was, although the only one in the place, far too small to stand the strain of such an influx of visitors as we were, as far as sleeping accommodation went therefore arrangements were made for our lodgment in an empty house in town while for all meals we were to return to the hotel to this sheltering place we were escorted by a delighted band of darkies who insisted upon carrying such traps as we possessed and also worked like bees to sweep and cleanse the house such bedding as we had was spread upon the floor in a big front room and in oriental fashion with the sailor's ready adaptability to circumstances we made ourselves comfortable we had plenty of company for the whole colored population made holiday and visited us few came empty-handed the majority bringing such gifts as they thought would please us mostly fruit tobacco and rum there was such abundance of the latter that by dinner-time there was a universal debauch from which i gladly escaped making my way down to the beach i found the work of salvage in full swing for the hull of the ship had broken apart so much that the floatable cargo was coming ashore in great quantities puncheons of rum bundles of walking sticks cakes of beeswax and innumerable coconuts were heaped in scattered piles upon the beach each of which was guarded by some one whose allies were either scouring the shores or paddling furiously after some piece of flotsam apparently worth pursuit everywhere i found friends such a godsend as this had not fallen to the lot of the dusky falmouthians before and they were willing to recognize even the humblest member of the crew as in some sense a benefactor when i got tired of roaming about the beach i sought the hotel for something more satisfying than fruit and was received by the host's buxom daughter marian with great delight she had taken charge of my hat full of kittens and showed me with manifest pride how comfortable the old cat and her blind progeny had been made ungrateful puss would hardly recognize me her changed circumstances had made her forget old but humble friends noticing that i limped considerably marian inquired anxiously whether i'd cut my foot which made me smile since not having worn boots for months my natural soles were almost as hard as tanned leather but i admitted that there was something hurting me a great deal upon which she peremptorily ordered me to sit down while she had a look a short search resulted in her finding the place which she proceeded to investigate with a needle and presently drew therefrom a bag about as large as a marrow-fat pea which she opened and showed me was full of tiny eggs you had dem jagos mighty bad child she said but i gwent her put stop to em right now with that she went and fetched a tub of warm water 
after bathing my feet thoroughly she searched most carefully for more of these pests finding two other nests full like the first of eggs but which had caused me only a slight itching sensation having removed all she could see she made a vile compound of tobacco ash and kerosene which she rubbed into the wounds causing me exquisite pain it took all my fortitude to keep from screaming and i was unable to prevent a few big tears dropping with many strange words of endearment she assured me of her sympathy but declared this heroic treatment to be the only way of effecting a radical cure i have no doubt that she firmly believed in her treatment and i must admit that in the end it was certainly effectual but it was so harsh that i was quite crippled for over a week during this miserable time i was a close prisoner in our empty house being generally alone during the day while through most of the night the drunken antics of my shipmates kept me in constant terror nevertheless there was some slight consolation for by some means it had got about that i could sing and i was sent for by the officers of the garrison to warble some of my simple ditties for their amusement as i was unable to walk the messengers made a rude litter upon which they carried me to the hotel where i was propped up in an armchair while i sang the generosity of the officers provided me with plenty of money unfortunately of no service to me since i dared not refuse the constant demands of my shipmates who of course had none of their own i made two or three friends among the better class people in the town who gave me quite a respectable bag of half-worn clothes and also promised their aid in other directions at last after the lapse of three weeks during which time a perfunctory sort of inquiry into the loss of the vessel was held and the captain acquitted of all blame it was decided to send all the crew round to kingston whence we might get shipped home a small schooner was chartered for this purpose as no steamers ran round the island and after considerable delay provisions for three days were put on board and we set sail doubtless much to the relief of those worthies who had been obliged to feed such a hungry horde as we were but to our great disgust we found at the first meal-time that in addition to the stock of food being disgracefully small it consisted solely of ship biscuit yams and salt beef of the worst sort if the kind providers of this outfit could have been affected by the maledictions of our party they certainly would not have survived the first day of our voyage after that the subject dropped from very monotony calms and light airs prevailed and all faces began to lengthen when on the evening of the third day the cook announced that the last of the supply of food was before us for supper while our passage was only beginning luckily a young shark was caught making us a meagre breakfast then hunger stared us in the face we were at least fifteen miles off the land with a dead calm and nothing but water left to supply the needs of fourteen hungry men no fish came to our hooks no vessels came near us and as there was nothing whatever to occupy the men's minds the subject of food supply was soon discussed threadbare then as often happens among crews similarly situated the possibility of there being a jonah among us was mooted and called forth an amazing variety of opinions and reminiscences unhappily for me the boatswain was indiscreet enough to let out the story of my behaviour at the time of the vessel striking on the reef he told it laughingly referring with a good deal of satisfaction to the swinging kick he had dealt me the bruise from which had not even then disappeared but the effect of his statement upon those ignorant and frightened men was most strange and significant they accepted it without question as positive proof first that all their misfortunes were due to the presence of a jonah among them and secondly that i was that jonah it may be found difficult of belief that among the crews of a london ship in the year eighteen seventy one such a thing should have been possible but i solemnly declare it to be true that they at once decided that unless i were cast overboard they would never reach kingston i was immediately seized by them and commanded to say my prayers quickly as i had only a few minutes to live 
i looked at those cruel brutish faces and saw no gleam of pity i cried for mercy in incoherent terms while they only scowled with trembling lips and scarcely beating heart i tried to do as they told me say my prayers but my senses were fast leaving me and i do not really know what i did say then one of them tied my hands behind my back with a bit of fishing line and this act first seemed to awaken the three negroes who were the crew of the schooner to the fact that murder was intended it almost drove them crazy with fear and horror regardless of the odds against them they rushed to my rescue only to be beaten back with the assurance that little would make my tormentors serve them the same the bitterness of death was almost past when to my unbounded amazement and renewing all my hopes of life help came from the most unexpected quarter the boatswain who i do not think had realized himself how far in earnest they were until then suddenly bestirred himself making one stride across the deck to where i lay hardly conscious oh how godlike i thought him the scene returns to me across the chasm of years as vividly as a photograph his manly figure erect before my poor little shrinking body and the sweep of his strong right arm as he drove those bloodthirsty pagans back will never fade from my mind that's enough now he said you blank idiots did you think i was going to let you drown the kid so help me if i thought you really meant it damn if i wouldn't drown two or three of you myself you yelping cowardly scum for a short minute or so they faced him their eyes glaring with the lust of superstitious cruelty and then it should be remembered that there were ten of them they slank away muttering blasphemies between their clenched teeth with a bitter laugh of derision he stooped and cut my hands adrift from the lashing and then resumed his pipe as if nothing extraordinary had happened it hardly needs saying that i cowered close to his side nor did i once get out of arm's length of him during the remainder of that passage happily for us a breeze sprang up sending the schooner bustling along at a good rate into the harbour of savannah la mar where we arrived late that evening by some means or other which i don't understand considering our penniless condition a good supply of yams salt fish and water was obtained and we set sail again at about ten p m by the light of the incandescent moon our troubles were at an end for the time the wind holding strong and fair so that in less than forty-eight hours we were running in swiftly past port royal and up to the wharves at kingston it probably had never occurred to any one of us to doubt that when we arrived there it would be all plain sailing for us as shipwrecked seamen and in a british port we naturally supposed that all we needed to do was to march in a body to the sailor's home show our credentials and be received with the warmest of welcomes and the rest of our stay until ships were found for us to go home again in would of course be one delightful round of eating drinking and sleeping varied by such amusements as the place afforded accordingly every man shouldered his belongings and off we marched guided by friendly darkies to the sailors home which we entered with the air of proprietors it was a fine large building with a double row of verandas and an air of coolness and comfort extremely grateful to us after our miserable trip in the schooner we were received with great courtesy and shown to the dormitory which with its rows of clean beds and white mosquito curtains looked like fairyland we were told that breakfast would be ready in a few minutes so all hands had a good wash hastened down grubwards at the first stroke of the welcome bell there appeared to be scarcely any other boarders at any rate there were none visible then coffee and bread were brought and then a white man came who introduced himself as the superintendent he called our attention to the fact that there were three tariffs here according to the kind of food desired and wished to know which of them we would choose the boatswain replied that as we were the guests of our country we might as well have the best and added that as we were somewhat sharp set the sooner we got it the happier we should be oh said the official if that's the case i'm afraid i can't take you in i've had no orders and our rule here is payment in advance 
blank amazement overspread every face and half a dozen voices volubly attempted to explain the situation but to all remarks remonstrances and objurgations the superintendent was adamant he had no doubt it was all true enough but he had no instructions on our behalf and until he had we could either pay or go when asked who we ought to apply to he was blandly ignorant but it was increasingly evident that he wanted us gone very badly well there was no help for it and so breakfastless and dispirited we started off again to the town intending to go to the shipping office as the only place we could think of in a foreign port we should of course have gone to the consul at once but here under our own flag no one knew what to do our escort of negroes grew quite imposing as we trudged along and the news of our reception passed from mouth to mouth floods of advice were poured upon us by our sable friends and offers of hospitality also without limit indeed had any of our crowd been orators there seemed to be all the materials necessary for a very decent riot but peaceably enough we reached the shipping office where we asked humbly if we might see his high mightiness the shipping master after keeping us waiting for nearly an hour this gentleman came out and in bullying tones demanded our business our spokesman the boatswain laid our hard case before him in a most respectful manner but before he had finished his story the shipping master cut him short roughly telling him that we had no business to come there whining and that he had nothing to do with us and with that he ordered us out of the office utterly amazed and dispirited at this treatment we retired upon reaching the street we were surrounded at once by the friendly darkies who made good their previous promises by carrying all hands off to breakfast in their several huts talking and gesticulating violently all the time fortunately i remember that i had a letter of introduction to a gentleman in the town so refusing all offers of hospitality i hurried off to present it i was not very cordially received but a note to the superintendent of the sailors home was at once given me which procured me instant admission to that institution with a right to the best entertainment they could give meanwhile the crew had formulated a plan of campaign romantic enough but promising well it should be remembered that port royal at the entrance to kingston harbour is or was one of our most important colonial naval stations a huge old line of battleship called the abuker was then the guard ship and lay moored opposite the dockyard at port royal several miles from kingston a deputation of two one of which was the boatswain determined to board the guard ship and lay the case before the commodore feeling like all british seamen abroad that although not to be lightly approached the captain of a british man-of-war could always be depended upon to see justice done to any sailor however humble accordingly they availed themselves of a friendly fisherman's canoe and immediately set out on their long paddle down the bay to port royal at the same time the elderly irishman before spoken of volunteered to tramp out to spanish town the residence of the governor of jamaica a distance of about ten miles as nearly as i can remember he said he was well used to the road having tramped between nearly every seaport in england and so while the majority of the crew lay around in the shade discussing the situation over and over again with a deeply interested crowd of darkies male and female the messenger fared forth the port royal deputation reached their goal first and climbing up the steep side of the great guard ship saluted and asked to see the commodore they were promptly conducted aft before this officer who listened patiently to their yarn and did not interrupt them in its recital when they ceased speaking he said is that all my men yes your honor then go forward and get some food at once and when you've done so the second lieutenant will return with you you shall be cared for good morning with a salute they retreated and not being hungry received a tot of grog instead then to their astonishment and delight they saw a natty little steam launch alongside into which they were invited to descend a smart young lieutenant in full uniform joined them the white-clad crew jumped in and away they went back to kingston 
long before they arrived at the landing place the anxious watchers had descried them and when they touched land there was quite an excited crowd ready to welcome them straight to the shipping office went the lieutenant and at his brief request the shipping master was immediately forthcoming without wasting a word the lieutenant came to the point demanding to know whether his commanding officer had been rightly informed by these men of the state of their case as the facts were undeniable there was little reply sternly scornfully the young officer reminded the discomfited official of his obvious duty to british seamen in distress with an expression of wonder at its being necessary for him to do so you will be good enough to see all these men's wants immediately attended to and a passage home found for them at the earliest possible opportunity the commodore trusts he will hear no more complaints of a like nature then turning on his heel the lieutenant bade our delighted fellows good day returning to his launch amid the cheers of the darkies a clerk was at once sent with the men to the home with instructions to the superintendent and the trouble was over not so those of the unfortunate shipping master who must have been heartily sorry for his foolish behaviour for late in the afternoon our other messenger returned in state from spanish town in one of the governor's carriages accompanied by a secretary who bore a message from the governor that made the shipping master quake he could only return an abject apology with an assurance that the shipwrecked crew were now well cared for and that nothing on his part should be lacking for their comfort but though we heard no more of the affair i doubt very much whether the shipping master did from the stir the event made in kingston i am inclined to think it was a long time before he was permitted to forget it for about a fortnight i had a rattling good time in kingston confident in the assurance that i should not be forgotten whenever a chance presented itself of getting away i cast all care to the winds and set about enjoying myself all i knew how moonlight fishing excursions in ramshackle canoes to sheltered coves around the great harbour long rambles in the wonderful brakes and jungles with darkies that though men in years were children in their fresh enjoyment of everything singing parties along the beautiful beaches in the silky evenings and all with never a thought of to-morrow oh it was all heavenly i scarcely saw anything of my shipmates i didn't want to my new associates although black were full of kindliness and as pleased with me as i was with them what wonder that i avoided as far as i could any intercourse with men whose presence only reminded me of miserable days better forgotten out of the many incidents that are mellowed by time into a haze of half-recollection one grotesque affair stands out sharply and even now makes me quiver with laughter as its vivid details reappear a favourite pastime with the elite of the coloured population was to gather in large numbers dressed in all their finery upon an old disused pier whose crazy piles and beams actually swayed with a stronger breeze than usual upon this ancient structure when the day's work was over the young men and women would frisk or loll about according to their humour but their chief amusement was the singing of chanties camp meeting hymns and in fact anything with a rousing chorus in which all hands could join on the night in question song had succeeded song until somebody sent an electric thrill through the whole gathering by starting the negro's great anthem of freedom marching through georgia you could hear the pulses of that great crowd beat while they waited breathlessly for the last word of the sonorous verse and then in one tremendous burst of melody every one lifted up heart and voice while from far away fishermen on the bay and labourers on the hills the inspiring chorus rolled on as verse succeeded verse the enthusiasm rose to fever heat every one sprang to their feet waving their arms and stamping in unison until the crazy structure upon which they stood trembled to its ancient foundations it was a wonderful sight having its ludicrous side doubtless but the high seriousness and irrepressible energy of the actors prevented all desire to laugh 
suddenly in the height of the chorus there was a rending crash and the entire fabric collapsed in one chaotic heap of disjointed timbers and shrieking humanity into the placid waters beneath no one was hurt for the tide was high and every darkey swam like a fish but the scene of mad merriment on the beach as one draggled figure after another emerged from the wreckage was indescribable not until long after midnight did the peals of laughter entirely cease for they rose again and again in all quarters of the town as the participants rehearsed the scene to those who had not been fortunate enough to witness it i had begun to feel as if i had always lived there and the thought of leaving had quite disappeared from my mind when one day i received a note from the gentleman to whom i had brought the letter of introduction telling me to go on board a large steamer which had arrived at kingston that morning as he had seen the captain and made arrangements for me to be allowed to work my passage home End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of *The Log of a Sea Waif* by Frank T. Bullen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: An Eventful Passage Home. Now that the time of my departure drew near, the same old feeling of reluctance to leave a place to which I had become accustomed came upon me with its usual force possibly because i was never very long in one place i have always except in one instance felt loath to begin wandering again and even now my mind often turns regretfully to the many ports i have visited and quite a painful longing seizes me to see them all again therefore i am afraid i did not feel nearly as grateful to my friend as i ought to have done but fully realizing how dangerous it was for me not to take advantage of this offer i made myself as presentable as i could and hurried on board the captain a big burly gentleman in a smart uniform received me with a sharp glance and dismissed me at once with a curt all right go and tell the chief steward i've sent you to him i thanked him and left the presence very much in awe of the gorgeous surroundings and great size of everything so different to all my previous experience of shipboard she was a fairly large steamship for those days i suppose of nearly three thousand tons but to me she was vast beyond conception when i entered the saloon i felt utterly crushed beneath the splendor of the place oh how small and shabby it would look now beside the floating palaces of to-day and i hardly dared to tread upon the thick carpet which was laid the vessel being in harbour when i found the chief steward he cross-examined me pretty sharply as to my qualifications etc but being short-handed he was glad of even such help as i could give and promptly set me to work now for the first time i became acquainted with the toilsome routine of housemaid's duties which have to be performed by the steward staff of a passenger steamer endless dish-washing knife and silver cleaning floor scrubbing and metal polishing and all the work had to be done by a staff of four exclusive of my insignificant self so that the chief steward had no time to play the gentleman at large that he so often appears where the mannings is on a liberal scale indeed but for the second steward a dapper chinese rejoicing in the most inappropriate name of haji i don't think we could ever have kept things straight but haji was a host in himself never in a hurry always looking well groomed and smart the amount of work that this wonderful little man got through in a day was marvellous not more so however than his history of which one episode will suffice as an example while working on board a large steamer of this same employ lying in cologne there was a terrific explosion on board whether of gunpowder or nitroglycerin i have forgotten men decks fittings were hurled skyward amidst a vast cloud of smoke and the fragments fell in an immense area extending for hundreds of yards around the unfortunate ship when the first alarm had subsided the stewards of an adjacent vessel returned to their tasks below and found haji on the saloon table having crashed through the skylight in his descent but unhurt and apparently unaffrighted 
it was not easy to imagine what would disturb his smiling sang froid if in a gale of wind a heavy sea found its way below causing the utmost hubbub and terror among the passengers whether by night or day haji would appear in the thick of the melee calmly setting everything and everybody to rights his pleasant smile most reassuring to behold but in my admiration for this invaluable celestial i am forgetting current events the day we were to sail i was much astonished to see all my old shipmates march on board having been sent by the shipping master for a passage to england in his anxiety to avoid another interview with the offended powers they were passengers in the sense that no work was expected of them but they lived and messed with the crew however as we were at different ends of the ship we did not come in contact at all for which i was grateful yet strangely enough i got into my first and only scrape on board through them the waste of food from the saloon table was very great but my instructions were to throw all broken meats into a dog basket at washing up time with all sorts of dirty odds and ends which basket was presently emptied over the side i managed to obtain a clean basket into which i turned all such broken victuals as i considered worth saving and watching my opportunity i carried this provender forward to my mates who i knew were getting only the usual miserable fare in this benevolent work i was discovered by the chief steward who clouted my ear as he termed it and threatened me with all sorts of pains and penalties if i dared to so offend again so from henceforth all the good food not wanted aft went overboard as before we were bound to liverpool via port-au-prince in the island of haiti and from a few words let fall by the passengers i gathered that it was just possible we might see some fun as they termed it i did not then know that haiti was in the throes of a successful revolution against the sovereignty of spain and france which eventually resulted in the establishment of two republics in the island one half calling itself the republic of haiti the other that of san domingo at that time the long struggle must have been drawing near its close for on land the triumphant negroes had things all their own way while at sea the fleets of france and spain played at what they were pleased to call a blockade whether any vessels trading with haiti paid any attention to the alleged blockade i do not know certainly we did not nothing at all in our proceedings would have suggested to any one that we were making for a blockaded port even when as we steamed briskly up the long v-shaped gulf at the apex of which port-au-prince lies we sighted two grim-looking warships lying at anchor on either side of the fairway with steam up no more notice was taken of them than the usual curiosity evinced by passengers at a strange sail as we passed between them we could see that one was french the other spanish by their ensign flying we rendered the usual sea courtesy of dipping our flag but of that no notice at all was taken by them doubtless as usual they felt none too amicably disposed towards the all-pervading anglais right onward we steamed into the harbour and alongside the company's hulk where such scant cargo as could be collected awaited us the only other vessel lying there was a long low steamer of perhaps seven or eight hundred tons whose raking schooner spars and funnel and the light grey blue that everything was painted to say nothing of the miniature stars and stripes that floated from her flagstaff spelt yankee filibuster as plainly as if she had been lettered with those words in characters two feet wide there was no sign of life on board of her except a mere suggestion of bluish smoke that curled slowly from her funnel telling of banked fires below for some time she was an object of the greatest interest to all on board until other matters occupied all our attention the town was in a pitiable condition what with the long rebellion and civil broils in addition to the careless happy-go-lucky fashion in which the farce of government was carried on whole streets were in ruins business was at a standstill and even the few merchants who still clung to the remnants of their trade were in despair it was no place for white men anyhow 
the negro was master of the situation he had fought long and savagely for his independence and now that he had got it he was drunken with it as with brandy that careless white man who omitted from any cause to salute in the humblest manner any functionary of the government of the hour however ludicrous in appearance speedily found himself in serious trouble out of which he did not easily extricate himself and since new officials were constantly emerging from the ragtag and bobtail the only wise course was to salute every black man no matter how menial his capacity might be one never knew whether the road mender of to-day might not be a general of division to-morrow having power of life and death even while wanting a decent pair of trousers a party of our fellows were allowed to go ashore by a serious error of judgment and as they strolled carelessly along one of the principal thoroughfares they met a company of soldiers so scarecrow-like that they simply stood and roared with laughter this had been crime enough but the sailor men must needs aggravate their offence the officer in command swelling with rage demanded their salute instead of complying they indulged in some ribaldry in which his get-up as well as that of his ragged regiment was held up to ridicule in effective fashion this behaviour could not be tolerated they were surrounded overpowered and dragged off to the calabozo then when they saw what their folly had led them into they repented sorely it had been worth any amount of kowtow to have escaped from such a fate as now befell them the lock-up was apparently an ancient cow-buyer standing like an island in a lake of sewage which under that blazing sun sent up a steam of putertidity into the heavy air through this foul morass they were dragged with every indignity their exulting captors could devise and there more dead than alive they were left for twenty-four hours when the captain managed to overcome the stubborn attitude of the sable authorities and induce them to accept a substantial fine when they were released and brought on board they looked like resuscitated corpses and every article of clothing they wore had to be flung overboard the doctor examined them with gathering anxiety upon his face but his only comment was the sooner we're out of this hell-hole the better fortunately we were to sail in the morning for every one was feverishly anxious to be gone that evening a passenger embarked who came alongside in a canoe paddled by two negroes bringing with him several weighty chests he was a well-dressed black man with an air of nervous anxiety and he hovered around while his baggage was being hoisted on board as if he dared not trust it out of his sight when it was all safely embarked and carried below to a muttered accompaniment of growls at its weight the canoe and its sable crew disappeared into the darkness while the passenger also hid himself and rarely appeared thenceforward at daybreak all hands were astir the firemen working like sooty gnomes down in their gloomy pit to get steam up while dense volumes of smoke poured from our funnels gladdening the eyes of all hands amidst the universal activity we yet found time to notice that the thin coronal of vapour hovering above the smokestack of the filibuster was also getting more palpable and the knowing ones winked at each other meaningly at last a hissing from our steam-pipe betokened full pressure in the boilers the old man mounted the bridge and all hands took their stations cast off fore and aft shouted the skipper willing hands released the heavy hawsers from the bits and with a rattle of steam winches and cheerful yells from the crew we moved slowly away from the hulk the ensign and house flag being run up at the same time then to our breathless amazement the filibuster apparently of her own accord stole from her position and came gently alongside a tall romantic-looking figure mounting her bridge as she did so so close did she come that the figure on the bridge was able to step nimbly on board of us he was a spare elegantly built man dressed in a well-fitting suit of grey silk with an immense white panama sombrero on his head 
he was strikingly handsome having a dark oval face with a heavy black moustache and velasquez beard while his black brilliant eyes wide set seemed to take in everything at a glance shaking hands cordially with our captain he said a few words inaudible on deck then the pair descended from the bridge and joined by the mate entered the chart room they remained there for a couple of minutes with the door closed and then coming out again the yankee leapt on board his own vessel while our two officers took their stations the captain on the bridge and the mate forward our engine-room bell clanged the order full speed ahead and as the engines responded our good ship vibrated from stem to stern under their impulse without any apparent effort the yankee kept her place by our side not a soul visible on board except the tall figure lolling calmly on the bridge meditatively puffing on a big cigar the decks being cleared there was for a brief space nothing to do so all hands including passengers crowded the rails watching with breathless interest the two warships which lay in grim silence where they were when we entered the harbour not a word was spoken and the clanging chorus of the massive machinery below seemed many times louder than we had ever heard it before the scene was sufficiently impressive to fix itself permanently in the memory of every one on board there was not a breath of wind the water of the widening gulf lying like another sky before us tinted in innumerable shades by the floating clouds and the richly coloured hills on either side every thrust of the pistons drove us nearer those two surly sentinels laden with potential destruction which we all well knew might at any moment be let loose upon us but there was much comfort in an occasional glance at the splendid old red ensign flying gallantly overhead for everybody on board felt how much might and majesty it represented nearer and nearer we drew to the point midway between the warships that now began to show a thickening cloud of smoke at their funnels and a white feather of escaping steam at last we were fairly between them suddenly the silent yankee alongside straightened himself made us a sweeping bow and said a thousand thanks captain farewell ladies and gentlemen and a pleasant passage Kalang ahead at his word a gong boomed below and the lithe vessel sprang forward like an unleashed greyhound the pitchy fumes from her funnel filling the clean air with a stench of burning petroleum boom boom went two big guns from the men of war as they both started in chase while from the filibuster's masthead the flag dipped as if in ironical courtesy many shots were fired after the daring craft but although the fountains cast up by the massive shot apparently played all around her none actually reached her and as she certainly steamed nearly two knots to their one she was soon hopelessly out of range recognizing this they gave up the chase i suppose according to the rules of romance they should now have intercepted us but this is fact not fiction and so it must be admitted that they paid not the slightest attention to us but returned to their old position despite our good rate of speed in less than four hours there was nothing visible of our protege but a long grimy streak in the bright blue sky under ordinary circumstances such an adventure would have afforded an inexhaustible topic of conversation during the remainder of the passage but unhappily a much more serious matter soon claimed everybody's attention those truly awful words yellow fever began to circulate in terrified whispers while the merry genial doctor's face looked terribly solemn there was little suspense the very next day the first victim died one of the men who had spent the night in that unspeakably filthy calabozo at port-au-prince ordinary prudence forbade any delay in disposing of the poor remains in less than an hour after death came the solemn little meeting the bareheaded group at the gangway the long white bundle on a hatch at an open port the halting diffident reading of the old sublime service and then the hoarse shh and the sullen plunge into unknown depths 
the destroyer had made such strides that a large tent had to be rigged over the main hatch as an open-air hospital and there the brave unwearying doctor labored day and night at his hopeless task there was no discrimination except as far as the passengers were concerned perhaps because they were better seasoned to the climate at any rate none of them were attacked but the ship's company officers engineers firemen sailors and stewards all gave tithe to death the disease was terribly swift in its operation one friday morning our boatswain's mate a huge hirsute irishman suddenly complained of his head this was at eight a m at ten a m he was in the hospital grinding his teeth in delirium a few minutes after everybody on deck was terrified at the apparition of a mother naked giant armed with the cook's axe which he had snatched from beside the galley door rushing madly about the decks not many seconds elapsed before he was alone striking furiously at everything in his way while the foam flew from his gaping mouth having made the round of the deck aft he came to the weather side of the wheelhouse within which the quartermaster was calmly steering quite unconscious of what was happening suddenly the maniac caught sight of him through the side window and immediately rained a torrent of tremendous blows upon the stout teak door poor teddy fled out of the lee door and up into the main rigging just as carney burst in then all was quiet after a while, someone was courageous enough to creep along and peer in. There was Carney lying at full length on the grating, having fallen upon the upturned edge of the axe, which had sunk deep enough into his chest to have let out a dozen lives. The place was like a slaughterhouse. That afternoon, one reading of the service sufficed for three burials, two more men having died while the maniac had possession of the deck naturally there was little levity on board cooped up with such an awful scourge none felt inclined for merriment but the ordinary routine of work went on without a hitch my shipmates were set to work on full wages to supply the places of the dead and although they did not relish doing firemen's duty they were not sorry to have the prospect of a little money when they reached home supposing they were still alive my turn came one morning at five o'clock when as usual i was called to begin my day's work i lifted my head to rise but it fell again like a piece of lead a feeling of utter helplessness had seized my whole body although i could not say i felt ill but not even the awe in which i stood of the chief steward could overcome my want of strength and i humbly said i'm not able to get up sir instantly alarmed the steward fetched the doctor who after feeling my pulse and etc pulled me out of the bunk and set me on my trembling legs telling the steward to put me to some work that did not require any running about but on no account to allow me to sit down his orders were strictly obeyed but how i got through that dreadful day i cannot tell i felt as if i would gladly have given the whole world to be allowed to lay down for a little while and several times my legs doubled up under me letting me sink in a heap on the pantry deck but there was no respite allowed me this stern treatment was completely successful for by supper time i felt quite strong again and i was troubled no more by any recurrence of those alarming symptoms what was the matter with me i never knew but undoubtedly i owed my life to the doctor's wisdom much as i hated his treatment at the time day after day dragged on each bringing with it a death of some one of our diminishing number while the doctor worn almost to a shadow still battled with the enemy with unabated vigour his chief task was with those who had won through the crisis to nurse them back to strength again beef tea with brandy was his sheet anchor and this potent reviver he was continually administering in tiny doses while commenting cheerfully on its marvellous virtues to his wasted patients then as if to fill up our cup of misfortunes the engines suddenly stopped the boilers were old in fact too old for safe use and one of them had sprung a dangerous leak 
the engineers attack the trouble with that stolid heroism for which their class is famous although from its prosaic nature little is thought or said about it by a world that loves its heroes to glitter with pomp and circumstance and to do their great deeds upon some conspicuous stage down beneath the boilers where the narrow limits compel them to lie at full length half roasted by the fierce heat and scalded from head to heel by the spurtings of boiling water they laboured with hardly a pause for a day and a night they succeeded in the almost incredible task of patching up the leaky source of our speed doing moreover their work so well that although our rate of going was greatly reduced the repairs held good until we reached port the joyful day arrived at last when the faithful doctor was able to announce that the yellow fever had left us and that unless some of the convalescents died of weakness there would be no more deaths from that scourge it was high time in the short period of twenty days we had buried thirty men every one of whose deaths was distinctly traceable to that foul den and port-au-prince happily the weather held fine and the wind held to the southwest so that we were able to help her along with the sails until one morning a thrill of delight ran through the ship at the sight of green water alongside sure sign of our nearness to the channel presently that solitary sentinel the fastnet hove in sight and soon behind it we saw the green hills of ireland all our miseries were now forgotten and there was a general air of joyful expectation mixed with deep thankfulness that we had been spared that afternoon our negro passenger whom we had hardly seen during the passage made his appearance on deck he was evidently seeking the captain for as soon as he caught sight of him he hastened towards him and the two went straight into the captain's stateroom from thence there soon issued strange noises as of a foreigner under strong excitement while now and then the deep tones of the skipper chimed in as if he were speaking soothingly suddenly the door was flung open and the captain called for the mate that officer responded promptly but did not succeed in hushing the den on the contrary the shrill voice of the black man rose higher than ever until he was fairly yelling with fury the mate blew his whistle and when the boatswain appeared in answer to it he received an order to bring the carpenter with a pair of irons and three or four men the reinforcements manhandled the excited negro hauling him with scant ceremony on deck and bundling him forward into an empty cabin wherein they locked him and left him to his own reflections this mysterious affair caused much excitement among both passengers and crew but it was not until after the vessel had been in dock some days that any explanation was forthcoming it appeared that according to his story the negro had been first lord of the treasury or whatever grand delicate title they had bestowed upon their keeper of the funds and seizing a favourable opportunity he had levanted with quite a large sum he said a hundred thousand dollars getting safely on board he had committed his loot to the care of the captain and mate who however most unaccountably forgot all about it when he claimed it coming up channel finding that he could by no means recall it to their memories he went temporarily mad insane enough at any rate to institute proceedings against them for its recovery his story which i have given above with the exception of the way in which he obtained his wealth was simply laughed at and he was fain to revert to his original profession of scullion or some such occupation the passage up channel was uneventful the hateful yellow flag quarantine was hoisted as we entered the mersey but as soon as the health officer boarded us we learned that there would be no delay in docking yellow fever being innocuous in our favoured land so the dock gate swung open and we passed in to our berth the vessel being in two hours deserted by everybody except the night watchman and me End of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of *The Log of a Sea Waif* by Frank T. Bullen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: A Drift in Liverpool Once More. 
that night i slept soundly heedless of to-morrow but when the day dawned the problem of what i was to do confronted me and a very awkward question it was for i was still so puny in size and so delicate looking that i knew it would be no easy matter to persuade any one to employ me besides i was penniless i had little clothes but what i was wearing and i felt sure no boarding-master would take me in on the chance of my paying him out of my advance note here my only hope was that i might be allowed to work by the ship at a small weekly wage until i had earned enough to pay for a week's board either in the sailor's home or some boarding-house where they would try and get me a ship that hope was soon dashed when the chief steward appeared with unnecessary gruffness as i thought he told me that i was not wanted and the sooner i got ashore out of it the better haji was kinder he gave me a cheerful smile a hearty shake of the hand and half a crown besides wishing me luck in a few minutes i stood outside the dock gates with all the town before me but not a friend or even an acquaintance as far as i knew within its limits conscious that i had no time to lose i wandered about the docks until i was weary speaking to every likely-looking officer on board the various ships i visited and getting nothing but plenty of good-natured chaff as well as outspoken comments upon my childish appearance yet i got one good meal so that when night fell and i sought a great heap of hay in the coburn dock that i had noted as a promising place to spend the night my precious piece of silver was still unbroken i slept soundly though none too warm my long stay in the tropics having thinned my blood at daylight i crept stealthily from my nest and recommenced my tramp but it was fruitless then i remembered the woodcarver and thought i would look him up again but there was another name over the shop and i saw that another business was being carried on there i did not like to go into my old boarding-house next door feeling sure that i should be unwelcome with only two shillings and sixpence in my pocket and no prospects i went to the sailors home and told my story but they refused to take me in as indeed i had fully expected they would for the next week i roamed about those wretched docks getting more and more discouraged every day until at last i was afraid to ask for a berth in case i got a cuff as well as a refusal finally when i had been reduced to picking scraps out of the gutter i resolved to go to the workhouse how such an idea entered my head i can't imagine but it did and seemed feasible too so off i started up brownlow hill but the strains of a german band arrested my none too eager progress and all hungry as i was i stayed to listen perhaps the music cheered me up at any rate while listening i determined to go to my old boarding mistress and offer my services to her in return for a shelter and such scraps as she could spare she received me ungraciously enough but i pleaded hard having learned well the hard lesson of not to take no for an answer without a struggle and eventually she agreed the place was a poor kind of cook-shop the staples of which were penny bowls of broth and tea for the poverty-stricken dock labourers with two penny plates of potato pie for the better off i honestly earned my keep and more but business being slack she told me plainly that she could not afford to keep me much longer and she would allow me a couple of hours a day for a week to look for a ship at the end of which time i must shift for myself again i was not altogether sorry at this chance slender though it was every day i hunted diligently about during the time allotted me and after four days i succeeded in getting a job as cabin boy on board a german bark the greif of rostock the captain had his wife and little daughter on board neither of whom spoke a word of english but the captain said he had just discharged an english boy who had pleased them very well and whose name of dan i was in future to answer to i took up my new duties with zest doing my best not only to give satisfaction in my work but to master the to me awful difficulties of the german language for a time i succeeded admirably except that the ladies called me schuftkopf sheep's head far more frequently than dan 
being irritated i suppose by what they considered my stupidity and not being able to understand them the only person on board who seemed inclined to be hard upon me was the mate a huge north german who never missed an opportunity of giving me a blow apparently by way of keeping his hand in therefore i exercised all the ingenuity i possessed in keeping out of his way no easy task for as soon as my work in the cabin was finished i was always called on deck to lend such a hand as i was able and i could not help noticing that in spite of the difficulty i had always found in getting a berth whenever i did succeed in finding one there was never any trouble in keeping me fully employed so matters progressed in fairly even fashion for three weeks while the greif which lay in the huskisson dock was taking in a general cargo for demerara i made fair progress with the language and was certainly something of a favourite with the boatswain the cook and the sailors i began to hope that i should succeed at last in making myself comfortable as well as necessary in some way to the comfort of others and only my dread of the mate gave me any uneasiness but one morning the cook took advantage of some brief leisure i had to get me to chop some firewood for him gaily i started to obey him using one large piece for a block and was halfway through my task when the axe struck a knot glanced off and entered the deck making an ugly mark the next moment i received a blow under the ear from behind which stretched me bleeding and senseless on the deck when i came to i felt very sick but there was such an uproar around me that i speedily forgot my own trouble in my anxiety to know what was the matter the mate stood white as chalk the centre of an angry little crowd of the men one of whom a tall fair swede was fairly raving with excitement and seemed by his threatening motions to be hard put to it to keep his hands to himself gradually it dawned upon me that all this row was about me the mate had struck me brutally and unjustly for what was a pure accident and his cruelty had actually caused the whole crew to resent his action this was really one of the strangest experiences i ever had i have been beaten innumerable times in all sorts of vessels but only once was a voice ever raised on my behalf besides this occasion and that was by joe the yorkshireman against my uncle in my first ship that a mixed crew of germans and scandinavians on board a german vessel should raise a protest against the ill-treatment of an english boy was an unheard-of thing especially when it is remembered that in those days brutality to boys at sea except in american ships was the almost invariable rule i was more frightened at the consequences of the mate's action than anything else especially as it looked as if there would be a regular riot directly before however any blows were exchanged the captain arrived his presence acted like magic he made no noise but just pushed his way into the centre of the disturbance speaking quietly to the men who at once dispersed to their several duties then he turned to me and said in the same passionless voice at your met you if i find you here in ten minutes more i slings you off aboard i did not linger in less than five minutes i was out of the ship and again in the unenviable position of being masterless there was a change in my hitherto persistent bad luck however strolling dejectedly around the dock i came to the very biggest sailing ship i had ever yet seen when i had done admiring her enormous proportions my attention was caught by a new spar which lay upon the quay nearly ready for going aloft i walked round it wondering with all my might whatever kind of mast it could be at last i stopped and according to a lifelong habit of mine began thinking aloud tain't a schooner's top mast cause there's three sheaf holes in it nor yet a bark's mizzen mast for the same reason neither ain't a ship afloat and it carries such a stick for a top gallant nor yet for a jaboom i never see such a spar in my life you give it up then i suppose said a grave voice behind me turning sharp around i confronted a tall distinguished-looking gentleman who was regarding me with an amused smile yes sir i said i thought i knew all about ship's masts but i can't think what this one can be for well he replied i'll enlighten you 
it's my ship's for to gallon mast and that third sheave hole that puzzled you so much is for the skysail halyards now do you see i thanked him and said i did but i was none the less surprised that any ship could carry such a mighty spar so high up and then by a happy inspiration i told him my story right down to the last episode he heard me in silence and as soon as i had finished turned and went on board telling me to follow him gladly enough i obeyed until we reached the quarter-deck where we found the shipkeeper telling him to find me something to do the captain then turned to me saying i shan't be able to take you to sea with me for all our gear is so heavy that we never carry any boys but while the ship is in liverpool you may stay on board doing what you can and i will pay you twelve shillings a week out of which you must keep yourself now be a good boy and i'll see what i can do for you when we sail i was hard put to it to express my gratitude but he cut me short by walking away and leaving me to realize my extraordinary good fortune as soon as he was gone i hunted up the shipkeeper who had taken himself off somewhere and asked him for a job he was an easy-going individual not over fond of work himself or given to expecting much from any one else so he said oh i can't be bothered just now you scull around a bit and have a look at the ship i'll find your scuttin to do some by that was good enough for me for the next two or three hours i exhausted all my powers of admiration over this magnificent vessel she was called the girarer of london and built frigate fashion with imitation quarter galleries which added to her already great appearance of size she belonged to a school that was now departed whereof the superb calcutta lady jocelyn and hydespes the last two converted steamships were conspicuous examples she carried thirty-two a b s and six petty officers so that she was well manned even taking her great size and enormous spars into account but alas years after i saw her bought by a firm of jewish ship knackers who raised her taunt spars sold the yards off her mizzenmast turning her into a bark and finally sent her to sea with seven a b s forward no one was surprised when she took entire charge of the poor handful of men before she got clear of the channel god help them they could hardly get her yards round much less shorten sail she was eventually picked up almost derelict and towed into falmouth where the ill-used crew promptly refused to do any more in her and were of course clapped in jail therefore with that steady application of the rights of owners so characteristic of our seaport magistrates but this is digression knock-off time came and with it the exodus of all the motley crowd of riggers painters and stevedores who had been busy about the ship all day seeing them depart homewards i remembered with some misgivings that i too could only be considered a day worker and might also be required to clear out but whither so i sought the shipkeeper and timidly approached the question whether i might be allowed to stay on board i found him very glad to have some one who would relieve him of the necessity of keeping so close to the ship as he had been doing he at once gave me the free run of the cabin and hastened to clean himself preparatory to a cruise downtown i busied myself in hunting up such odds and ends as lay about the stateroom available for bedding and before long had rigged myself quite a cosy nook near the glowing stove which as the weather was cold was very comforting my friend having departed i was left quite alone on board the huge vessel but this so far from giving me any uneasiness was just in my line i was more than contented i found the keys of the pantry and storeroom where my eager search soon discovered plenty of cutty bread biscuits half a chest of tea sugar oatmeal sago and arrowroot there was nothing else eatable or drinkable this find however gave me great delight i felt no apprehensions now that i should have to spend much in food a fear which had somewhat daunted me before seeing how badly i wanted to save all my wages to get myself a few clothes and pay for a week's board in the sailor's home when the sailed 
another expedition to the galley provided me with a saucepan with which i at once proceeded to make myself a mighty bowl of arrowroot thinking in my ignorance that not only was it very nice to eat but that it must be most strengthening as well how could i know that it was only starch a couple of biscuits and the half gallon of arrowroot plenty of sugar in it made me feel at peace with all the world if even i was in rather an inflated condition fed and warmed with a good roof over my head and a fairly comfortable bed if it was composed of rags i only wanted one thing more to be perfectly happy and even that was forthcoming a book bleak house lay in one of the pantry drawers waiting for me i felt putting the lamp handy and replenishing the fire i settled down luxuriously into my nest all my troubles forgotten in present bliss when the shipkeeper came on board i don't know for when i awoke it was morning five o'clock i jumped up hustled my bed out of sight and lit the fire while it was burning up i went on deck for a wash returning sharp set to a good breakfast of tea and biscuit after which i felt ready for anything that might come along by the look of the shipkeeper when at last he appeared his last night's excursion had been anywhere but in the paths of virtue but his amiability was unimpaired and it was in quite a deprecatory tone that he requested me to pop across the road and get him a drop of rum as he didn't feel very well whether it was my alacrity in obeying his request or the speed with which i afterwards got him a cup of tea i don't know but thenceforth our relations were of the pleasantest kind i wished though that he hadn't found me quite such a miserably cold job for that forenoon he set me to clean out the row of four hundred gallon tanks in which the sea stock of fresh water was carried my slender body being easily able to slip in through the manhole a feat that was really impossible to him now some of these tanks had over eighteen inches of water in them all had enough to come well above my ankles as it was late autumn i got chilled to the marrow for as i must needs bale all the water into buckets and pass it up to him through the manhole i soon got wet through then i had to scrub and sluice vigorously to get the thick coating of rust off in which process i became very much like a piece of rusty old iron myself as each tank was thoroughly cleansed a pail of lime wash was handed in to me with a big brush and i gave top bottom and sides a liberal coating of it in consequence of this occupation my appearance was filthy beyond words but i did not mind that until one day having come on deck for something i met the captain looking at me with an expression of the liveliest disgust he said dirty little beast this cut me to the quick as being both unkind as well as utterly undeserved however i made no defence one of the earliest lessons inculcated on board ship is no back answers and the boy of gumption loses no time in understanding that the less he says by way of excuse the better for his welfare much injustice is thus suffered of course but there is apparently no help for it from that day forward i carefully avoided the captain lest he should discharge me a fate which i dreaded the peculiar diet beginning to pall even upon my palate i hit upon a plan which however indefensible morally gave me then no qualms while the results were extremely gratifying the gang of painters who were redecorating the cabin brought their meals with them and i supplied them with tea out of the half chest in the storeroom receiving in return a portion of their food by this means i still kept my wages intact the only money i spent while on board was on one unlucky saturday fired by the description of a savoury dumpling filled with bacon and kidneys which i read in the late steward's cookery book i slipped ashore and bought the necessary ingredients on sunday morning i tried my hand and having succeeded in making the dumpling dropped it clothless into a saucepan of boiling water made up a roaring fire under and hungrily awaited the result rigidly repressing an eager desire to peep into the pot i watched the clock until the specified time had elapsed then my fingers trembling with excitement i lifted the lid and peered through the dense steam 
a greyish soup with a villainous burnt smell greeted my sight my dumplings had melted crying with vexation and disappointment i turned the mess out into a dish but i couldn't eat it it was too bad even for me so i fell back upon sago and made no more experiments in cookery the inevitable day drew near when the ship was to sail her cargo of salt for calcutta was nearly all in the riggers had bent the sails and a smart steward took charge of the cabin ejecting me summarily i took refuge in the forecastle that night and the next morning having made myself as presentable as i could i was a queer-looking little scarecrow i waylaid the captain and besought him to ship me for the voyage giving me a half-laughing half-pitying look he said no my boy there is no duty here light enough for you i cannot take you to sea with me but i will take you up to the home and tell them to get you a ship you shan't have to prowl the docks again if i can help it i thanked him but ventured to say that i should have liked much better to sail in such a splendid ship as the Jawar. He seemed pleased, but shook his head decidedly, and in a few minutes we were ashore, making for the sailor's home. Arriving at the great building, the captain immediately made for the office and sought an interview with the superintendent. As soon as that gentleman appeared, I was brought forward and introduced to him with a brief summary of my adventures and present position. My good friend, the captain, concluded his remarks by paying down a fortnight's board for me, at the same time expressing a hope that they would find me a berth as speedily as possible in some outward-bound ship, so that I should for some time at least be beyond the reach of homeless destitution. The superintendent readily promised his aid, and bidding me good-bye, the kindly captain returned to his duties happier, I hope, for the knowledge that he had done me a really good turn, for which it was highly improbable that I could ever repay him. I was at once handed over to the care of one of the stewards, who led the way up a seemingly interminable series of staircases to a cubicle on the fourth floor the place was built in tiers of galleries running right round a large central space lighted from above and paved at the bottom this covered-in quadrangle was used as a promenade smoking-room and lounge by the inmates while it was of course possible to take a complete view of the whole interior from any one of the seven galleries before we arrived at my berth, the steward was in possession of most of my story, and began to regard me with more friendly interest than I looked for, seeing that no tip was to be expected from me. He seemed surprised when, in answer to his inquiry for my dunnage, I told him I had none but what I stood in, and at once promised that he would see what he could do by way of beating up a few duds for me, a promise he faithfully kept then he ushered me into the snug little chamber with its clean bed and handy lockers and giving me a key of it he left me to my own devices End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen the dawn of better days at last i felt as if i was standing on firm ground here a solvent boarder in this great institution with thirty-six shillings in my pocket of which no one knew but myself and with the superintendent pledged to get me a ship there did seem a prospect that the days of my waifhood were over and done with i looked around me at the comfort and cleanliness of my little room i thought of the precarious existence i had been suffering and i felt very thankful outside my door was a row of big basins well furnished with soap jack towels and abundance of water off went my clothes and i fairly revelled in a good wash i had barely finished when the clangour of a great gong startled me i rushed to the railings and looked over to see a general move of the inmates from all quarters towards one goal instinct informed me that this strange noise was a summons for dinner so i hastened to join the throng and presently found myself in an immense dining hall filled with long tables at which a steady stream of men were seating themselves 
at one of these tables i took my place in joyful anticipation of a good dinner when suddenly a sharp hi from the head of the board arrested my attention it was the steward in charge who stood waiting to serve out the food he had spied a stranger as soon as he caught my eye he said what flat are you on now the barges in liverpool were known as flats and jumping at the conclusion that i was suspected of being a bargee boy i replied with much heat i'm not on any flat i've just left a two thousand ton ship surely never did a more feeble unintentional joke meet with a warmer reception my neighbors roared with delight and as the words were repeated from table to table very soon the whole vast chamber reverberated with merriment utterly bewildered i sat speechless until it was explained to me that the galleries in the homes were called flats too they were lettered for convenience of distinction and the steward's query was in order to assure himself that i occupied a room on the flat under his charge as otherwise i had no right at his table that little matter was soon cleared up and feasting began never in my life had i sat at such a board every one ate like giants and mountains of food vanished washed down by huge cans of ale served out liberally by the attendants i am ashamed to remember how i ate but the blissful thought that this sort of thing would be a regular incident of each day heightened my enjoyment the meal over diners wandered forth again in very different style to their entrance of half an hour before hardly knowing whither i went i sauntered along one of the galleries when suddenly the words to the library caught my eye no longer undecided i hurried in the direction indicated and found a really fine room most comfortably furnished with roaring fires and an enormous number of books there were only three people in it indeed it was never well patronized i found a volume of captain cook's travels coiled myself up in a big armchair and passed at once into another world thenceforth during my stay that peaceful chamber was my home except for a little exercise sleep and meals i scarcely left it and long ago though it is i can vividly remember how entirely happy i was occasionally i heard through the mighty void that separated me from the outer world a ringing shout of where's that shipwrecked boy and anybody seen that shipwrecked boy as the huge doorkeeper standing in the centre of the quadrangle below bellowed for me the said shipwrecked urchin was far too comfortable to desire any change in his present circumstances and it must be confessed did nothing to assist the authorities in their efforts to get him a ship to tell the truth whenever i must needs go out i used to watch my opportunity and evade the officials downstairs i had tasted the sweets of life and was loath to return to the bitter during my seclusion in the library however i made the acquaintance of several officers of ships through whose kindness i obtained quite a respectable lot of clothes so that i was able to reserve my precious little hoard to purchase sea stock with when the inevitable day came but in the meantime i saw as little of liverpool as i possibly could apart from my love of the library and its contents the town was hateful to me its streets seemed to scowl at me and every turning reminded me of misery but one day as i was darting across the quadrangle on my return from some errand a long arm shot out from behind a pillar and grabbed me panting with my run i looked up and saw the form of the doorkeeper towering over me why way i been stowed away all this time you young rascal he said here yeah, i been shouting myself hoarse after you and never a sight of yer could i get come along and with that he marched me off to the shipping office in the same building and handed me over to one of the clerks who immediately brought me before a jolly-looking captain who was just engaging his crew what he said i don't remember but in a few minutes i had signed articles as boy at twenty-five shillings per month on board the western bell of greenock bound to bombay and sailing two days after at eight in the morning from the alfred dock seacombe i received a month's advance like the rest half of which i had to pay for a week's board as i had been three weeks in the home 
but with my well-kept little hoard i had sufficient to buy my oilskins bed hook-pot pannikin and plate soap matches knife etc so that i was better off in those respects than i had ever been before early on the morning of the appointed day in company with several others of the crew who had been lodging at the home i was escorted across the mersey by the official belonging to the institution whose business it was to see us safe on board like all my companions i had not the slightest idea what sort of a craft i was going in except that she was a ship of one thousand two hundred and twenty five tons register this however is one of the most common experiences of the sailor of late years it has become more the practice for men to cruise round and choose a ship handing their discharges to the mate as a sort of guarantee that they will be shipped when she signs articles but even now thousands of men take a leap in the dark often finding themselves in for a most unpleasant experience which a little forethought on their part would have saved them when forethought is a characteristic of the sailor his lot will rapidly amend that however is almost too much to hope for we soon arrived at our ship's side finding her to be an old american built soft wood ship fairly comfortable looking and with a house on deck for the crew instead of the villainous den beneath the topgallant forecastle far in the forecourt of the ship which is the lair of seamen in most english ships i was soon off to the petty officer's quarters or half-deck a fair-sized apartment in the after part of the forward deck-house with bunks for eight and separated from the men's berth by the galley and carpenter shop there was no time to take stock she was moving all hands being on board and for a wonder not so drunk as usual she was rapidly warped down to the dock gates where one of the powerful tugs for which liverpool has long been justly famous awaited her the constitution the hawser was passed and secured the ropes which held us to the pier cast off and away we went down the river at a great rate our voyage was begun much to the discomfiture of our fellows a large ship the stornaway came rushing past us bound into dock having just finished the long round we were beginning the sight of a homeward bounder is always a depressing one for jack who is just starting again and it is usually made harder for him by the jocular remarks of the fortunate crew who shout of bright pots and pannikins and clean donkeys breakfast straw beds usually throwing some of their rusty tinware overboard at the same time to give point to their unkind remarks there was little time though for thought despondent or otherwise we were rapidly nearing the bar upon which the rising wind was making a heavy sea get up and our jibboom had to be rigged out what this means is i am afraid impossible to make clear to a landsman the amount of work involved in getting the long heavy spar into position with all its jungle of standing rigging which looks to the uninstructed eye a hopeless mass of entanglement is enormous when too it has to be done as the ship is dragged relentlessly through a heavy head sea as was now the case the difficulty and danger is certainly doubled yet it must be done and that speedily for none of the upper spars on all three masts are secure until what seamen call the headgear is set up to say nothing of the urgent necessity which may at any moment arise of setting the headsails as the jibs are termed collectively so rapidly did the sea rise and so powerful was the tug that before long heavy masses of water began to come on board and several ugly lumps came over the forecastle head half drowning the unfortunate men who in poor physical condition were toiling at the headgear some of them were of course compelled to work right over the bows where as she plunged along the boiling foam now and then surged right over their heads under these circumstances some disaster was inevitable it came suddenly i saw the boatswain leap from the forecastle deck aft a distance of some twenty feet yelling while in the air man overboard there was hardly a minute's delay before the tug stopped and everybody gave a sigh of relief to see that the unfortunate man had caught one of the life buoys thrown to him he placed his hands upon the edge of the buoyant ring which rose edgeways and fell over his head making him perfectly safe 
but he was so eager that he got his arms through and with both hands on the boy he tried to raise himself higher unfortunately he succeeded and immediately overbalanced his head going down while his legs hung over the sides of the ring burdened as he was with oilskins sea boots and much thick clothing underneath it was impossible for him to regain his position and when the boat from the tug picked him up he was quite dead steaming back alongside of us the skipper of the tug reported the sad fact suggesting that he might as well take the body back to liverpool when he had finished towing us this was of course agreed to and the towage resumed but no sooner had the news of our shipmate's death reached us than there was a rush to the forecastle by our crew to divide the dead man's belongings a piece of barbarism quite uncommon among seamen they made such a clean sweep of everything that when the captain sent to have the deceased seaman's effects brought aft all that was produced would hardly have filled a large handkerchief although he had brought two great bags and a bundle on board with him so passed from among us poor peter hill a steady middle-aged seaman leaving a widow and two children to mourn their loss and exist as best they could without the meagre half-pay he had left them after this calamity the speed of the tug was reduced until the jaboom was rigged and the anchors secured then the impatient tug skipper tried to make up for lost time green seas rolled over the bows as the bluff old ship was towed through the ugly advancing waves at a rate quite beyond anything she could have done unaided she strained and groaned as if in pain while the severity of her treatment was attested by a long spell at the pumps the quantity of water she had in her giving rise to many ominous mutterings among the crew at last the tuscar was reached the topsails and lower staysails were set and the tug let go of us much to our relief as the motion at once became easier then came the muster and picking for watches when the grim fact became apparent that we were grievously undermanned there were but twelve a b s and one ordinary seaman forward our tradesmen i e boatswain carpenter sailmaker and painter with three boys in the half-deck steward and cook aft were the captain and two officers under any circumstances this would have been a very small crew for a ship of her size but to make matters worse she was what sailors call parish rigged meaning that all her gear was of the cheapest common rope that with a little usage grew swollen and clumsy often requiring the strength of one man to pull the slack of it through the wretched armstrong patent blocks and not a purchase of any kind to assist labour except two capstans already we had gotten a taste of her quality in setting the scanty sail she now carried what would it be later on when all sail came to be made we could easily anticipate the crew were as usual a mixed lot there was an elderly yankee boatswain mate answering to the name of nat who in spite of his fifty years was one of the best men on board a smart little yorkshoreman very tidy and quiet and two liverpool irishmen dirty slovenly and obscene always flanagan and mahoney they i learned afterwards had come home a fortnight before from the east indies with a fairly good payday which they had never seen a copper of having lain in one continuous state of drunkenness in a cellar from the evening of their arrival until the vampires who supplied them with liquor had somehow obtained a claim upon all their wages then when the money was drawn the two miserable fools were flung into the gutter sans everything but the filthy rags on their backs a jovial darky from mauritius with a face whose native ugliness was heightened by an extraordinary marking from smallpox kept all hands alive with his incessant fun he signed as jean baptiste which sacred appellation was immediately anglicized to johnny the baptist nor did he ever get called anything else there was also a frenchman from saint nazaire who though his english was hardly intelligible had sailed in our country ships so long that he had lost all desire for anything french he was also a fine seaman but the wrong side of forty a taciturn dane tall and thin but a good man as far as his strength went 
was also of our company and a brawny hairy nova scotiaman john bradley able enough but by no means willing to exert his great strength lastly of those whom i can remember came peter byrne and julius caesar when the first name signed in liverpool he looked like a hale old sea-dog about fifty worth half a dozen young unseasoned men unfortunately for us he had come out of the experienced hands of paddy finn a well-known boarding-master renowned as a faker-up of worn-out and longshore sailors rumour had it too that he had recently married a young woman who had eloped with several years savings leaving him without any prospect but the workhouse until paddy finn took him in hand for the sake of his month's advance be that as it may it was almost impossible for any one to recognize in the decrepit palsied old wreck that crawled aft to muster and answer to the name of peter byrne the bluff hearty old seaman that had signed on so boldly two or three days before julius caesar was a long cadaverous lad willing and good-natured hailing from vermont but so weak and inexperienced that you could hardly feel him on a rope the other three men have entirely faded from my memory of the petty officers with whom i lived it only needs just now that i note them as all scotch belonging like the skipper and mate to the shores of the firth of forth with the exception of the painter he was a yarmouth man really an a b but in consequence of his great ability in decorating mixing paints etc given five shillings a month extra with a bunk in the half-deck there was no sea sobriquet for him like bosun chips sails or doctor so he was called by his rightful surname barber the cook or doctor was a grimy little maltese not quite such a living liable on cookery as usual but dirty beyond belief i said there were three boys in the half-deck but that statement needs qualifying the eldest of the trio was as good a man as any on board the ship and deserves much more than passing notice he had been like myself a london arab although never homeless for his mother who earned a scanty living by selling watercresses always managed to keep a corner for him in her one room up a shortage court but bill was far too manly to be a burden to his mother a day longer than he could help so after trying many ways of earning an honest crust he finally managed to get taken on board the war sprite training ship whence he was apprenticed in the western bell for four years he was now in his third year of service a sturdy reliable young fellow of eighteen not very brilliant perhaps but a first-class seaman a credit to himself and to his training the other boy besides myself was a keen urchin about my own age on his first voyage of respectable parentage and with a good outfit whatever his previous experience had been i don't remember I think he came straight from school. Anyhow, he was artful enough to early earn the title of a young sailor but an old soldier, which concise character sums up all that a seaman can say as to a person's ability in doing as little as possible. Captain Smith, our chief, was a jolly, easy-going Scotchman of about sixty, always good-tempered and disinclined to worry about anything he had his wife and daughter with him the latter a plain young lady of about twenty-two both of them shared the skipper's good qualities and the ship was certainly more comfortable for their presence mr edney the chief mate was a splendid specimen of manhood a scotchman about thirty-five years of age with coal-black hair and eyes he was the most hirsute individual i have ever seen a shaggy black mane longer and thicker than any newfoundland dogs waving all over his chest and back mr cottam the second mate was a square-built undersized man from the midlands and the bane of my existence but a prime seaman who loved work for its own sake End of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of *The Log of a Sea Waif* by Frank T. Bullen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen. Due South. Perhaps an undue amount of space has been given to particularizing the Western Bell's crew, but my excuse must be that this was my first big ship. The steamer didn't count, 
as well as my first long voyage to me it was the commencement of a new era hitherto i had not been long enough on board any one ship to take much interest in either her or her crew the changes had been so numerous and rapid that while i was certainly accumulating a large stock of varied experiences i was unable to put them to much practical use because i remained so small and weak but now i knew that barring accidents i was in for a twelve months voyage i should cross the line four times round the cape twice and return a regular south spainer looking down from a lofty height of superiority upon other sea boys who had never sailed to the southard when the watches had been picked i found myself under the second mate whom i dismissed rather summarily at the close of the last chapter because i shall have a great deal to say about him later on for the present it suffices to note that my evil genius must have been in the ascendant for jemmy the scrubber as we always called mr cotton behind his back was a regular tyrant who spared nobody not even himself the men of his watch took things easily as usual knowing full well that he was unable to coerce them but i was helpless in his hands and he did not fail to let me know the fact there was some compensation for me in having bill smith the sturdy apprentice before mentioned as my watchmate for he was both able and willing to lend me a helping hand whenever possible although of course he could not shield me from the amiable weaknesses of jemmy the scrubber still his friendship was very valuable to me and it has endured unto this day at the outset of the voyage i found that if i had never earned my pay in my life before i was going to do so now when there was one hand at the wheel and one on the lookout there were four a b s bill and myself available to make or shorten sail consequently it became the practice to send me up alone to loose whatever sail was going to be set during the night and i would go up and down from one masthead to the other while the men did the hauling on deck then when the job was finished the men retired to their several corners more often than not into their bunks in the forecastle, leaving me to coil up all the ropes and then return to my post aft in front of the poop ready to carry jemmy's orders when he gave any she was a very heavy working ship as before noted making the ordinary duties of trimming sail for such a handful of men most exhaustive but in addition to that the food was so bad that it reminded me strongly of the arabella yet so usual so universal was this shameful condition of things that there was no more than the ordinary quantity of growling no complaints brought aft and things went on pretty comfortably of course she leaked made a good drop of water as sailors say but still in fine weather the pumps would suck in ten minutes at four-hour intervals but sail she could not a rochester barge would have given her two miles and ten and as to turning to windward that is zigzagging against a contrary wind it was a mere farce she made so much leeway that she just sailed to and fro on the same old track till the wind freed therefore it was a weary time before we got down as far as that dreaded stretch of stormy sea known to seamen as the bay although it extends many a league atlantic words from the bay of biscay here we battered about for several days against a persistent southwesterly wind that refused to let us get south until at last it freshened into a bitter gale accompanied by the huge cross sea that gives this region such unenviable notoriety under two lower topsails and reefed foresail we wallowed and drifted watching with envious gaze the flyers gliding homeward under enormous clouds of canvas steady and dry while we were just like a half-tied rock swept fore and aft by every comber that came hissing along here i got a narrow squeak for my life i was coiling up the gear in the waist when she lurched heavily to windward just as a green mass of water lifted itself like a hill on that side 
Before she could rise to it, hundreds of tons of foaming water rolled on board, sweeping me blindly off my feet and over the lee rail. Clinging desperately to the rope I held, I waited, swollen almost to bursting with holding my breath, but quite unconscious of the fact that I was overboard. At last she rolled to windward again, and I was swept back by another wave, which flung me like a swab into the tangle of gear surrounding the mainmast, little the worse for my perilous journey. And thus she behaved all that night, never free from a roaring mass of water that swept fore and aft continually, leaving not a dry corner anywhere. Sundry noises beneath the forehatch warned us that something heavy among the stores had broken adrift, but it was impossible to go down and see, not only for fear of the water getting below, but because of the accumulated gas from the coal, which, unventilated for days, would only have needed a spark to have blown the ship sky-high. Towards morning, however, the weather fined down. As soon as possible the forehatch was taken off, and there we found in the tween decks a mess awful to contemplate the whole of our sea stock of salt beef and pork in tierces had broken adrift together with two casks of stockholm tar and had been hurled backwards and forwards across the ship until every barrel was broken in pieces there lay the big joints of meat like miniature islands in a sea of tar except that with every roll of the ship they swam languidly from side to side in the black flood all hands were set to work to collect the food it was all we had hoist it on deck and secure it there in such fashion as we could then it was scraped clear of the thickest of the tar the barrels were set up again and refilled with the filthy stuff into the midst of which freshly made pickle was poured it was not good food before but now, completely saturated with tar, it was nauseous beyond the power of words to describe. Yet it was eaten, and before long we got so used to the flavor that it passed unnoticed. This diversion kept all hands busy for two or three days, during which the weather was kind to us, and we gradually stole south until the steady trade took hold of us and helped us along into settled fine weather. By this time all hands had settled down into their several grooves, determined to make the best of a bad bargain. One thing was agreed upon, that except for her short-handedness and starvation, she was a pretty comfortable ship. There was no driving, no rouse, while the feminine influence aft made itself felt in the general freedom from bad language that prevailed on deck. But we were not yet low enough in numbers, apparently, the old man, Peter Byrne, who shook so much that he was never allowed aloft, became perfectly useless. He had been an old man of war man, living, whenever possible, a life of riot and debauchery, for which he was now called upon to pay the penalty. At a time of life when many men are not long past their prime, he was reduced to childishness, a very picture of senile decay. His body, too, in consequence, I suppose, of the foul feeding, became a horrible sight upon the opening of more than forty abscesses, from which, however, he seemed to feel no pain. Strange to say, his rough shipmates, who of course had to make good his deficiency, showed no resentment at the serious addition to their labors with gentleness and care that could hardly have been expected of them they endeavoured to make the ancient mariner's declining days as comfortable as the circumstances would allow and i am sure that nowhere could the old fellow have been more carefully looked after she was an unlucky ship her slow gait even with favouring winds was something to wonder at but as if even that were not delay enough we met with a most abnormal amount of calms and light airs hindrances that would have made some skippers i have known unbearable to live with but captain smith was one of a thousand nothing seemed to ruffle his serene good humour it must have been infectious for the conditions of food and work were so bad that a little ugly temper added thereto would certainly have caused a mutiny 
as usual i unluckiest of urchins was about the worst off person on board jemmy the scrubber unable to imbue the rest of his watch with his own restless activity gave me no peace night or day woe betide me if overcome by sleep in my watch on deck at night i failed to hear his first call with a bull's-eye lantern in one hand and a piece of ratline stuff in the other he would prowl around until he found me and then well i was wide awake enough for the rest of that watch in the half-deck i was treated fairly well except in the matter of food and even that got put right in time i have often wondered since how four men of good standing like our petty officers could deliberately cheat two boys out of their scanty share of the only eatable food we had but they certainly did every other day except saturday was duff day when the modicum of flour allowed us was made into plain pudding by the addition of yeast and fat the portion due to each made a decent-sized plateful and with a spoonful of questionable molasses furnished the best meals we got now the duff for the half-deck was boiled in a conical bag and turned out very similar in shape and size to a sugar-loaf it was brought into the house in a tin pan not wide enough to allow it to lay flat so it stuck up diagonally the sailmaker always whacked it out marking off as many divisions as there were candidates so far so good but when he cut off his portion instead of cutting fair across the duff he used to cut straight down thus taking off half the next portion as well owing to the diagonal position of the duff then came the boatswain who of course followed suit and the others likewise until the last two whacks falling to the share of the boys was really only the size of one for a long time this hardship was endured in silence until one day at the weekly apportionment of the sugar much the same sort of thing took place then bill smith broke out and there was a rare to do our seniors were dreadfully indignant at his daring to hint at the possibility of their being unfair and for some time i feared a combined assault upon the sturdy fellow all their tall talk however only served to stiffen his back and in the result we got our fair share of what was going hitherto i had not seen any deep-sea fishing so when one day a school of bonito came leaping round the bows the mate went out on the jaboom end with a line my curiosity was at fever heat however i endured until eight bells i don't know once or twice the wrath of jemmy was kindled against me for inattention and i got a sharp reminder of my duties at last eight bells struck i had the dinner in the house in a twinkling and in another minute was rushing out along the boom to where the mate had left his line while he went in to take the sun the tackle was simplicity itself consisting solely of a stout line about the thickness of blind cord with an inch hook firmly seized to its end baited with a shred of white rag my fingers trembled so that i could hardly loose the neat coil the mate had left for below me gambling in the sparkling foam beaten forward from the bluff bows were quite a large number of splendid fish although they did not seem nearly as large as they were in reality at last i got the line free and bestriding the boom end with my legs firmly locked between the jib guys i allowed the lure to flutter away to leeward jerking it gently so as to imitate a leaping squid or bewildered flying fish splash and the graceful curve of my line suddenly changed into a straight i had hooked one in a perfect frenzy of excitement i hauled madly scarcely daring to look below where my prize dangled his weight fairly cutting my hands at last i had him in my arms but such was the tremendous vibration of his massive body that although i plunged my thumbs through his gills i was benumbed from head to heel all feeling left me and my head was beginning to swim when i bethought me of plunging him into the folds of the jib which was furled on the boom with a flash of energy i accomplished this falling across the quivering carcass half dead myself 
but before he was quite dead i had recovered and prouder than any victorious warrior returning from the hard-won field i bore him in board i was received in the half-deck as a benefactor to my species for had i not provided twenty pounds of fresh food how welcome my catch was can hardly be comprehended by those who have never known what it means to subsist upon beef and pork which when dry turns white and hard as salt itself with the flavour of tar superadded and that for many weeks the first flush of excitement over attention was called to my gory appearance i had not noticed it before but now i found that i was literally drenched in blood black red from the chin downward what of that i had caught my first big fish and nothing else mattered out i went again succeeding in a few minutes in hooking another but one of my watchmates must needs come interfering and take it away from me in spite of my protests i was actually bold enough to tell him that the way he was carrying it was unsafe the idea of me with my five minutes experience dictating to an old shellback like bradley i was right though for when halfway in the fish gave a convulsive plunge and fell leaving his gills in bradley's fist i didn't say anything but like the parrot i did some tall thinking all the fish left us instanter attracted doubtless by the blood of their mutilated fellow so sulkily coiling up the line i came in there was a plentiful supper at four bells and though i should now pronounce the flesh of a bonito as dry and tasteless then it was sweeter to me than i could express while it was yet in my mouth yea ere it was chewed retribution overtook me i heard the watch on deck setting sail forward and more conversation ensuing upon the performance than usual suddenly a shock head thrust itself into the half deck the voice of caesar said ominously tom the mate wants her with a thrill of dread crawling up the roots of my hair i obeyed following the messenger forward there stood the port watch grouped round the mate gazing upward at the sail they had just been setting the jib well they might from head to tack down its whole length ran ghastly streaks and patches of gore a sight that made my flesh creep did you do that said the mate in an awful tone there was no need for any answer my guilt was manifest vengeance lingered not and in a few minutes the manes of my first fish were propitiated lamely i retired to complete my supper with what appetite i could muster and to vow that the next fishing i did i would take a sack out with me but the evidence of my offence was permanent surviving the bleaching of sun rain and spray throughout the whole of the voyage my waspish little tyrant the second mate could hardly rope ends me again for the same fault but he made it an excuse for robbing me of a goodly portion of each day watch below keeping me on deck sorting the carpet thrums of which he was forever making hearth rugs oh how i did hate his fancy work and him too but i dared not complain or refuse although at night i was always getting into trouble for going to sleep which i really couldn't help End of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of *The Log of a Sea Waif* by Frank T. Bullen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen: Eight Weeks Calm. Leisurely as our progress had been hitherto, we had always managed to make some southing each day. But now ensued a time unique in all my experience. What our exact position was, I do not know, but I fancy it must have been somewhere near the equator in the Atlantic when the faltering fitful breezes first failed us a long succession of rain deluges set in which at first were most heartily welcome for like many other ships of her class in those days the western bell's store of water tanks contained barely enough of the precious fluid to suffice us for half the voyage even upon the regulation allowance of three quarts per man each day rain was depended upon to replenish them in time and on such voyages of course seldom fail to afford a bountiful supply 
now however it fell for whole days in one solid roaring downpour that in spite of the many openings by which the decks were drained filled them so that it was possible to swim from poop to forecastle in fresh water everybody turned out all their belongings that were washable and a regular carnival of soap and water took place then the ports were opened and the decks cleared of water it still poured over the front of the poop like a small niagara and from thence as being the cleanest we refilled all our tanks still the flood came down without a break until the incessant roar became awe-inspiring many of the crew spoke of it as passing all their experience even hinting at the possibility of another flood it was so heavy that the experiment was successfully tried of scooping up drinkable water off the sea surface which was like a mill pond for its level although all a foam with the falling torrent the ship lay as nearly motionless as it is possible for a ship to be out in mid-ocean for coleridge's simile of a painted ship upon a painted ocean is only a poet's license and grates upon a seaman as the sole picture in that wonderful work which is not literally true admiral wharton's remark that in all the incalculable mass of the ocean not one particle is ever absolutely at rest may strike most people as strange but it is sober truth and therefore it is impossible for a vessel at sea ever to be perfectly motionless gradually the massive downpour abated the sun peeped out and the sodden decks and gear dried up but there was no breath of wind and as captain smith was a practical man with all his patience he decided to utilize this otherwise barren time in carrying out a scheme he had purposed leaving for some long spell of waiting in indian harbors we had on deck three huge rough spars long logs in fact these were loosed from their lashings and lifted on to the gallows whereupon the boats usually rested a big rip saw was produced the only time i ever saw one on board ship and the strange spectacle was witnessed of a ship's deck being turned into a saw pit sailors into sawyers thick slabs were sawn off the spars after which the carpenter and a couple of men who could handle axe and adze set to work to fashion them into top yards meanwhile the rest of the hands toiled like beavers unbending sails sending down yards and overhauling standing rigging until the old ship looked as if she were in some snug dock corner being dismantled all day long this work went on no one knowing or caring whose watch on deck it should be and at night the weary workers lay around promiscuously sleeping away the hours of darkness in calm certainty of being undisturbed this curious interlude in an ocean voyage developed strange faculties in our men the iron bands which form part of the fittings of a ship's yards were owing to the skipper's desire to have heavier spars found to be too small no matter an impromptu forge was rigged up on a barrel filled with sand a most ingenious bellows was made by somebody and as if born and bred in a smithy the boatswain and two hands manipulated that ironwork in such workmanlike fashion that it answered its purpose as well as if turned out of a black wall foundry for many days this work went on with apparently no more notice taken of its strangeness than as if it were the normal course of events but gradually the deathly stillness of our surroundings the utter absence of the faintest air of wind or sign of any other vessel in a similar plight began to tell upon everybody's nerves men took to gathering in twos and threes in the evenings to recount their experiences of lengthened calms and the yarns they had heard of bygone tragedies connected with ships that had strayed into windless seas even the busy working hours could not prevent the men from gazing uneasily over the side where the familiar smiling face of the sea was undergoing a mysterious change there is about the deep sea even in the hottest weather a delicious atmosphere of cool cleanliness a searching purity such as the earth can never yield giving one the fixed idea that to this vast unpollutable limpidity the nations owe their health in some dim fashion this thought is present with all seafarers however dense and unnoticing they may be 
therefore when that familiar freshness was found to be giving place to a stale stagnant greasiness to which a mawkish uninvigorating atmosphere clung what wonder that uneasiness all the more difficult to bear quietly because undefinable became generally manifest adding to the sense of eeriness was the fact that old peter was failing fast i have already mentioned how willingly his share of the common burden was borne by his shipmates and how loyally they tended him even though such service as he needed could not be spoken of without offence but now his mind had completely gone he lived in some misty past about which he babbled unceasingly often in the still evenings all hands would gather round him listening in perfect silence to his disjointed reminiscences of desperate deeds in the way of duty of long drawn-out debaucheries in filthy rookeries of home ports as well as the well-known hells at hong kong calcutta or Callao. they were strange scenes those dog watch gatherings nothing distinctly visible but the red glow of the pipes except when the sudden glare of a match struck to light fresh tobacco shed a momentary gleam over the group of haggard bearded faces each beclouded with an unwanted shadow in the midst a placid stream of sound peter's voice prattled on its lurid language in the strangest contrast to the gentleness of his speech still the days dragged on and the faces grew longer all the refitting was finished and only the ordinary routine of ship life was left to be carried on happily those duties are always in the hands of capable officers sufficiently onerous to prevent time ever hanging heavily one of the strangest of all the strange notions current ashore about sea life is that sailors have nothing to do but watch the ship go along except during stormy weather one would have thought that the never-ending ever beginning round of work in a house that is properly kept would have taught all landsmen and women that the great complicated machine called a ship would demand at least equal labours to keep it fit and in working order but watch and watch was now restored which of course threw a great deal of additional time upon the men's hands since they could still sleep through the night if they chose without fear of being disturbed so for hours when unemployed men took to hanging over the rail watching with an unnatural curiosity the myriads of strange creatures that lured from their silent haunts in the gloomy middle depths of the ocean by the long enduring stillness above came crawling about blinking glassily with dead-looking eyes at the unfamiliar sight truly it was an uncanny sight not only fish of bizarre shape abounded but vast numbers of great medusae semi-transparent simulacra of all the hideous things that ever haunted a maniac's dream crawled greasily about us befouling the once clear blue of the sea and coating its sleek surface with stagnant slime and deeper down mighty shadows passed sluggishly to and fro filling the gazers with wordless terror as the days crept wearily away and those formless apparitions gradually chose higher levels overhead the sweet fathomless azure of the sky paled as if in sympathy with the silent sea cloudless indeed but overspread with a filmy veil of strange mist that while it robbed the sun of its glare seemed to enclose us within a dome of heat unventilated and stale when night fell instead of cool refreshment such as comes even in tropical calms after sunset at all ordinary times there arose a foul odour of decaying things that clung clamily to the palate like a miasma the densely populated ocean beneath palpitated with pale fire the gleaming of putrescence instead of the usual brisk movement seen among the glowing denizens of the deep everything crawled languidly as if infected with some universal pestilence moon and stars lost their strong silver glow and were no longer reflected in the smoothness beneath as if shining in another heaven and at moonrise when the fantastic mist wreaths writhed about the horizon the broad red disk of the moon would be distorted into many uncouth shapes or patterns of strange design were drawn across her paling surface 
at last one night when old peter was holding his usual levy he suddenly raised his voice and authoritatively demanded that his auditor should bear him on to the forecastle head they instantly obeyed lifting him tenderly upon his mattress and laying him gently by the side of the capstan then all hands gathered round him in the darkness only the glow of the pipes fitfully illuminating the rugged countenances slowly the moon rose but sent no silvery pathway across the sea until suddenly as if with a great effort she broke through the hampering mist wreaths that seemed to clog her upward way a pure pale beam shot right athwart our vessel lighting up the little group of watchers on the forecastle and lingering as if lovingly upon the withered weather-scarred face of our ancient shipmate as it did so he smiled a patient happy smile his lips unclosed and with a sigh of relief like a weary child he died breaking the steadfast silence came the mate's mellow cry square the mainyard as the men rose to obey a gentle breath welcome as the first thrill of returning health kissed the tanned faces slowly the great yards swung round a pleasant murmuring as of a mountain rivulet arose from the bows and the long calm was over in quiet attendance upon the dead came the sailmaker with a roll of worn canvas under his arm in which the poor shrivelled remains were reverently wrapped and neatly sewn up a big lump of coal was found and secured to the feet and the long parcel was borne gently aft to the gangway there in the moonlight we all gathered while the skipper with faltering unaccustomed voice read the stately words of the burial service all hands standing like statues as they listened to what all admit to be one of the most solemn as well as majestic selections known in our splendid language suddenly there was a pause the skipper raised his hand and those who supported the plank on which the worn-out tabernacle of old peter lay gently raised its inner end there was a subdued shk as the white fardel slid slowly seaward followed by a sullen plunge all rushed to the side where an ascending column of green light marked the descent into those calm profundities of our dead an almost inaudible sigh of relief escaped from every lip as if a well-nigh intolerable burden had been removed undoubtedly that was the predominant feeling intensified by the fact that a sweet breeze was now blowing steadily in the blue dome above the moon and her attendant stars were shining with their full splendour and from the now sparkling face of the surrounding sea the sickly mist was rolled quite away thenceforward although our progress was wretchedly slow of course we were little troubled by calms but our tribulations were not yet all over barber the painter a b was taken ill so ill as to be quite useless nor did he ever again that voyage recover sufficiently to resume his place as an active member of the crew and other men were grievously tried by scurvy which though in a mild form was painful and weakening how it was that they were no worse i cannot think for the food was bad enough truly for the development of that malignant disease in its worst form but somehow we worried along in dogged fashion every one showing rare patience under their unmerited sufferings and so in laborious fashion we crept southward and round the cape without any bad weather worth mentioning until well to the eastward of that justly dreaded point then one night we had a narrow escape from serious disaster it was our uh, the second mate's watch on deck from eight to midnight we were jogging along before a light southwesterly breeze at about four knots the weather being singularly fine for these latitudes down in the cabin the skipper his wife and daughter and the mate were playing cards while the second mate with a carelessness most unusual with him was hanging over the open scuttle absorbed in watching the game reese the old frenchman with a welsh name was on the lookout and i heard him muttering and grumbling because the officer of the watch was oblivious of the fact that an ominous-looking cloud was rising in the northeast or almost right ahead presently from its black bosom faint gleams of lightning showed themselves while the subdued murmur of the breeze we had became hushed in an unnatural quiet 
with a quickness that seemed miraculous the threatening cloud ahead overspread the sky and still the second mate did not realize what was coming as all sail was set the position began to look so threatening that all the watch took the alarm and gathered in the waist ready for the sudden emergency imminent presently the wind dropped dead its sudden failure arousing the supine officer who lifting his head took in the situation at a glance but before he could issue an order there came a smart patter of rain followed immediately by a roar as the northeast wind like a savage beast leapt upon us taking us flat aback then there was a hubbub up rushed the skipper and mate shouting for all hands everything was let go at once but the sails jammed backward against the mast refused to allow the yards to come down the ship began to drive astern most dangerously nor could she be got round by any means presently she dipped her stern right under taking a sea in over the taffrail that filled the decks fore and aft it was now a question of minutes with us if she could not be got round she would certainly go down stern foremost for again and again she drove her broad stern under the rising sea as the now furious gale hurled her backwards the feeble efforts of the crew seemed utterly unavailing against the mighty force of this sudden tempest but providentially a huge sea caught her on one bow flinging her head off far enough for the wind to grip the head sails round she spun upon her heel like a top and in another minute the shreds of the rending sails were thundering above our heads as they flew to fragments in an indescribable uproar wherein the howling of the gale the reverberations of the thunder and the crash of our yards were all mingled the ill-used vessel sped away before the wind as if fleeing for her life an almost continual glare of lightning shed an unearthly light over all by which the havoc that was being wrought was plainly to be seen how that night's work was ever accomplished i have no idea but when morning dawned we were fore reaching under the three lower topsails and four topmast staysail the fluttering rags of what remained of our lighter sails being secured in some haphazard sort of fashion to the yards we had escaped the doom of many a fine ship whose crew have paid the penalty of carelessness with their lives it was long however before we overtook the labour which those few hours involved us in for many days we jogged along under easy sail getting farther and farther to the northward every day happily for us and so putting a great distance between us and bad weather End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen up the indian ocean to bombay at certain seasons of the year the minds of mariners navigating the indian ocean are always more or less upon the tension of expectancy concerning the possibility of their encountering one of those tremendous meteors known as cyclones a keen watch is continually kept upon the mercury in the barometer for any deviation from its normal ebb and flow which occurs with the greatest regularity in the tropics during settled weather for these truly awful storms are so justly dreaded by even the bravest seamen that no danger of navigation claims more attention the possibility of meeting or being overtaken by one bulks largely in the dog-watch discussions among the foremast hands and he who has successfully braved an encounter with a cyclone speaks with an authority denied to his fellows who have never had such a painful experience even to me juvenile as i was an almost deferential hearing was accorded when i spoke of my havana experience the hurricane of the west indies the typhoon of the china seas and the cyclone of the indian ocean being only different names for the same mighty atmospheric convulsions happily our leisurely progress northward was unattended by any such deeply perilous adventure as the encounter with the cyclone would have been 
doubts were freely expressed as to the probability of the western bell weathering one at any time but especially under our present short-handed condition every day therefore that passed seeing us nearer port was noted with delight as lessening our chances of utter extermination and when at last we passed the latitude of cape comoran and entered the arabian sea there was a distinct lightening of faces and a tendency to make little of the weary passage now gradually nearing its end we did not see a vessel of any description during our journey from the cape until within two hundred miles of bombay neither did we sight any land but one morning to my amazement i saw a vessel nearing us unlike any i had ever seen before except in pictures she had a hull like the half of an egg cut lengthways and was propelled by an enormous white sail of lateen shape or almost like one of our jibs she could not have been more than ten or fifteen tons capacity and how she stood up under such an immense spread of sail was a mystery she came flying along like a huge sea-bird shooting up almost in the wind's eye and presently graceful as an albatross rounded to under our stern and spilled her sail seated in the after part of this queer craft were two or three dignified-looking men in white raiment with the peculiar stiff headgear affected by parsees one of the black unclad natives forming her crew hooked on to our four chains and with an agility i could have hardly believed possible one of the white-robed visitors seized a rope flung over the side and skipped on board speaking correct english he saluted the mate who stood at the gangway then hastened aft and making a low salaam to the skipper solicited the honour of being our dubosh or general purveyor while we were in harbour to his great disappointment however captain smith was an old bombay trader and always employed the same dubosh so that after a few compliments our visitor politely took his leave hoping for better luck next time thenceforward we met many native craft or bugalows as they call them lumbering along the coast on various errands all characterized by a general makeshift appearance that made me wonder how ever they dared brave the dangers of the sea at all but that is a peculiarity of all eastern native craft they are things of shreds and patches and look as seaworthy as a wagon with a worn-out tarpaulin set most of them creep along shore pretty closely and at night lower their wooden anchors down about twenty fathoms furl sail and turn in or at least go to sleep she is pretty safe to fetch up somewhere and time doesn't matter if she gets run down by some bustling ship or other it is kismet and not to be helped at last we drew near bombay that liverpool of the east the first sight of which is so amazing to an untravelled briton i was almost stupefied with wonder at the mighty stream of traffic the immense fleet of ships that lay at anchor in the magnificent harbour and the beauty of the great city we had shipped a white pilot who being anxious to get up to the anchorage before dusk and make one job of the mooring was cracking on to an exceedingly stiff breeze making the old ship heel over alarmingly suddenly i heard my name called running aft i was met by the second mate who handing me a coil of line ordered me to go up and reeve the signal halyards in the mizzen truck now i should premise that like all american-built ships we carried very long royal poles or bare tapering extensions of the masts above the highest part of the rigging ours were extra long some sixteen feet or so and crowned at the top which was not much thicker than a man's wrist with a flat piece of wood about as large as a cheese plate on one side of which was a sheave for the signal halyards or flag line i started aloft boldly enough but when i reached the base of the pole and saw to what a height its bareness towered above me while the staggering ship lurched to leeward and the foaming sea roared a hundred and twenty feet below my heart failed me my head swam and all my scanty stock of strength left me for some time i sat with my legs clutched round the pole 
just clinging without power to move then i heard the voice of the second mate peeling up from the deck hurry up there with those halyards strange as it may appear although i felt that i was going to certain death my fear of him was so great that i made the attempt pulling myself up i shut my eyes and murmured a prayer trembling in every nerve but fighting against my benumbing weakness i actually struggled to the top as i write the cold sweat bursts from every pore for i feel again the terrible agony of that moment opening my eyes i thrust at the opening of the sheave with the end of the line but it was knotted and would not go through i had tried and failed and with my last flash of energy i grasped the pole again in both arms and slid down onto the eyes of the royal rigging here i clung for a few minutes to recover myself and to be violently sick then feeling as if the bitterness of death was past i descended to the deck walked up to mr cottam and said i have tried and i can't do it sir not if you kill me he stared at me blankly for a moment then turning away as if the situation was beyond him he called my constant chum bill smith and gave him the job he being strong as a bear and agile as a monkey very soon managed it not without considerable grumbling at jemmy for sending a weakly kid like me on such an errand the whole episode may seem trivial but i frankly declare that having in my experience faced death many times i have never felt such terror as i did then we made a flying moor in fine style in spite of the great fleet of ships surrounding us the sails were furled decks cleared up and all hands dismissed forward to meditate upon the successful close of our passage of seven months from liverpool soon everybody's attention was drawn to a large ship near by whose crew were weighing anchor homeward bound it was the stornoway the vessel we had seen towing into liverpool as we left she had discharged and loaded in liverpool made her passage out and now having discharged and loaded in bombay was returning again such differences there are between sailing ships the morning brought a chattering crowd of coolies carrying little shallow baskets and short hose at first the idea of discharging two thousand tons of coal by such childish means seemed absurd and when a start was made impossible for the poor wretches men women and children did not appear to have the faintest idea of working or to possess enough strength to do more than carry their attenuated bodies about but they were formed into lines from the hatches to the gangways and while some scratched the coal into the baskets with the hose the rest passed them from hand to hand to a monotonous chance of jalmarco di jalmarco di la la jalmarco di the spelling of course is phonetic and i haven't the faintest idea what it meant so mechanically did they puckerow these baskets that often one would pass from the hatch to the gangway empty the coolie on the rail going through the motions of tilting it over into the lighter and returning it in any case i do not think the average weight of coal passing in a basket was seven pounds yet somehow the lighters got filled there was such a number of coolies and the passing was so incessant that it was bound to tell the crew apart from the discomfort of the all-pervading coal dust had a very good time as little work being required of them as possible and while a plentiful allowance of fresh meat and vegetables was provided by the ship there was also a bumboat in attendance that kept the men well supplied at their own cost with fruit eggs etc i was fortunate enough again to be bookkeeper receiving in return as much fruit as i wanted except on sundays matters went on in a very humdrum style the only incident out of the common being a picnic excursion to the rock temples of elephanta but i have no intention of describing such places that indeed are as well known to readers as the isle of wight my object is a totally different one on sundays i should think the bulk of the trading population got afloat and came ship visiting if our ship's deck was a fair sample of those of the rest of the fleet there could have been little merchandise left in the bazaars from the cabin to the forecastle the decks were almost impassable for the piles of curios of all kinds 
clothes cigars birds etc the bulk of the stuff was dreadful rubbish almost worthless in fact yet owing to the ignorance of sailors of what can be bought in decent shops at home the trash fetched high prices at least double what really good articles of the same style and place of origin could be bought for in london and in addition to that by a system nothing short of robbery each man was charged two shillings and fourpence for every rupee he drew against his hardly earned wages while at that time the rupee was quoted officially at one shilling and eightpence who pocketed the eightpence i do not know but i shrewdly suspect that it was considered like the backsheesh levied from the tailor and the bumbo walla the captain's legitimate perquisite i have known a captain pocket fifty rupees off a bumboat bill of two hundred and fifty and of course the keen-witted hindu based his charges to the men on the expectation of such a tax so that jack was robbed on every hand unless he sternly made up his mind to spend nothing in the country and as not one in a hundred sailors have such resolution as that there were some very pretty pickings out of their scanty wages the time sped swiftly away and soon the coal was all out and most of the stone ballast in no cargo was obtainable for us in bombay so we were ordered to proceed biliampatam on the caromandel coast and after that to coconada to complete but before our departure the time-honoured custom of giving the crew twenty-four hours liberty must be observed consequently the mate's watch duly received twenty rupee each and dressed in their best started for the shore one morning at eight o'clock all of them returned the following morning except bradley the hirsute blue nose who lost my fish for me on the passage out but oh what a pitiful dirty draggled lot they were and in spite of their miserable condition they must needs get up several fights among themselves in order to crown the delights they had been indulging in ashore it was quite out of the question to allow the second mate's watch ashore that day and this decision nearly caused our first serious row so eager were the other half of the crew to go and do even as their fellows had done but as there was nothing to prevent the petty officers going they all furbished up and started taking us two boys with them my chum bill smith was of the party but as soon as we landed he went off with me being far too old a hand to be led by anybody of course poor fellow having no wages he had contrived to earn a little by washing etc and every copper was carefully hoarded for the bombay bazaars where he informed me better bargains in clothes could be had than anywhere in london up and down the crowded lanes of the bazaar he led me driving away with contumely the pilots who offered to personally conduct us for a consideration and figuring the goods of the various shopkeepers with the air of one who is bursting with wealth at last finding a booth to his mind he entered and forthwith selected a great heap of things such as soldiers trousers woolen shirts dungaree jumpers and trousers towels caps soap in fact a regular outfit at last the middle-aged mussulman who ran the shop began to look suspicious and said you got plenty rupee johnny i've got all i want johnny said he give me jar of ginger ginger mind none o your molasses the ginger was brought and added to the heap then bill said now then johnny how much for the lot a portentous calculation ensued which occupied i should think twenty minutes at last the account was made up forty-five rupees without moving a muscle of his face bill immediately replied i'll give you ten horror amazement indignation chased one another over the countenances of the shopkeepers at last one of them found words you make plenty laugh johnny speaky barbara one time give forty rupee not another pice said bill pulling out his money and counting it ostentatiously well the antics those two natives did cut to be sure they worked themselves up into a foaming rage they cast their turbans recklessly in the dust 
in such english as they could command they reviled their tormentor and all his relations to the remotest degree and finally came down to thirty rupees that they swore with sudden solemnity was absolutely the bottom figure at which they would lose at least five rupees on the transaction oh very well said bill then i'm off and rising he said come along tom out we went and strolled leisurely along the alley for about a hundred yards when suddenly one of the merchants came flying after us and with many smiles besought bill to return and speak ye babbly now back we went and the game began again i got thoroughly weary of it at last but bill's patience was inexhaustible he was rewarded finally by their absolute submission to his terms when to my consternation he refused to have the goods unless they gave him a large bottle of pepper as backsheesh surely i thought this will so disgust them that they will assault us but no after another quarter of an hour's haggling they yielded the last point and laden like a sumpter mule bill took his triumphant departure by this time i had seen more than enough of the steaming hubbub of the bazaars but bill had more business to transact so we parted company and i wandered away alone gazing with wide-eyed wonder at the innumerable strange sights to be seen in this great humming city no one molested me although many curious glances were cast at me by groups of languid natives of all shades as i trudged along without any definite idea whither i was going at last utterly weary i found myself down at the water's edge again the afternoon was getting on and i should soon have to return on board but as i had still two rupees i thought i would take a trip up the harbour to mazagan or beyond it full of my project i chartered a canoe with two men in it to take me for a sail bargaining as well as i was able in my ignorance of the language for a two hours sail ending on board my ship we started and for perhaps half an hour i thoroughly enjoyed myself as the canoe glided along right up past the p and o moorings and the arsenal then when we were clear of the shipping my boatman suddenly stopped and began an animated discussion with me which was somewhat complicated by the fact that neither of us understood the other eventually i became convinced that they wanted more money and their previously mild behavior grew certainly more aggressive i felt very nervous but struggled to conceal the fact speaking boldly as if accustomed to be obeyed finally i produced my money and turned my pockets inside out to show that i had no more upon seeing this they held a long conversation during which the canoe drifted idly and i sat upon thorns at last much to my relief they turned the boat's head towards the anchorage again and without another word paddled homeward arriving at about a cable's length from the ship they stopped and demanded their money but i having seen the stalwart figure of the mate standing on the forecastle head stood up and with all the voice i could muster shouted western bell ahoy mr edley heard me and waved his hand that move on my part evidently disconcerted them and they paddled vigorously for the gangway as soon as the canoe touched the side i sprang up and told mr edney what had happened he asked me what i had promised them i told him one rupee taking eight annas from me he went down the gangway and offered it to them when they set up a perfect storm of protest he just pitched the piece of money into the canoe and pushed it away from the side returning on board without taking any further notice needless to say i was heartily thankful to be well out of what at one time looked like an ugly scrape next morning the liberty men returned on board in the usual condition but bradley was not with them that night however he paid us a visit by stealth coming up the cable and rifling several of his shipmates chests of whatever was worth carrying off then he went ashore again unperceived showing that a very slack watch was kept there was consternation in the forecastle when the robbery was discovered and a good deal of wild talk but bradley was something of a bucko and i very much doubt whether any of them would have said much to him had he been there in person three days longer we remained at anchor although apparently quite ready for sea 
on the second morning bradley returned and climbing on board walked aft and coolly asked the mate for a rupee to pay his boatman with being curtly refused and ordered forward he stripped off the filthy white shirt he was wearing and rolling it up flung it over to the dinghy walla bidding him to connery jao Gili, get ashore quick with this the poor beggar was perforce content making off hurriedly bradley then made for his bunk saying no word to any one until the afternoon when he bade julius caesar go and tell the skipper that he was very ill this message actually made the old man angry he came forward and gave the defaulter a piece of his mind but being evidently impressed by the look of the man who had been gutter raking in all the filth of coolie town for three days he sent for the harbour doctor that worthy after examination gave it as his opinion that there was nothing the matter with the fellow but bad gin and want of food assuring the skipper that he would be all right as soon as we got to sea next morning we got under way and sailed not without another protest from bradley of which no notice was taken as the medical officer who was then paying his final visit adhered to his opinion we took a favourable wind at the harbour's mouth and slid gently down the coast under easy sail the vessel being tender from scanty allowance of ballast but the weather was lovely the wind fair and everything promised a delightful trip bradley however steadily got worse presently an angry-looking eruption of pimples burst out all over his body even the inside of his mouth being invaded then my purgatory commenced no one would have anything to do with him although he was quite helpless he was shifted out of the forecastle up on to the forecastle head and a sort of tent rigged over him to keep the sun off then i was told off to attend to him the horror of that time will never leave me he was as i have before noted with the exception of the mate the most hairy man i ever saw the black shaggy covering of his arms and legs being at least an inch and a half long while his chest and back were more like a great ape's than a man's therefore when all those pimples grew until they were large as a finger-top and so close together that not a speck of sound flesh was visible the task of washing him which i had to perform alone was really an awful one i must draw a veil over the further development of those horrible postules happily for the patient he became delirious and apparently insensible to pain how i kept my reason i don't know but i thought and still think that it was a frightful ordeal for a youngster under fourteen to endure for a whole week i had nothing else to do no relief except my ordinary watch below during which he was left quite alone on the eleventh day after leaving bombay we entered bimpliapatam roads and just as we did so death mercifully came to his rescue and mine the carpenter botched up a rough coffin into which the unrecognizable heap with all its bedding was hurriedly bundled taken ashore and buried at the foot of the flagstaff without any ceremony whatever no one seemed to know what the disease had been but i can only say that having seen lepers in all stages of disfigurement and many other cases of terrible pestilential ravages i have never seen anything so awful as the case of william bradley End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen on the coromandel coast freed from that horrible incubus i had now leisure to look about and enjoy the varied scenes that presented themselves the place we were lying at was i suppose a typical native coast village a big hill facing the anchorage having a rock-hewn temple upon its sea-front there was no harbour or shelter of any kind so that vessels lay all ready for sea in case of bad weather setting in all cargo was brought off in the crazy mazula boats which have been so often described by visitors to madras and are the only craft able to stand the rough usage of the surf-beaten beach 
the fisherman went out on primitive contrivances of three logs lashed together without any attempt at hollowing out or fashioning bow and stern kneeling upon the two outer logs in the centre of the crazy thing the poor wretch would paddle seaward until out of sight his sole equipment a palm-leaf basket secured just in front of him and containing his fishing tackle neither food nor water could be carried yet in this miserable condition they would remain out for many hours at the mercy of every wave that came along and often being rolled over several times in succession the catches of fish they made were always pitifully small it seemed to me sometimes consisting of only a couple of dozen large prawns though how they caught them out there was a mystery to me our cargo was an assorted one jaggery or palm sugar looking like bags of black mud and almost as nice to handle buffalo horns and hides cases of castor oil bags of myobolums a, a kind of dye nut and sundry other queer things came off to us in small quantities at a time and were flung on board in a most haphazard fashion owing to the constant swell which made the boats tumble about alongside vivaciously all the stowage was done by the crew under the direction of jemmy the scrubber who proved himself as capable a stevedore as he was a seaman no one went ashore except the skipper while we lay there and he would gladly have avoided the necessity if possible since it usually meant a thorough drenching on the whole we were by no means sorry when the news came that we were to leave and proceed down the coast to coconada as we were always ready to sail there were none of the usual preliminaries we just hauled in the fenders hove the anchor up and started here our skipper's local knowledge was of great service for we hugged the coast closely all the way down keeping a favourable wind which brought us into coconada bay in a few hours while the andromeda a big liverpool ship that sailed at the same time for the same port stood off the land got into bad weather and did not arrive for twenty-eight days she had also sustained severe damage to both ship and cargo while coconada was evidently a much more important place than bimliapatam we saw nothing of the town for we lay a long way off in the centre of a huge bay we were near enough though to hear the various cries of the wild beasts among which the hideous noise of the hyenas was especially noticeable our unhappy painter who had remained in bombay hospital during the whole of our stay there was again so ill that he had to be landed here but getting convalescent he and the fellow patient went for a stroll one day and wandering out of the town they met a hyena barber was so scared that he fainted right away but the other man found sufficient vitality to scramble up a tree he had not got very high though before weakness overcame him and he fell breaking his leg when barber came too there was no trace of the hyena but he and his fellow were in a pitiable plight there they would doubtless have stopped and had their bones picked clean by the morning but for a party of friendly coolies who came along and seeing their condition fetched a couple of palkis and carried them back to hospital again here then we remained for three weeks filling the hold with a miscellaneous collection of indian produce of which cotton linseed and myrobolums formed the staple until the great capacity of our ship for cargo was effectually satisfied and she was jammed full to the hatch combings then all hands released from their stifling labours below bent their energies to getting ready for sea meanwhile although our crew were certainly a most patient set of men their discontent at the short-handedness which ever since leaving home had pressed so hardly upon us all gathered to a head culminating in a visit of all hands to the quarter-deck with a request to see the skipper genial as ever captain smith appeared his ruddy face wearing an expression of benign wonderment at the unusual summons well what is it men said he then stepped forward an elderly yankee who had been a boatswain's mate in the american navy a shrewd intelligent man with a rich fund of native humour and a prime favourite for an aft we've taken a liberty sir of coming aft to ask if your attentions to sail thou shippin any more hands was his reply 
well in the first place nat answered the skipper there's no hands ter be got here and besides in such a easy workin ship as this is there's no hardship in bein a couple of hands short the good lord forgive you sir exclaimed nat if this here's a heasy workin ship what might you reckon a hard workin one ought to be why captain it takes two men to haul through the slack out of braces and it's all a man's work to overhaul the gear o' the topsail besides sir you know it takes all hands to shorten her down to the topsails and what we can do with her in a squall well i ain't forgot that pleasant evening off the cape if you'd have at this vigorous reply the old man could only laugh to show his appreciation of the home thrusts it contained but with native shrewdness he changed his base still preserving his cheery good temper mind ye i don't say we ain't short-handed he said very short-handed but we're gettin out of the bay of bengal for the southeast monsoon sets in and you know as well as me that it's fine weather most all the way to cape once we cross the line and if we get any dirt off in the cape we'll keep her under the easy sail and let the gulas current sweep her round and then we'll just be home in no time you leave it to me we ain't been eight months together without knowing each other and you all know you can depend on me to do the best you i can to make you comfortable but i can't get any hands in this godforsaken place if we only had two left forward that speech settled it if captain smith had been an irritable man inclined to put on airs of outraged dignity because his crew asked him a perfectly reasonable question and to rate them like a set of fractious children there would have been an instant refusal of duty on the part of the men followed by much suffering and loss on both sides for the chaps were thoroughly in earnest but the skipper's frank good humour and acceptance of the situation disarmed them and they returned forward with minds made up to see the voyage out as best they could next day we weighed anchor and sailed for london the windlass revolving to the time-honoured tune of good-bye fare you well hurrah my boys were homeward bound just prior to our departure we received on board some two or three hundred fowls and two goats which added to about twenty pigs mostly bred on board two large dogs two monkeys sundry parrots and two cats made the ship bear no bad resemblance to noah's ark none of these animals had any settled abiding place they just roamed about the decks whithersoever they would except on the sacred precincts of the poop which were faithfully guarded by one of the dogs who allowed no intrusion by any of the grunting clucking or chattering crowd but this state of things was a great trial to all concerned for one of the cardinal necessities of british or american ships is cleanliness which is secured by copious floods of salt water and vigorous scrubbing every morning under present conditions keeping the vessel clean was manifestly impossible the crowd of animals even invading the men's quarters as well as every nook into which they could possibly squeeze themselves there was a great deal of dissatisfaction forward at this state of things and fowls were continually flying overboard being chased and smitten by angry men who found everything under their hands be fouled and stinking still the nuisance was unabated until we were ten days out just off cape comorin we got our first stiff breeze of the homeward passage and very soon in accordance with her invariable custom the old ship began to take sufficient water over the rail to flood the decks fore and aft then there was a commotion in the farmyard the watch up to their waists in water splashed about collecting the squawking chickens and driving the bewildered swine into a temporary shelter rigged up under the topgallant forecastle next morning at least four dozen dead fowls were flung overboard in addition to many that had fled blindly into the sea on the previous day this loss so disgusted the skipper that he ordered all hands to be fed on poultry until the stock was exhausted at first this benevolent command gave a good deal of delight but when the miserable leathery carcasses boiled in salt water uncleaned and unsavoury were brought into the forecastle there was almost a riot a deputation waited upon the captain to protest and demand their proper rations of salt horse 
they were received by the skipper with a very ill grace and the usual senseless remarks about sailors fastidiousness in the matter of food were freely indulged in by the old man who seemed quite out of temper we got no more coromandel poultry though which was a blessing albeit they were served up to the cabin as usual being prepared in a civilized fashion i suppose the officers found them eatable but in various ways the flock of fowls diminished rapidly much to our relief and gradually the decks began to assume their normal cleanliness the pigs numerous as they were could be kept within bounds forward in fact the dogs rarely permitted them to come abaft the foremast as for the two goats they grew so mischievous gnawing the ends of all the ropes and nibbling at everything except iron that orders for their execution went forth and since no one would eat them their bodies were flung overboard End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen homeward to london as captain smith had foretold we were having an exceedingly fine weather passage all the way down the indian ocean we were favoured with pleasant breezes fair for our course and glorious weather every care was taken to make the work as light as possible for the small crew although we in the starboard watch were sorely exasperated by the second mate's devotion to sand and canvas a mania that had given him his well-earned sobriquet of jemmy the scrubber if he could only have his watch slopping about with a few buckets of sand and rags of old canvas rubbing away at the dingy interior of the bulwarks that with all his attentions never would look white he was in his glory but oh how we did hate the messy fiddling abomination it made our discontent the greater to notice that the mate's watch scarcely ever touched it like a sensible man mr edney preferred to have one thoroughly good scrub down at lengthy intervals going over the whole of the paint in one day to scratching like a broody hen first here and then there in patches and never making a decent job after all it kept the watch in a chronic state of growl which was only prevented from breaking out into downright rebellion by the knowledge that the second mate was always in hot water aft although owing to his seven years service in the ship the skipper and mate allowed him to have pretty much his own way apart from this things went on smoothly enough many a time did jemmy with only such assistance as bill and i could give him set and take in the lighter sails without disturbing the rest of the watch who were fast asleep in their several bunks they knew this well and consequently never turned out even upon the most urgent necessity without a chorus of growls at the second mate although he never took the slightest notice of them so we slowly lumbered homeward in uneventful monotony until one morning we made the land about east london and congratulated ourselves that we were near the southern limit of our journey home still the weather was kind to us no envious southerly gale battered us back from the cape we were striving to get round and presently we found ourselves in the embrace of the great agulhas current that forever set steadily round the cape westward homeward bounders have reason to rejoice when they enter the limits of this mighty marine river for in spite of contrary winds or calms they are irresistibly carried on the way they would go at a rate that is the same for the bluff bowed sea-wagon as for the ocean flyer and one day to my intense delight for i had heard a tale from bill the wind died completely away and the water became as smooth as a mirror every bit of line in the ship that could by any possibility serve as a fishing line was ferreted out and fishing commenced at first only the favoured few whose lines were fifty or sixty fathoms long got a look in bringing up from the bank far below us some magnificent specimens of cod then as the fish followed their disappearing comrades up the shorter lines became into play and the fun became general it was a regular orgy of fishing at least three hundred splendid fish of various kinds but chiefly cod rewarded our efforts the subsequent feast being something to date from 
better still the weather being cool we were able to salt down a large quantity for use later on so that we had fish for nearly a month afterwards after about eight hours of this calm a gentle southeasterly breeze sprang up which persisted and strengthened until with the dim outlines of the highland behind the cape of good hope on our starboard quarter we were bowling cheerily along under every rag we could muster our head pointing north northwest homeward bound indeed then the work that must be undertaken in every respectable ship on the home stretch came with a rush setting up rigging rattling down general overhaul of running and standing gear chipping ironwork and painting it with red lead scraping bright woodwork etc etc kept us all busy although we were allowed watch and watch all along in most ships it is the custom while in the southeast trades homeward bound to give no afternoon watch below in order that the bulk of the redding up may be done before crossing the line but for several reasons our skipper did not think it advisable to tax his scanty crew too much as for attendance on the sails we might have been a steamship for all the work of that kind required the southeast trades being notoriously steady and reliable in the atlantic while the northeast trades are often entirely wanting so we had trades from the cape to the line that did not vary a point in force or direction for three weeks and if she would have steered herself she could have made that part of the passage unmanned the time literally flew by being delightfully punctuated every sunday by a glorious feed of roast pig two of our large stock of home-bred porkers being sacrificed each saturday and fairly apportioned among all hands st helena was sighted ten days after losing sight of the african land a huge black mass towering to an enormous height as it seemed to me we approached it very closely purposing to report ourselves there but not to anchor coming round under the huge crags of the southern end with all sail set we had a splendid view of the cliffs rising sheer from the sea whereon the gliding shadow of our ship was cast in almost perfect resemblance who was responsible for the neglect i do not know but suddenly down a gorge in the mountain rushed a fierce blast almost at right angles to the wind we were carrying and making the canvas shake and flap with a thunderous noise there was a great bustle to get sail off her but unfortunately she paid off rather smartly and crack went the mizzen topmast before the sails came down a piece of gross carelessness for no coast of that kind should ever be approached under sail without all due precautions for shortening down neglect of such preparation has caused the loss of many a fine ship and countless boats with appalling sacrifice of life it was the only spar we lost during the whole of that voyage by the time we had got the kites off her we had opened out the great gorge in which as if it had been dropped from the cliffs above lies the town the houses appearing curiously jumbled together we were so close in that the great ladder credited i believe with a rung for every day in the year which leads up on to the cliffs from the town was plainly visible only one ship the noack eight of rotterdam one of the regular old dutch east indiamen from java was at anchor for even then the prosperous days of st helena as a sort of ocean halfway house had departed never to return we spelt out our name and ports of departure and destination with the length of passage, our information being duly acknowledged from the flagstaff. In a few minutes more we were again in the grip of our faithful friend the South East Trade, and feeling that another important milestone was passed on our long journey. Placidly, equably, we jogged on, four days afterwards, sighting and signalling to the barren volcano-scarred island of Ascension, the exclusive domain of men of war for whose behalf a large naval establishment is maintained in highest efficiency another landmark left behind onward we sped with freshening trades and increasing speed until we were actually in eight degrees north latitude so kindly had the fair wind we took off the pitch of the cape favoured us but our good fortune still held 
instead of at least a week of the detestable doldrums we fully expected we had only one day's detention before the northeast trade swept down upon us and away we went braced sharply up on the starboard tack to the northwestward and now for a while all the tarry work being done all hands were transformed into painters and varnishers within and without also as far as the wash of the sea alongside would allow we painted and polished until the grimy once shabby old packet looked quite smart and shining the second mate was right in his element he begrudged himself necessary rest and often looked angrily at the sun when setting as if he felt he was being defrauded out of a few minutes more of his beloved labour never surely was there a man who loved work for its own sake better than he never had a ship a more energetic seaman-like officer yet he was by no means appreciated aft although his worth was undeniable and as so often happens he was doomed to be a junior officer all his life for he could not do the simplest problem in navigation without making the most ludicrous mistakes however he passed for second mate was a mystery known only to the examiners mainly i believe by his untiring efforts all our painting operations were successfully completed before we reached the northern verge of the tropic where changeable weather began to appear but when once the paint was on he was like a hen with one chick his eager eye was ever on the watch for any unfortunate who would dare to sully the whiteness of the bulwarks within or heave anything overboard carelessly that might mark the glossy blackness outside but his great carnival was yet to come one morning shortly after four under his directions i lugged up from the forepeak a number of lumps of sandstone which he busied himself till daylight in shaping into sizable blocks while i pounded the smaller pieces into sand promptly at four bells the watch were gathered aft and holy stoning commenced this delightful pastime consists of rubbing the decks along the grain of the wood with blocks of sandstone the process being assisted by scattering sand and water for three days the decks were in a continual muck of muddy sand and jimmy's face wore a steady beaming smile when at last all the grit was flooded away the result was dazzling the decks were really beautiful in their spotless cleanliness then to my unbounded amazement no sooner were they dry than a vile mixture of varnish oil and coal tar was boiled in an impromptu furnace on deck and with this hideous compost the spotless planks were liberally besmeared i felt personally aggrieved why i could not help asking my chum bill why in the name of goodness all this back-breaking holly stoning only to plaster such a foul mess on the decks immediately afterward preserves the wood was the sententious reply and it was all the answer i could get certainly the poop was varnished only which made it a golden hue until the first water was poured on it after that it always looked as if a lot of soap suds had been poured over it and left to dry but with this final outrage on common sense as i couldn't help considering it our ship decorating came to an end henceforth the chief object in view apparently was to preserve as far as possible the spick and span appearance of the vessel until she reached home those beautiful decks especially were the objects of jemmy's constant solicitude he found some nail marks one day left by someone's boots and one would have thought the ship had sprung a leak like a well mouth by the outcry he made as far as possible work was confined to the fore part of the ship and beside the ordinary routine little was done but the plating of rope yarns into senate always a kill time but we were now so far north that the variable weather of the north atlantic began to give us plenty of occupation in the working of the ship fortunately we were not long delayed by contrary winds the brave westerlies came to our assistance driving us along in fine style and at increasing speed until one day through the driving mist we sighted corvo one of the northern outposts of the azores it was fortunate that we did so for thenceforward thickening weather and overcast skies prevented any observation of the heavenly bodies and dead reckoning was our only means of knowing the ship's position 
now captain smith though thoroughly at home in the indian coast had a great dread of his own shores and as the distance from land grew less he became exceedingly nervous until at last when by his estimate we were well up channel he dared no longer run as fast as the following gale would have driven him but shortened sail much to every one's disgust ship after ship came up astern passed us and sped away homewards while we dawdled through those crowded waters running the risk of the fair wind blowing itself out before we had gained our port before we had sighted land or light it came down a thick fog a regular channel fret which is a condition of things dreaded by all seamen on our dangerous coasts we hove to keeping the foghorn going with its melancholy bray thus for six mortal hours we lay helplessly tossing in the fairway listening to the miserable discord of foghorns sirens and whistles but unable to see the ship's length away from us the anxiety was exceedingly great for at any moment we were liable to be run down by something or other whose commander was more venturesome than ours suddenly out of the gloom came a hoarse hail do you want a pilot sir a sweeter sound was never heard without a moment's hesitation the old man replied yes where are you he had hardly spoken before the dim outlines of a lugger came into view alongside are you a trinity pilot asked the skipper no sir but i can run you up to him replied the voice how much queried the captain five pounds sir came promptly back all right come aboard said the old man and all hands crowded to the side to see our deliverer from suspense heave us a line please sir came from the darkness where we could see the shadowy form of the big boat tossing and tumbling in the heavy sea the main breast was flung out to her and as she sheered in towards us a black bundle seemed to hurl itself at us and in a few seconds it stood erect and dripping on deck a man swathed in oilskin still he looked like a mummy only pausing to dash the water out of his eyes he shouted square the mainyard and walking aft to the helmsman ordered him to keep her away a minute before all had been miserable in the extreme and the bitter gale roaring overhead seemed to be withering all the life out of us but what a change the man seemed to have brought fine weather with him the perfect confidence that every one had in him dispelling every gloomy thought the lesson of that little episode so commonplace yet so full of instruction has never been forgotten by me it is so palpable that i dare not enlarge upon it meanwhile one of the lugger's crew had followed his chief and was busy begging tobacco meat and anything else the steward could find to part with when he had got all he could the lugger sheered in again and he tumbled back on board with his booty very soon the fog cleared away and as soon as it did so we saw the light on dungeness close aboard we ran up to the pilot's cruising ground and hove to, burning a blue light as a signal, while our friendly hoveler pocketed his five pounds and departed, well pleased with his four hours' earnings. These men get called some very hard names, and may perhaps occasionally deserve them, but as long as sailing ships exist, they will be found, as we undoubtedly found one, a very present help in time of need, and the salvation of many a fine ship the trinity pilot was some time making his appearance for there were many ships about and we must needs wait our turn but in due time we were supplied the yards were again squared and away we went round the foreland presently there was a welcome sound of paddle wheels and up came a tug anxious for the job of towing us up to london but our captain's scotch economy forbade him to take steam while there was so much fair wind going for nothing and the subsequent haggling was almost as protracted as bill's celebrated feat in bombay at last after two or three departures of the tug in fits of irritation a bargain was struck and the ever welcome command came peeling forward get the hawser long no need to call all hands everybody came on the jump and that mighty rope was handled as if it had been a lead line in a wonderfully short time the end was passed to the tug a severe turn was taken with our end round the windless bits and with what the sailor calls a fair wind ahead we went spinning up through the intricate channels of the thames estuary all hands worked with a will to get the sails clued up 
and unbent from the yards as it was now daylight such a morning's work had not been done on board for many a day for was not the end of the voyage here as for me i was continually in hot water for i could not keep my eyes off the wonderful scenes through which we were passing it was my first homecoming to london by sea and on the two previous occasions of leaving i had either no heart to look about me or i had come down at night just stopping at gravesend long enough to exchange pilots since the sea pilot never takes a ship into dock we sped onward again the tug straining every nerve to save the tide soon everything was ready for docking and all hands were allowed to stand by resting until we should reach blackwall the east india docks at last with the usual little group of expectant yet nonchalant officials and the loafers in the background are we going to dock at once or will she tie up in the basin as anxiously as if docking was going to take a month were these questions bandied about so eager were all the fellows to get ashore joy she is hauled in to the side of the basin made fast temporarily and the mate with a merry twinkle in his eye says the closing benediction that'll do men by this time the voracious crowd of boarding masters runners tailors ditto and unclassified scoundrels were swarming on board it was before the beneficent regulations were passed forbidding these gentry on board an incoming ship and the forecastle was a perfect pandemonium but one by one the chaps emerged with their dunnage and were carried off in triumph by one or other of the sharks until the last one having gone we of the half-deck were left in peace and now i was home what was i going to do i felt like a stranger in a strange land and it was with a sense of great relief that i accepted an invitation to stay by the ship for the present End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of the log of a sea waif by frank t bullen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen a change of nationality much as i longed for my liberty the certain sense of a home afforded by the ship was so comforting that i was in considerable dread of the time when as i supposed i should be paid off and sent adrift like the rest of the crew therefore it was with joy that i received the welcome news from the mate that i might remain and work by the ship and that my wages would be fourteen shillings a week out of which i was to keep myself the future which had begun to worry me greatly with its possibilities of misfortune owing to my still insignificant size now took a decidedly roseate hue my arch enemy as i considered him the second mate became quite amiable even condescending to inform me that the plenteous kicks and cuffs he had bestowed upon me had all been prompted by a sincere desire for my best interests and that before i was much older i should thank him heartily for his rigorous treatment in this latter prophecy he was grossly in error for i have never been able to find any excuse for the brutality of a man to the helpless who chanced to be in his power whether human or brute payday came and i received my account wages finding that i was entitled to nine golden sovereigns at the appointed hour i made my way up the east india dock road to green's home where i foregathered with most of my shipmates who were dogged by villainous-looking men as closely as if they were criminals out for an airing while waiting they made frequent visits to the public-house at the back of the office which fairly hummed with the accumulated rascality of the neighbourhood but for the danger of actions for liable i would tell some pretty little stories of what i have seen in some of the highly respectable see evidence before the licensing committees liquor shops in sailor town but i must refrain comforting myself with the knowledge that such tales have already been better told elsewhere when at last my turn came and i received that little pile of gold more money than i had ever seen at one time before i was almost afraid of being the possessor of so much wealth and knowing well as i did the risk i ran if any one got an inkling of my riches did not lessen my fears i did not think of the post-office strange to say 
but in a few minutes formed a resolution to lay all my money out in a stock of clothes which indeed i was urgently in need of and depend upon my weekly earnings from the ship to keep me the thought of losing my employment never seemed to have dawned upon me full of my project i started for aldgate but brought up sharply at the baths before i had gone a hundred yards a nice warm bath what a luxury in i went and enjoyed myself immensely in about half an hour i was out again and walking briskly westward when i stopped to make some trifling purchase to find my money gone purse and all on the instant i turned and rushed back to the baths flew past the doorkeeper and up the corridor towards the bath i had recently left the door stood wide open and there was my purse on the seat with the money intact i grabbed it and drew a long breath the first it seemed to me since i missed it going out i met an angry man at the door who was anxious to know what i thought i was up to and so on a shilling assuaged all his curiosity and lit up his lowering face with sudden smiles clutching my purse i made all the haste i could to messrs moses and sons arriving there with a sigh of thankfulness i didn't feel capable of owning so much money much less taking care of it a gorgeously attired individual strode forward with an ironical air of courtesy as i entered and bowing low wished to know my pleasure ah if i was going to spend all my money here was at last a chance to taste the sweets of that power which its possession brings with all the hauteur i could assume i said as i swelled my four feet of stature in opposition to the shopwalker's majestic presence i want an outfit something plain and substantial say about nine or ten pounds and as i spoke i secretly emptied my purse in my pocket and drawing out a few sovereigns nonchalantly i passed them through my fingers and dropped them into another pocket out of the corner of my eye i watched my gentleman's face all his sarcastic attitude vanished and for the time he was my obsequious humble servant but oh how shamelessly he made me pay for his attendance even after this lapse of years i blush to think how i was taken in the shoddy rags which i received for my gold and the swelling pride with which i ordered them to be sent down to my ship when i left the huge shop i felt quite an important personage although i had but five shillings left out of my year's wages still such as they were i had a complete stock of clothing including a chest and bedding oilskins and sea boots in fact such an outfit as i had never owned before when i returned on board i informed bill of my purchases he applauded my resolution but blamed me for not keeping a little money in case of an emergency he always did himself he said for a fortnight however i found no reason to regret my precipitate action then on a saturday afternoon came the stunning intelligence that as there was no more work to be done i was no longer wanted fortunately i had saved enough out of my weekly wage to pay for a week's board so i immediately made my way to my old boarding-house in the west india dock road and was received with open arms i paid my twelve shillings down manfully telling the master that i wanted a ship as soon as possible after finding out by cross-examination that i had been paid off with nine pounds he was much less cordial in fact he grumbled a good deal but finally promised to do his best to get me a ship at once fortunately as i thought at the time before the week was out i got a berth on board a large american ship the pharos of boston which was lying in the southwest india dock loading general cargo for melbourne as she was only about half full i begged permission to come and work on board for my food so that i should not get into debt at the boarding-house the mate who engaged me readily granted my request in fact he seemed to take no interest in the matter so i took up my quarters on board becoming great friends immediately with the amiable old mulatto steward who besides being a most valuable servant was a deeply religious man according to his lights and now my lines were cast in truly pleasant places i had heard of the good times enjoyed by boys on american ships such floating hells for their crews as a rule and my experiences at present fully bore out the truth of my information 
but i very soon saw that all was not right on board the mate was utterly neglectful of the cargo spending most of his time tippling in his berth with all sorts of visitors the second mate a stalwart youth of twenty busied himself constantly with the rigging studiously avoiding any encroachment upon the mate's province of attending to the shipment of the cargo the captain rarely appeared he was a very old man with an awful scowl and although bearing himself erect and smart-looking was evidently long past the efficient performance of his duties the only other members of the crew on board were the carpenter a finn of about sixty years of age and the cook a garrulous dane who spent most of his time yarning at the galley door with a huge knife in his hand as if it were his sceptre a good deal of drinking went on about that galley and often at knock-off time the stevedores had much ado to get ashore so drunk were they at last the mate left how or why i do not know and from thenceforward no pretense was made of tallying in the cargo at all not until three days before she was advertised to sail did we get another mate a prim little man who had been long master of english ships and looked like a fish out of water on board the pharos shipping day came and leaving the second mate steward and carpenter who were on the original articles on board the rest of us went down to a shop in ratcliffe highway to sign on it was a jew tailor's of all places in the world and never shall i forget my astonishment at the sight it presented when we got there the shop was full of as motley a crowd of scalawags as one could collect anywhere apparently they were shipping in some other american ship from the scraps of conversation i heard presently one of the fellows asked a question of the sturdy-looking israelite behind the counter looking up from his book that worthy said fiercely get out the man hesitated and muttered some reply with a howl like an enraged tiger the tailor snatched up a pair of shears and sprang over the counter after him there was a regular scuffle among the crowd for a few seconds as the thoroughly scared candidate rushed for the door just succeeding in making his escape as the vengeful jew reached the pavement in another second the tailor was back at his book as if nothing had happened but i noticed that nobody asked any more questions except one man whom i took to be the captain of the ship signing on after some little confusion the first crowd took their departure and another assortment took their places ready to sign in the pharaohs the whole proceedings were an utter farce though with a semblance of legality but what surprised me most of all was that each man received whether he wanted it or not two months advance in the form of a promissory note payable at this shop three days after the ship left gravesend only three out of the whole crowd signed their names the rest modestly made their mark and the tailor wrote down such fantastic designations as his fancy suggested then one of his assistants marshalled us all together like a flock of sheep and convoyed us to the office of the american consul general in the city where in wholesale fashion we were made citizens of the united states of america the ceremony was no sooner over than we were told to go but sharply reminded of the hour of sailing our guide mysteriously disappeared leaving us to find our way back to sailor town as best we could to my surprise and gratification i found myself shipped as an ordinary seaman at thirty shillings per month three pounds of which i already held in the form of a promise to pay i immediately hastened to my boarding-house to get the said paper converted into money but as i didn't owe him anything the master refused to touch it and further favoured me with his opinion that i shouldn't find anybody who would give me more than ten shillings for it somewhat alarmed at this i hurried to various places where they professed to discount seamen's advance notes finding to my amazement that he had spoken the truth then i suddenly remembered an old acquaintance with whom i had become friendly and who being a tradesman might be able to change my note off to him i hurried finding him both able and willing so i got my three pounds in full but i afterwards learnt that the highest amount any of the sailors had been able to get for their notes of six pounds had been two pounds ten shillings and of this a goodly portion had to be taken out in clothes 
and this i was told was because of the uncertainty attached to the payment of these notes when they were presented under such conditions there was little room for wonder that cases of disappearance of the men who had obtained these advance notes were frequent it was no unusual thing for half of a crew to be missing when a vessel sailed when of course those who had given anything for the notes lost their money beyond hope of recovery although it seems premature to say so i feel bound to add that the friend who cashed my note received his money when it was due without question seven of the men who signed on with me did not turn up on sailing day so that we left the dock short-handed to that extent we anchored at gravesend however and a scratch lot of hard cases were found to make up our complement for three days we lay at the red buoy below gravesend while i wondered mightily at such delay foreign altogether to my notions of the dispatch of australian packets but finally a huge lighter painted a brilliant red came alongside and immediately the order was issued for all fire or light of any kind to be extinguished as we were going to ship gunpowder as soon as the officers were satisfied that there was no danger from a stray spark to be apprehended the transshipment began and soon fifty tons of explosives were transferred to the square of our main hatch in cases and kegs from which a good deal of loose powder was leaking the stowing completed the hatch was securely battened down for sea the lighter left and the order was given to man the windlass hitherto i had been agreeably surprised to see how quietly the work went on altogether a different state of affairs to what i had expected on board a yankee ship but the reason was not far to seek vicious as the captain looked he was utterly helpless to inaugurate a reign of terror on board for he had no truculent set of officers to back him the mate was a quiet elderly man looking as unlike a seaman as possible and certainly was not a man to develop into a bully the second mate was too young although as smart a man as ever stepped to tackle the whole crew single-handed even had he felt disposed and of course the ancient carpenter counted for nothing half the crew were exceedingly hard citizens who looked as if all the ways of western ocean blood boats were familiar to them the other half were norwegians and swedes who were unable to speak english and ready to endure any kind of brutality at whoever's hands it might be presented poor wretches had they but known it they were fortunate for the worst that befell them was being treated as boys by the hard-bitten members of the crew and made to wait on them hand and foot on deck their lives were easy enough and the food was really good in order to save the skipper trouble i suppose we had a channel pilot on board to take the ship as far as portland he poor man was sadly out of his element with the skipper whom he early described to the half-dozen passengers we carried as an unmitigated hog still there was no open breach between them until we arrived off the white then when the pilot altered the course we had been coming down in mid-channel too close in with the land the old man walked up to the helmsman and sternly ordered him to resume the course he had been steering right down the centre of the channel of course there was an explosion the pilot protested in no measured terms against his behaviour saying that as his contract was performed he was anxious to be put ashore the captain however treated him with cool insolence assuring him that he wasn't going one mile out of his way to land him and the utmost he would do would be to put him on board any homeward bounder we might pass near enough this nearly drove the pilot frantic we could hear him all over the ship but for all the impression he made upon the venerable yankee he might as well have saved his breath then there was trouble with the passengers they had been led to believe that they would be sumptuously fed and waited upon the charterers in london having painted in glowing colours the comforts sure to be met with in so large a ship for seven passengers now however they found that even the cooking of their food was a privilege for which they must fee the cook the steward was forbidden to wait upon them and they were entirely thrown upon their own resources when they complained to the captain he calmly told them that their difficulties were no concern of his he had quite sufficient annoyance in seeing them occupying his saloon 
which he could assure them was intended for the reception of a very different class of people to them happily they were all fairly well used to roughing it and so they sensibly set about making the best of their very bad bargain and thenceforward ignored the scowling skipper altogether the unfortunate pilot was kept on board five days and finally put on board a homeward-bound mediterranean steamer that we spoke halfway across the bay as he went over the side he hurled his opinion of the skipper back at him his voice rising higher and higher until he was no longer audible to the huge delight of passengers and crew alike End of chapter nineteen